One day, gates start appearing across the world in multiple locations. Strangely, this phenomenon poses no threat to humans and does not harm anyone. However, the lack of a clear cause for these gates has led to an increasing number of civilians expressing their anxiety. Meanwhile, scientists and researchers are tirelessly investigating if this phenomenon has any connection to the recent appearance of monsters in various places. We observe a team of movers loading household items into a truck for one of their clients. The man and woman of the team suggest that the young worker, Han Jujin, take a break. With a smile on his face, Han Jujin gladly accepts the offer. Curious about his personal life, they inquire about his work fees, which he reveals will go towards his younger brother's school expenses. Han Jujin mentions that both of their parents have passed away, leaving him no choice but to drop out of school and start working. With a smile, Han Jujin proudly shows them a selfie of himself and his younger brother, narrating all the wonderful qualities his brother possesses. He describes his brother as tall, kind and capable of anything. While the woman listens to his heartfelt praises with an overwhelmed expression, the man smiles knowingly, explaining that Han Jujin always speaks highly of his brother. Meanwhile, we see Han Jujin's brother sitting on a bus, gazing out at one of the weird gates. Returning to Han Jujin, the man mentions how the appearance of these gates has caused a significant increase in work for them, as people are moving due to the uncertainty surrounding these mysterious gates. He explains that since no one knows anything about these gates, they appear ominous. Just as the two continue their conversation. Han Jujin captures their attention by asking if the gate has always been so dark in color. They all observe that the gate's surface now possesses a more blood-like hue. Suddenly, their vehicle is struck from behind, abruptly halting. Han Jujin steps out to investigate, thinking another car crashed into them. However, his attention quickly shifts as he notices a gigantic bird-like creature with a pointed beak perched atop their truck, its talons tightly gripping the vehicle. In the next moment, the creature lunges towards him, but he manages to evade the attack by swiftly moving aside. Disturbing screams fill the air as he turns to witness more of these creatures flying through the gate, preying on humans. It becomes apparent that these monstrous creatures have emerged from the so-called gates, which are actually portals to dungeons. As these dungeons have remained unexplored, they have become overrun with monsters, leading to them exploding into the world. This phenomenon is referred to as a dungeon break. Unfortunately, the unexpected turn of events has resulted in numerous injuries and thousands of deaths. Just as Han Jujin rushes back towards the truck, armed with a stick to protect the middle-aged couple, he freezes in astonishment. The woman effortlessly grabs onto the creature's beak, easily pushing it away. They notice a change in her arms. She mentions that she can feel an energy awakening within her. To their surprise, other people also awaken the ability to fight these monsters. These awakened individuals are soon recognized as hunters, a special group of people who possess the power to enter and clear the dungeons of monsters. Consequently, hunting becomes the most important occupation in the world. In a remarkable twist, Han Jujin's younger brother is revealed to be one of the rare few S-rank hunters in the world possessing exceptional abilities. Eight years later in Seoul, South Korea, a girl confidently explains her status window to a wide-eyed reporter. She mentions the various skills listed in her status window and proceeds to demonstrate one by slamming her hands on the floor, causing vines to rapidly grow around her. This girl, Miss Yumi, had been job hunting during the dungeon shock eight years ago when she unexpectedly awakened the ability to manipulate vines. She even saved lives by rescuing people from a collapsing building. Although she humbly mentions she acted on instinct rather than thinking it through, her new abilities allowed her to become a hunter, and now she leads a fulfilling life as part of a small guild that specializes in raiding and clearing dungeons. The materials they obtain from these dungeons can be sold for a huge profit. Dungeon hunting is a risky occupation, but it can be highly lucrative, especially in higher-ranked dungeons known as treasure havens. These dungeons contain a new material called mana crystals, which were previously unheard of in their world. Mana crystals fetch prices ranging from thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars, enabling skilled and powerful hunters to gain considerable wealth. Those who achieve S-rank hunter status, like Han Yu Hyun, the famous hunter in Korea, earn even more. Han Yu Hyun, who grew up in poverty after losing his parents, awakened his abilities during high school. Surrounded by fellow hunters and camera flashes, the reporters discuss Han Yu Jong's life story. After awakening, he established the Abyss Guild and became its youngest guild leader. Now, at the age of 25, his wealth is astronomical. Turning the microphone towards Miss Yumi, the reporter inquires if she too has amassed wealth like Han Yu Jong. She awkwardly responds that it is not realistic for an E-rank hunter like her. However, she smiles optimistically 
punching her fist and expresses her determination to save money steadily. Her goal is to earn enough money to cover her younger sibling's tuition fees. Tragically, she later meets her death during a dungeon raid. Despite being moved to the hospital, she is unable to recover. In a dimly lit room filled with sake bottles, we observe a young man with his head down, watching the news unfold. Later, we see officials holding back a group of reporters near a gate. One of the hunters from the raiding party questions their boss about why he brought along the F-rank hunter Han Yujin. He points towards a corner where Han Yujin sits with two crutches beside him, given the title caregiver. Han Yujin requests that the other hunter not be so harsh since he also needs to venture into dungeons to make a living. Despite the ongoing argument, the boss intervenes, mentioning that no other hunter comes as cheap as Han Yujin. The disgruntled hunter argues that Han Yujin is like a parasite, bringing bad luck as he has been the sole survivor multiple times while his previous teams were wiped out. He further speculates that Han Yujin was likely abandoned by his famous S-rank brother, taunting him by reading an article about his brother's neglect when Han Yujin broke his leg. Enraged, Han Yujin grabs him by the collar, demanding that he stop spouting nonsense. Startled by the F-rank hunter's audacity, the hunter retaliates by kicking Han Yujin in the stomach, sending him crashing backward. Mockingly, the hunter questions how a lowly F-rank dares to pick a fight with a D-rank. The hunter asserts that Han Yujin should feel the difference in their powers. Finally, the hunter turns away, suggesting that if Yujin is so angry, he should complain to his younger brother. Mentioning how Han Yujin always gets worked up when his brother is mentioned, the hunter insults him, pondering how much of a scumbag one must be for their own sibling to not care about them. As the boss attends to Han Yujin's injuries, he mentions that he strengthened his bones, but can't heal him as that isn't his ability. Still Yujin should be able to move easily for a few hours. He says that he shouldn't pay attention to what the other hunters said. Yujin is getting carried through the dungeon as a weak F-rank so it isn't surprising that many hunters will act like this. Because of this Yujin needs to hold back and not get so angry. After a moment, Yujin beams up at the boss, saying how he is happy that the boss is even allowing an F-rank like him to tag along. He thinks that the boss must face challenges in mediating between hunters. Rising to his feet with the aid of his crutches, Han Yujin beams at the boss, expressing his gratitude for being allowed to accompany them despite his F-rank status. The boss, taken aback, listens as Han Yujin shares his appreciation for the boss's efforts. The boss's face lights up with a smile, acknowledging that Yujin is the only one who truly understands his struggles. Seeing his Yuj thinks inwardly that he got the boss. As he gets up in his clutches, the boss walks back scolding the other hunters for picking on him, mentioning that Yu Yujin is quite knowledgeable about dungeons and monsters. Observing the scene, Han Yujin subtly checks his status, which indicates that Guildmaster Lim Xiaoku has been added to his list of influential targets. Reflecting on being called a parasite and an ominous presence, Han Yujin thinks that there might be some truth to it, given that he has managed to survive while his previous teammates perished. In the depths of the dungeon, bat-like monsters swoop down upon them, launching their attacks. Some hunters remain at a distance, casting powerful spells while others, like the one who had insulted Yujin earlier, engage the monsters head-on. Amidst the chaos, some members of the team shout warnings to stay vigilant, as the monsters can emerge from any direction. However, their comrades dismiss their concerns, claiming that they are familiar with this dungeon and its creatures. They question how strong the monsters in a D-rank dungeon could possibly be, given their previous encounters. Recalling how they feared these weak monsters during the dungeon shock, the team proceeds to collect the glowing mana crystals from the fallen monsters. Even a D-rank mana crystal like the ones they find is worth a huge amount, fetching a few thousand bucks in the market. They then turn their attention to Yujin, ordering him to mine the tiny mana crystals embedded in the dungeon walls. He will only receive a meager 20% of what he mines, while the remaining 80% will go towards commissions. The higher quality mana crystals obtained from the monsters will naturally belong to the hunters engaged in combat. Upon hearing that he will receive such a small portion, Yujin looks expressionlessly at his surroundings. As he mines the crystals, memories flood his mind, the loss of his parents and his subsequent estrangement from his brother. After awakening as an S-rank hunter, his brother left him behind, emphasizing the danger associated with the hunter profession. While Yujin was conscripted into the military, his brother gathered other hunters and established the formidable Abyss Guild. 
further distancing himself from Yujin's life. Left alone and abandoned, Yujin wished for an awakening that could change his circumstances. Desperate, Yujin sought the help of a broker who took all his money, promising to assist him in awakening as a hunter. Asked to sign a contract and engage in various disgraceful activities, Yujin finally awakened as an F-rank hunter. Rumors soon circulated about how the brother of an S-rank hunter had become a lowly F-rank, with whispers suggesting that he had begged his brother for entry into the Abyss Guild. Even the broker demanded repayment for the compensation given. Eugen remembered how his debt piled up, leading his brother to scold him and mockingly refer to his title caregiver as an insult. His brother's final words were a cruel declaration that Eugen had been holding him back. Adding to his troubles, Eugen suffered leg injuries during a dungeon raid. When he sought healing support from his brother, he was thrown out, with his brother claiming it was for the best as Eugen would no longer attempt dungeon raids. Eugen couldn't help but mutter under his breath that someone like him deserved to be discarded. However, it was precisely because of his skill, influenced by his caregiver title, that he managed to survive in the treacherous world of dungeon hunting. His ability influenced those around him, subtly enhancing their growth when he encouraged them with his keyword, cheer up. As he continued mining, Eugen realized that with his buffing skill, he stood little chance of surviving in this ruthless environment. This was compounded by another skill bestowed upon him by his caregiver title, a skill that helped him survive when others perished. Just then, his status notified him that the effect of the caregiver title was activating, and his additional skill, last reward, was being triggered. Another message informed him that the skills and attributes of the influence target were being transferred over with twice the strength. Throwing his pickaxe aside, Eugen, using his crutches, runs as quickly as possible. Worry fills him because the condition for this skill to activate is the death of the influenced person. Exiting the cave system, he is met with the grim sight of his team's lifeless bodies across the ground, the remaining members falling victim to a colossal dragon. As a dying hunter curses him for his ominous presence, Eugen identifies the monstrous creature as the Dragon King of Poison and Curses, known as Lachitas. It is a first-class dragon believed to be unbeatable. Anxiously, he wonders why such a formidable beast is in a mere D-rank dungeon. As one of the dragon's heads lunges at him, he activates enhanced legs and swiftly retreats back into the cave tunnel. While he runs, he ponders the boss's skill, a D-class bone enhancement, and realizes that he is now receiving twice its effects. However, just as he is about to escape, the dragon flicks its tail, striking him. He reinforces his arms, but still gets thrown backward, blood splattering as he crashes to the ground. In that moment, he experiences his boss's memories before their death. As the dragon opens its maw and lunges towards him, he wonders if this is how he will meet his end. Suddenly, someone grabs him, lifting him out of harm's way before the dragon's fiery breath can reach him. Surprised, he asks his brother how he got there, but Yuhyun orders him to stay back. Leaping towards the charging monster, Yujin activates his skill, Blue Willow Leaves. His sword transforms into a deep purple shade as he thrusts it into the monster's head. Focused on protecting his brother, he finds himself unable to fight with complete freedom. Yuhyun shouts at him, questioning why. Even after losing his legs, he still entered a dungeon and why he has to clean up after him. Eugen asks, surprised, if his brother came here just to say this. He realizes that he probably shouldn't have expected his brother to come just to rescue him. After all, there was no way that would happen. Approaching the monster, he drops his sword, uttering that he should simply allow himself to die here. He mentions that this would relieve Yuhan of the burden of having a weak brother, making everyone happy, and he wouldn't have to worry about him anymore. With that thought, he closes his eyes as the dragon prepares to strike. When he opens his eyes a moment later, he is astonished to find himself still alive, but even more shocked to see his brother lying beside him, three deep gashes marking his back. Disbelieving, Eugen wonders when everything went so wrong. Han Eugen reflects on the time when their parents passed away, leaving the two as the only family they had. They were inseparable, facing the world together. Now, Yujin looks at his brother's bloodied body, as Yuhyun mentions that Ratchters fall asleep every five hours. If Yujin can hide for just one more hour, the dragon should sleep, allowing him to escape. He recalls how Yuhyun never visited him when he injured his legs and even refused to help him when he begged. So why is he helping now, in this dire situation? Yuhyun then hands him a gate stone, explaining that he can use it to escape from here. Just as Yuhyun limps into his brother's arms, his skill Nurturer activates, followed by an additional skill called Final Requital, which grants him his deceased brother's strength. 
Muttering to himself, he activates his brother's skills, and a blackish-purple spear materializes in his hands. With a swift movement, he leaps at the dragon, piercing it with the spear, and effortlessly evading its attacks. Amidst the fight, he glimpses his brother's memories. Having learned that Yujin is an F-rank hunter, Yu Hyun realizes he must keep his distance to prevent others from exploiting him as a weakness. Even if it meant damaging their relationship, Yu Hyun chose to stay away, instructing his subordinates to keep an eye on Yujin. When Yujin became a hunter, Yu Hyun understood that he could no longer rely on the protection of the law. Now, he seeks revenge against those who harmed his brother's leg, driving Yujin away and denying him healing. Deep in his heart, he wished Yujin would never enter a dungeon again. As Yujin relives these memories, he finally defeats the dragon. He ponders how he has only been a hindrance to his brother since he awakened. Yujin realizes that the one-hour duration of final requital will soon end, and he will succumb to the dragon's poison, thinking that there is no reason for him to continue living like this. However, another notification appears, announcing his achievement of an impossible feat, defeating a dragon single-handedly. He earns the title Dragon Slayer and, among other rewards, receives a wishing stone capable of granting any wish except bringing back the dead. After a brief moment of thought, he wishes to turn back time before he awakened as a hunter. As everything around him fades away, he resolves to ensure that such a situation never occurs again, even if he may regret his decision in the future. When he opens his eyes, he finds himself sitting on a couch in Yuhyun's guild. He has truly traveled back five years to the day he visited the Awakening Broker. Unaware of the scam, he had gone there with a considerable amount of money only to be dragged back here. In his pitiful state, he had foolishly believed that if he awakened, he could become someone like his brother. Just as he thinks about it, Yu Hyun enters the room, scolding him for getting himself into trouble once again. Overjoyed to see his brother, Yu Jin rushes forward and embraces Yu Hyun tightly. Amidst tears, he apologizes for everything, acknowledging his immaturity. He confesses that he didn't think about Yu Hyun, who, at just 20 years old, had to manage the guild and face the challenges of the dungeons. He accepts his responsibility as the elder brother, vowing to support Yu Hyun and not cause any more trouble. As Yu Hyun returns the hug, Yu Jin feels a sense of relief knowing that they can still be brothers. Looking into Yu Hyun's eyes, Yu Jin says that he loves his younger brother. At that moment, a status box opens, notifying Yu Jin that he has awakened as a hunter. Several more notifications appear, awarding him the titles Dragon Slayer and Nurturer. Additionally, he receives more skills, now of legendary rank, thanks to his newly acquired titles. Yu Hyun prepares dinner, assuring Yu Jin that it won't take much time. Sitting in silence, Yujin reflects on how, before turning back time, the two brothers argued on this very day, leading Yujin to run away. However, he is now grateful that they have made amends and finds it surprising that they are sharing a meal together. Observing Yu Hyun's smiling face as he cooks, Yujin opens his status window to examine his new skills. To his disbelief, his Dragon Slayer title is of legendary rank, surpassing even an S rank title. This grants him three legendary rank skills, Poison Resistance, Curse Resistance, and Fear Resistance, along with an SS rank skill called Ratchter's Natural Enemy. Eugen wonders if he has somehow become the world's strongest after returning in time. He imagines how the battle against the Ratchter would have unfolded with these formidable skills, envisioning himself standing against the dragon to protect his brother with his legendary resistances. Excitedly, he checks his status, hoping to see himself as a legendary or S-rank hunter. However, his stats remain those of an F-rank, all of them in single digits. Frustrated, he holds his head, complaining about the futility of having all these skills while his body remains that of an F-rank. Disappointed that he is still weak, he notices that his dexterity and mentality skills have leveled up to E-rank. Next, he clicks on his newly upgraded Legendary Nurturer title, which rewards him with four skills. Two are Legendary Skills, Final Gratitude, which is better not used, and My Kid is the Best. The latter doubles the growth rate of a subject influenced by the keyword for three days. If Yujin uses it on Yu Hyun, his younger brother will become stronger twice as quickly as other hunters. He also possesses an SS rank skill called My Kid is So Great. By cheering on the subject with a keyword in front of a minimum of 5 people, their stats and skill effects increase. Cheering on Yu Hyun in front of 50 people would make him 1.5 times stronger, and with 100 people, he would become twice as strong. Yu Jin envisions transforming his brother, Yu Hyun, into the strongest and not just him, but all the players in their guild. He dreams of creating the world's greatest guild, where he himself would be known as the guild's nurturer. Just then, he notices that the keyword has changed to I love you after awakening. 
realizing that he can no longer use this keyword on others without risking being arrested. He sighs, considering that even though the skill is amazing, it's of no use to him. Moving on, he examines his last S-rank skill, Promising Sprout, which allows him to predict an unawakened individual's expected awakening rank. Furthermore, it influences individuals' potential by keywords, ensuring they awaken with optimal capabilities. Yujin finds this skill quite valuable. As Yujin ponders the usefulness of his skills, Yuhan places the rice on the table. The taste is excellent, and Yujin praises Yuhan who mentions that his cooking skills improved while trying to survive. Confused, Yujin mentions Yuhan is rich, to which Yuhan simply replies that it's best to make one's own food. He explains that even though detox and antidote items are available now, they weren't accessible before. In a moment of silence, Yujin cautiously asks if there were people whose food was poisoned or cursed. With a smile, Yuhan relieves his memories, mentioning that he was a naive kid who had to face unique challenges by running his own show. While other guilds partnered themselves with large corporations and grew in size, Yuhian didn't belong to any and had to establish his own guild. Cutting him off, Yujin demands to know why Yuhian didn't mention any of this to him. Yuhian calmly replies that Yujin doesn't need to worry about him since he should face the consequences of his own choices. Then Yuhian admits that one thing bothered him, their relationship suffered. He avoided and monitored Yujin all the time to prevent his competitors from finding him, unintentionally distancing himself from his only brother. Yuhian acknowledges that he initially didn't want to burden Yujin but later thought that perhaps his older brother wouldn't understand him. Afterward, he apologizes to Yujin for his actions and appreciates Yujin's consideration even when he was being stubborn. With a steady gaze, Yujin adds more food to his plate, recognizing the hardships he has been through. Observing their mended relationship, he realizes how happy he is that he decided to turn back time. Just then, Yuhan receives a phone message and gets up, mentioning that he still has some work to do. Advising Yujin to delete the contract form at the Awakening Brokers, Yuhan assures him that he isn't going anywhere because this is now his home. Confused, Yujin stares silently, trying to comprehend Yuhan's words. Confused, Yujin asks Yuhan why he can't leave, and Yuhan cheerfully responds that it's too dangerous outside. Yujin doesn't understand what he's talking about since he arrived safely earlier that morning. Yuhan explains that things have changed now. Since they have repaired their relationship, Yujin is no longer as safe as before. Previously, Yujin was protected because Yuhan distanced himself from him, but now that they are close, Yujin's enemies will start targeting him. In such a situation, Yujin can't face his elder brother alone. With a grand gesture and a smile, Yuhan states that Yujin can't go anywhere and will have to live there from now on. Hearing this, Yujin rushes towards the door, only to find metal bars descending in front of him. A delivery man appears and asks him to sign a document. It turns out that Yuhan had all of Yujin's belongings brought to their new home. Yujin asks Yuhan why he is doing this, and Yuhan smugly reminds him of Yujin's apology. With a smirk, Yuhan suggests that it's essentially permission to take this action. Feeling frustrated, Yujin lies on the floor in his room, contemplating what is wrong with Yuhian and considering the possible effects of time reversal. He quickly decides to gather whatever essentials he might need and plans to escape before Yuhian returns. However, as he opens the door, he is confronted by a tall, muscular man blocking his path. It is Kim Seonghan, an a rank hunter and one of Yuhian's trusted subordinates known for his powerful defensive skills. Yujin tries to reason with him and asks him to move aside, but Kim informs him that he can't do that as it goes against Yuhan's orders to prevent Yujin from leaving. Feeling helpless and overwhelmed, Yujin trembles in front of Kim, feeling like a prey animal in the presence of a predator. Just as the pressure becomes unbearable, Yujin's skill fear resistance activates, nullifying the mental strain. Kim no longer appears threatening but rather more like a docile dog. With a superior look on his face, Yujin brushes off Kim's hand and questions him about the law and personal freedom. Kim, with an emotionless expression, threatens Yujin with physical harm, lifting him up by his shirt. Yujin, realizing the futility of his legendary skills if he can't take any action, desperately tries to activate one of his useful skills. In a moment of panic, he accidentally activates the promising sprout skill on Kim. Suddenly, Yujin finds himself holding Kim's face, closely examining him as various information about his current and potential capabilities appears before him. It turns out that Kim Seongin has the potential to become an S-rank hunter. Yujin wonder if he can improve Kim and sees a message indicating that Kim hasn't been influenced yet. Yujin closes his eyes, thinking that if he can influence Kim, he can regain his freedom. All he has to do is say I love you to him. However, as he looks into Kim's tense and angry face, the words get stuck in his throat. 
Seeking an alternative method, he asks Kim to look closely in his direction and attempts to make heart signs with his hands, much to Kim's anger. Ultimately, Yujin realizes he needs to retreat back into his room before Kim's anger erupts. Later that night, when Yu Hyun enters the room, he finds Yujin lying listlessly on the floor, surrounded by his still unpacked belongings. Yu Hyun offers to give him an unused room, to which Yujin sarcastically replies that Yu Hyun can do whatever he wants since Yujin is just a mere prisoner there. Trying to cheer him up, Yu Hyun mentions that he will allow Yujin to leave soon but only if Seongkan or Yu Hyun himself accompanies him. Yujin can't help but feel like a dog in that moment. While Yujin despairs, Yu Hyun mentions that he can't leave the task of protecting him to be rank or lower hunters. Hearing this, Yujin realizes he can take action with his skill to change the situation. Before the time reversal, Yujin used to listen to hunter-related information out of boredom, giving him knowledge about potential high-ranking hunters in the future. All he needs to do now is awaken them and bring them to his side, having them sign a contract as payment for his awakening them. With this plan, Yujin believes he can create his own force, and Yu Han won't be able to complain. Yujin addresses Yu Hyun and confidently declares that he will find an A-rank hunter. As Yu Hyun listens to Yujin's proposition, he narrows his eyes and asks how Yujin intends to find an or S rank hunter. Yujin awkwardly replies that he has his own methods, trying to evade Yu Hyun's suspicion. Yu Hyun grabs Yujin's shoulders and asks if Yujin awakened a skill that allows him to find or awaken high ranking individuals. Yu Hyun asks the details about Yujin's skills, wanting to determine if there would be more people after Yujin now. Realizing that revealing his legendary skill would lead to his imprisonment, Yujin lies and tells Yu Hyun that he only possesses an F rank skill. Yu Hyun appears calm but presses further, asking for specifics about the skill. Yujin thinks quickly and claims that his skill can only predict whether someone will be strong or weak, and he can only awaken one person per month. Yu Hyun seems to be reassured by this information and mentions that an awakening center will soon be established, which will have a mechanism to reveal a rough estimate of a person's potential. This will ensure that only suitable candidates awaken, reducing the number of people aiming for Yujin's skill. Laughing brightly, Yujin agrees with Yu Hun's suggestion and requests a chance to go to the Awakening Center. Finally getting what he wanted, Yujin starts to think about how he will recruit every A to S rank hunter using his abilities. He even entertains the idea that he may be able to assemble a force larger than the World's Edge, a famous hunter organization. The next day, Yujin and Kim Seonghan visit the Korean Hunter Association's Awakened Registration Office. As they enter, Yujin can feel the gaze of others upon them. Seonghan is easily recognized, leading people to speculate about Yujin's identity. They believe he must be someone special, and the anticipation grows as they expect the awakening of an S-rank hunter. However, when it becomes clear that Yujin is registering as an F-rank, murmurs of disappointment and confusion fill the air. People question why Yujin acted like an S-rank hunter if he was only an F-rank. Feeling awkward, Yujin can only listen and think to himself that he never acted like an S-rank. After completing his registration, Yujin opens a check of $1 million from Yu Hyun. Opening the envelope, his eyes widen at the unexpected amount. In the hunter shopping mall, he feels uncomfortable wearing flashy and pretentious equipment. Requesting something more plain, he is offered the Black Fairy's earring which grants a plus 29 increase to his magic power. He also acquires the manicured leather gloves, providing a boost of plus 61 to vitality and plus 20 to strength. Additionally, he purchases the light cloth belt, which increases his dexterity by 16. Despite these upgrades, his stats still fall short of the standard for a C-rank hunter. Deciding to keep the remaining money for contracts and potions, Yujin sits in the car with Seonghan driving. He contemplates the fact that Park Yerim, known as the Ice Witch, lives nearby with her relatives who run a barbecue shop. Yujin believes that she must be in middle school now since she awakened three years later at the age of 18. Hoping to find her, he spends hours searching the barbecue shops and inquiring about her. Unfortunately, no one seems to know her whereabouts. Just as Yujin starts to give up, he catches the smell of meat on a grill and asks Seonghan if he is hungry. Seonghan confirms it, and Yujin mentions that he feels a strong presence in the area. Suddenly, a young girl's voice can be heard shouting outside a shop. The girl, seemingly upset, takes off her apron and runs past Yujin. Looking at her tearful face, Yujin's only thought is, I found you. Without a second thought, he hands his meat skewer to Seonghan and starts running after the girl. Wondering why she is so fast even before awakening, he activates the effect of his light cloth belt, increasing his dexterity by 16. As he passes by, people complain about the gust of wind caused by his running. Yujin follows the girl, shouting her name and asking for a quick chat. 
She glances back, thinking he might be sent by her uncle, and dismissively calls him an old man, telling him to go away. Just then, Yujin notices a car approaching rapidly. He yells at the girl to look out and jumps forward, saving her from the crash. As a crowd gathers around them, the girl asks if he is a hunter. Yujin asks her to get off him first, and she complies. She repeats her question, and he confirms that he is indeed a hunter. While savoring the sizzling meat at the table, Yujin exclaims with delight, praising the exquisite marbling and the beef. He thinks about how long it has been since he last savored the taste of authentic Korean beef. Then, he suggests to Park Yerim that she should indulge herself and order as much as she desires. Observing her enjoying the food, he feels a deep sense of satisfaction that he can use a corporate card. Then he inquires if this place is truly suitable for her, considering she mentioned that her uncle owns a barbecue restaurant. She simply replies that her uncle's food is lackluster and a waste of money. She asks if he is indeed the younger brother of the leader of the renowned World's Edge Guild. Curious about why someone like him would be looking for her, he responds with a beaming smile, attributing it to her good vibes. He emphasizes that he is now here merely to repay the favor, since he was busy with life before. Yerim lets out a sigh, remarking that it's not a big deal and noting how some people she once knew would backstab others. He then reveals that he possesses a unique skill that allows him to assist others in awakening. This astonishes her, and he says that she has an extraordinary talent, stating that she will be able to awaken to at least a B rank, and he offers his help, as he holds a position of influence within the World's Edge Guild. If she agrees, he proposes to become her sponsor, extending his hand towards her and asking if she is willing to become a hunter and enter into a contract with him. She stares at him in disbelief, finding it hard to believe that someone would want to sponsor her as a hunter. Yujin believes that she will likely accept the offer, considering that being a hunter is a popular profession among young people. Deciding to put on a more impressive performance, he asks if she would like to review the contract. As he says this, a golden light materializes before him, and moments later, a long scroll appears on the table. Surprised, Yerim gets up and exclaims that he probably obtained it from his inventory. Further enticing her, he mentions that if she awakens, she will receive the scroll too. The conditions outlined in the contract are to be contracted under the World's Edge Guild, to keep Han Yujin's skill a secret, and to provide protection for him for one year. He dramatizes his need for people to safeguard him, despite being an F-rank hunter as others may attempt to harm him. She mutters that he should be embarrassed about having a middle schooler protect him, to which he replies that once she awakens, she will surpass him in strength. Then she poses another question, inquiring whether she will retain her independence if she joins the World's Edge Guild. Confused, he replies that everyone who awakens will be treated equally. Just as she is about to sign the contract upon hearing his response, he abruptly stops her. He scolds her, insisting that she should carefully read through the contract, scrutinize its conditions, and ensure she is not being exploited. Taking a meticulous approach, she examines everything she should pay attention to in the contract and realizes that he has her best interests in mind. He then suggests that they meet with a guardian to go over the contract together. She asks him what if the guardian is the one exploiting her. Perplexed, he asks what she means. She replies with a resentful look, stating that her guardian is the one extorting her. Just as they both hear a shout from outside, calling for Park Yerim, it turns out to be her uncle, coming to take her away. As Yujin starts introducing himself, the middle-aged man ignores him and addresses Park Yerim instead. He mentions how he will punish her when they return. Approaching them, Yujin tries to calm the man down, but her uncle grabs Yujin's hand, asking if he has a relationship with Park Yerim. With a bewildered expression, Yujin exclaims that, of course, he isn't in a relationship with a middle schooler. Utilizing the effects of his items, he manages to immobilize her uncle. Glancing back at Yerim's worn-out clothes and badly damaged shoes, Yujin realizes what she meant when she said her own guardian was exploiting her. Encouraged by Yujin's words, she accuses her uncle of seizing all the inheritance her parents left her and not giving her a single cent. The entire restaurant listens attentively as she blames him for only providing cheap umbrellas when the storm hit, and not even buying her a new one. Consequently, she had to resort to using a plastic bag while walking around. While other customers condemn him for his mistreatment, her uncle glares at her for embarrassing him. He pushes Yujin aside, intending to slap her, but unexpectedly, Yujin falls backward with a heavy thud, his head down. Witnessing this, both Park Yerim and her uncle are astounded. Then the next second much to the two's surprise, Yujin starts rolling around on the floor screaming how the uncle is just hitting people. Surprised he can only mutter how he didn't do anything, when Yujin sits up teary-eyed. 
He shouts that he should use words instead of fists, asking why he is hitting people. He keeps talking with tears in his eyes how he was only trying to protect the girl. He blames him for hitting the middle school girl just like he hit him. Behind them a crowd forms because of Eugen's loud shouts. Enraged, the uncle grabs his shirt, lifting him up, blaming Eugen for framing him. Seeing this Eugen trips the uncle's foot with ease sending him crashing onto the nearby furniture. He then gets up advising the uncle with a fake sincere voice that the floor is slippery so he should be careful. Before the uncle can get a few words out, Eugen slams his head down on the furniture again, all the while apologizing mentioning that he slipped again. Watching this Park Yerim is trying to contain her laughter. Bringing his face near the man's ear, he speaks in a low voice that he should be embarrassed for taking advantage of a young girl, and that he deserves to be torn apart. Still threatening him, Yujin and Park Yerim hear a voice from outside and look up, feeling the whole building trembling. The customers shout if the earthquake is coming or if a monster has attacked. Just then Kim Seonghan enters shouting for Yujin. He shouts that a monster has broken into the area. Outside a black master resembling a lot of squids twisting around on itself with multiple eyes can be seen crashing into the shops. It turns out a dungeon break has occurred in the vicinity. Among all the civilians running away while S remains, the three arrived outside with Seong and asking the two to stand back. Mentioning that he will take care of it, Seong Hin smashes the ground in front of him, destabilizing the monster's balance. He had used the A-rank skill shield of the earth. As Seong Han asks him to run away while keeping his eyes on the monster, Yu Yujin thinks why he doesn't remember a dungeon break happening on this day. Seong Han jumps at the monster slamming his foot on it, but sadly it doesn't seem to have a main body. He is easily slammed back onto the ground by the tentacles. In the crowd park Yerim foot slips and she falls to the ground. Her uncle seeing this keeps running away instead of helping her up. As a tentacle rushes towards her, she closes her eyes in fright. But the next second the monsters is stopped by a purple shield. Opening her eyes she sees Yujin protecting her amidst the smoke. After that he turns around, grabs her hand and starts to run towards T the evacuation center. Shouting at her to go down the He underground shopping center, he mentions that he needs to go back there. While he remembers that he saw the monster before running back in time. He remembers that to deal with it you must take it down in one shot. On the other hand Seonghan is a hunter specialized in defense not wide area attacks. The monster is a bad match for him, so he must find a way to end this quickly. Looking back he sees Park Yerim grabbing his arm, asking him to help her awaken. That way she will be able to help with the fight. He mentions that she hasn't even signed the contract to which she replies that she will not turn her back on him after he helps her awaken. But he shouts at her that he can't let her do it because the situation is dangerous. She won't be able to fight with proficiency the first she awakens. That is why he wanted to awaken her in a safe environment. He says that he will not let a young child like her fight alone. She should just evacuate while the adults will do the best they can. Running towards Seonghan, Yu Yuin starts thinking, trying to think of a way to defeat this monster. Rushing up to Seonghan, he requests him to use his shield skill. Seonghan rebuts that there is no use since it can't cover the entire town anyway. Still Yu Yujian insists that the skill is good enough and that he has an idea. As Yu Yujin shares his idea, Seonghan looks down at the monster rampaging below them. He decides to utilize his shield skill once again. This time, he creates an earth wall to surround the monster instead of using it to absorb attacks. Seonghan is amazed at how a defensive skill can be used to gradually immobilize the monster. Yu Yujin rushes towards the monster, clutching a familiar item he purchased from the Hunter Association, the A-class poison item known as the Black Poison Pill. He realizes that if he can detonate it inside the barrier and seal it, he could take out the monster in one fell swoop. However, just as he prepares to swing his arm back, he notices that the barrier is now empty. Confused about the monster's whereabouts, he fails to realize it emerging from the ground behind him. Suddenly, Park Yerim calls out to him, wielding an umbrella with all her might, striking the monster. Taking advantage of the distraction, Yujin frees himself from the monster's grip on his ankle and runs towards the nearby alley, with Park Yerim leading the way. He scolds her for fighting as an ordinary civilian but she reminds him that he is only an F-rank hunter himself. She mentions her desperate need for power as her youth leaves her feeling vulnerable. Reflecting on his previous actions, she understands that he genuinely wants to keep her safe. This realization angers her as she resents having to rely on someone else for protection, wishing to be self-reliant. 
recalling her painful experiences from her childhood. She remembers Yu Yujin's promise to provide her with the power to defend herself and make her own choices. As the tentacles continue their relentless assault, Yu Yujin grabs her arm, and at that moment, a brilliant blue glow radiates from their position. Hearing the explosion, Xiang Hin struggles to comprehend what has occurred but stands in astonishment. Above Yu Yujin, Park Yerim stands on the ground, surrounded by a shield made of frozen ice crystals, freezing the approaching tentacles. A notification appears, indicating that the skill Cold Psy has been activated, and the registration of awakened Park Yerim is complete. Surrounded by ice particles, she smiles at Yu Yujin, exclaiming that she has obtained an S-Class skill. He urges her to focus on the fight rather than her newly acquired abilities, while Xiang Hin watches from a distance, his expression a mix of terror and awe. In the midst of their astonishment, the monster grabs Park Yerim's hand from behind, startling her. Reacting instinctively, she slams her hand backward, unleashing a destructive force that obliterates the tentacle and the wall behind it. Both Xiang Hin and Yu Yujin stare wide-eyed, shocked by her power. Determined to take charge from now on, Park Yerim requests Xiang Hin to lend her the staff, to which he politely agrees. Turning towards the monster, she holds the staff, and a blue glow forms an intricate and lethal spearhead at its tip. Meanwhile, Xiang Hin shields Yu Yujin from the ice particles and debris flying because of her skill activation. Park Yerim activates another skill, Hermes Shoes, enhancing her mobility. With an explosion resonating through the air, she propels herself towards the monster, the deadly spear held in front. As Yu Yujin warns her to be careful, she apologizes, mentioning that she still struggles to control her new powers. Observing her, Yu Yujin wonders if she possesses an wide-area offensive skill. Just as he ponders this, a voice calls out, telling them to leave it to him. The next instant Yu Hun steps forward, and a purplish explosion spreads from his raised hand. Witnessing Park Yerim effortlessly finish off the monster with one attack, leaves her astonished. Shielding herself from the explosion, Park Yerim watches in shock as Yu Hyun swiftly finishes off the monster with a single attack. Yu Yujin, filled with happiness, exclaims that Yu Hyun has returned. Yu Hyun looks back and begins scolding Yu Yujin, expressing his worry and suggesting that he should have kept him locked up at home. Straightening himself, Yu Hyun states that he no longer needs to worry since he found Park Yerim gesturing towards her. She greets Yu Hyun politely and expresses her admiration for him. Yu Yujin proudly mentions that she agreed to sign a contract, showing off that he now has an S-rank bodyguard. Curious, Yu Hyun asks Park Yerim about her guardian. Yu Yujin scratches his cheek and explains that her current guardian is unreliable, so he was considering becoming her patron. Yu Hyun's mouth drops open in surprise, and an argument starts between the two brothers about the idea of Yu Yujin becoming a patron. Park Yerim turns to Seong Hun, asking him what a patron is. Seong Hun explains that a sponsor cannot interfere in her affairs, even if she agrees to an unfair contract, and their role is similar to that of a legal guardian for an underage hunter. He mentions that a patron takes on the responsibility of a parent, which surprises Park Yerim. She rushes to Yu Yujin, telling him that he doesn't have to go to such lengths for her. Yu Hyun, standing behind Yu Yujin, agrees and questions why Yu Yujin has to look after someone else. Yu Yujin calmly explains that he can't ignore her situation due to her uncle, but the final decision belongs to Park Yerim. With a mix of anger and frustration, Yu Hyun grabs Yu Yujin by the shoulder and starts walking away, stating that they're done here. Park Yerim grabs Yu Hyun's other shoulder, accidentally dislocating it, and a sad expression appears on Yu Yujin's face. Pointing a finger at his younger brother, Yu Yujin questions if this is how he raised him. He reminds Yu Hyun that the decision regarding patronage is Park Yerim's, so why is Yu Hyun interfering? As the guildmaster, Yu Yujin mentions that Yu Hyun has guildmaster duties and needs to handle the monster situation. He suggests that they can chat later. Reluctantly, the two leave, and Park Yerim starts screaming about what's wrong with the guildmaster and how he differs from his public image. With a solemn expression, Yu Yujin points towards a spot in the distance, gesturing for Park Yerim to sit there, which she does promptly. She then speaks, stumbling over her words as she apologizes for dislocating his shoulder, explaining that she's still struggling to control her strength. Yu Yujin dismisses her concerns, mentioning that it just happened unintentionally. He picks up her old shoe that she lost during the fall and kneels down to put it back on her foot. He remarks that he can't believe her uncle gave her worn-out shoes that are too small. Her expression brightens up as he offers to buy her a new pair the next day. Smiling brightly, she asks if ethics make his heart beat. Curious about what she's talking about, she starts mentioning K-dramas, only to see a fly land on his hand. 
Without thinking, she slaps his head, unintentionally using too much force. The fly dies, but Yu Yujin crashes to the ground, clutching his bleeding forehead, his expression filled with terror. He complains that now his heart is beating hard, causing her to apologize once again. Tying her shoelaces, he mentions that he cares for her because it reminds him of her own situation. He talks about how he had a tough time after his parents died and how he wished he had a reliable pillar to support him and his brother back then. She mentions that he does look like a reliable guardian, even though he's asking a middle schooler to protect him. As the two bump fists, he looks at her sincerely and says that it may not be as much as her parents, but he does love her. After a moment, she bursts into laughter, remarking how unexpected his statement was. While Yu Yujin is informed that Park Yerim, the S-rank hunter, has been influenced by the key word, her uncle approaches them and expresses his worry. Then he asks, with a pathetic look, if it's true that she awakened as a hunter. Looking at her uncle, the two realize that they forgot about one problem. Ignoring his hopeful expression, Park Yerim confirms that she has awakened as an S-rank hunter. Upon hearing this, her uncle's face brightens like fireworks as he envisions rolling in money. However, she cuts him off and announces that she will be moving out since she has signed a contract with Yu Yujin. Her uncle starts raging, fuming and questioning why a 16-year-old would move out, but she interjects, revealing that she is actually 15 years old. Yu Yujin politely explains to her uncle that hunters can become independent from the age of 14 according to the special law governing hunters. Cutting off his rambling, Yu Yujin shows her uncle the recorded fight between them from earlier on his phone. Yu Yujin mentions that they can also use the store's CCTV footage as evidence. He emphasizes that her uncle's irresponsible behavior as a guardian has already been exposed and she is not some source of money he can just steal from. Enraged, her uncle grabs Yu Yujin's shirt, accusing him of planning this from the start. An assertive Yerim steps in, raising her umbrella and slamming its end into the ground. An explosion occurs, breaking her uncle out of his frenzy as cracks appear on the ground. Yu Yujin calmly informs her that a hunter can't harm a civilian, to which she raises her head with wide eyes filled with innocence and questions how her uncle can continue using violence like that. Just as he is about to insult Yu Yujin again, she snaps the umbrella in half, leaving her uncle speechless. A fearful look appears on his face as she calmly tells him that she doesn't know what he's talking about. Releasing her killing intent on him, he feels pressured and can't believe that she is the same middle schooler he knows. Sensing the pressure, nullified by his legendary rank fear resistance skill, Yu Yujin calmly thinks to himself that she really is an S rank. Walking towards her uncle, she crushes the entire umbrella between her hands, reminding him of all the times he mistreated her. Scared and terrified, her uncle falls to the ground, staring at the crushed umbrella. Yerim reaches him, grabs his shoulder, and whispers that she will let this go because he is not even worth caring about. She sternly warns him one last time to stay insignificant because if he causes any more trouble for her or Yu Yujin, she will have to deal with him. Satisfied with her actions, she rushes up to Yu Yujin and asks how she did, mentioning that she tried to follow his example. All the while, Yu Yujin is thinking that he should be a better example in front of her. Anyway, with this, she becomes a part of the world's edge and he escapes his imprisonment. The next day, Yu Han rushes into Yu Yujin's room, eating him up with questions. Rushing over to him, Yu Hyun asks him to hand over what he bought yesterday. Unable to understand, Yu Yujin asks if he spent too much money or what. That's when Yu Hyun shouts that he's talking about the black poison fog. As soon as Yu Yujin brings it out, Yu Hyun snatches it from him and accuses Yu Yujin of buying it with the intention to die. Yu Hyun takes a step back, mumbling to himself that Yu Yujin was planning to use it as a hostage against his enemies. All the while, Yu Yujin is shocked, considering that he never even thought of that. Releasing the hug, Yu Hyun keeps his delusions going, mentioning that Yu Yujin thinks about him so much, but he still shouldn't do something like this. With stars shining around him, Yu Hyun mentions that he will come to save him, no matter what happens. While Yu Yujin tries to clear up the misunderstanding, he realizes that he can't reveal the truth about his legendary rank poison resistance skill. In the elevator, Yu Hyun confirms that Yerim's situation was resolved and that team leader Seok visited her house yesterday as well. Her uncle tried everything to keep Yerim, but since he had used up all the millions of inheritance from her parents, he had to give up. They were able to get him to sign a contract stating that he won't come near or contact Yerim ever again, in exchange for them not filing a lawsuit against him. They even handed him some money so he won't bother them anymore. Yu Yujin is surprised that Yerim no longer cares about her parents' inheritance, but he understands that she will earn money easily from now on. 
Yu Hyun mentions that she was in the training room all night and has probably gotten used to her stats by now. Yu Hyun assures Yu Yujin that the equipment is built with an S-rank hunter in mind, so she can use it without worry. Before he can complete his sentence, the door opens to reveal the completely destroyed training room. Just then, a half piece of a destroyed pillar is thrown right in front of them. In the training room, Yerim lands gracefully on the floor and swiftly dashes towards the punching bag. As her fist collides with the bag, a cold aura emerges from the point of contact, causing a chunk of the bag to freeze and shatter into pieces. She mutters the words shadowless day under her breath, and in an instant, shadows erupt from her feet, making their way around the room, trapping everything in their path. Even Yu Yujin's body becomes entangled as a shadow attaches itself to him. Without hesitation, she activates her skill, causing a freezing effect that spreads through all connected shadows, including Yu Yujin, who cries out in discomfort. With a determined expression, Yerim slams her foot onto the ground and swiftly propels herself forward, seemingly disappearing from sight. Her punches now land on the floor, creating cracks that spread in all directions. Suddenly, she hears Yu Hun's concerned voice, urging her to regain control of herself. She turns her gaze and sees Yu Hun comforting an almost unconscious Yu Yujin, lying near the doorway. As she removes her hood, Yu Yujin struggles to recognize her due to her stylish changes. It turns out that Park Yerim received a makeover from the renowned World's Edge, as she is preparing to visit the Hunter Association. Yu Yujin praises her new appearance, noting that she resembles a sports drink model. Yerim mentions that she needs to stay in shape since she will also be appearing in advertisements, as S-rank hunters are not only skilled but also considered celebrities. She reveals that she has already filled out the necessary hunter registration documents and is simply testing out her skills before their arrival. Handing Yujin a folder, she explains the details of her abilities. One of her skills, freezing sight, is a freezing technique that Yujin had witnessed before. With her Hermes shoes, she can perform short-range teleportation and agile jumps. And her wide area attack, known as Shadowless Day, dramatically increases a specific stat and amplifies skill effects while absorbing opponents' shadows to hinder them and gain buffs based on the amount consumed. Yujin realizes that the destroyed state of the training room is likely due to Yerim absorbing power from her surroundings to enhance her own strength. She also mentions another skill, White Corpse, that allows her to extract information from corpses, a skill that carries an ominous undertone. Yujin suggests keeping the White Corpse skill hidden for now, emphasizing the importance of not revealing all their abilities during registration. He advises her to focus on understanding more about her powers, mentioning that they will only mention the buff effect of Shadowless Day and the enhanced mobility of Hermes' shoes. As Yu Hyun and Yerim continue their playful banter, disregarding Yu Yujin's presence, Yu Yujin realizes that everything seems to be going smoothly for them. At the Hunter Association, cameras flash and reporters eagerly capture photos of Park Yerim, the new S-rank hunter, as she steps out of the World's Edge Guild's car. The reporters highlight her as the 8th S-rank hunter in Korea, and proceed to explain the three skills she has revealed. Meanwhile, standing at a distance with a face mask, Yu Yujin quietly cheers for her, with Seong Hin standing behind him. Curious, Yu Yujin asks why he didn't accompany her if he is paying so much attention. Yerim's face saddens momentarily at his remark. Yu Yujin awkwardly explains that he has had unpleasant experiences with crowds. He further mentions that it doesn't matter since she won't be sad for long and that it's for the best that she will live her life of luxury independently. Yu Yujin thinks how too many things have changed, noting the difference between the cold and aloof Park Yerim he knew from the future, and the confident and always smiling middle schooler she has become. He ponders whether it is alright for the future he knows to be changing, but shakes his head, realizing that whatever is happening, it's for the better. Having arrived at the Hunter Association, Yu Yujin's primary objective is to search for talented individuals. As he surveys the crowd, he notices that most people are F and E rank hunters, with a few D ranks scattered in between. He understands that finding S rank hunters won't be an easy task and that it's unlikely to encounter high ranking hunters casually strolling in this place. Suddenly, Seong Hin is surprised to see Yu Yujin rushing towards someone without uttering a word. He grabs the hand of a certain Yu Mingwu, considering that despite his optimal tank being F rank, his potential starting skill has the possibility of reaching SS rank. As Myungwoo asks Yu Yujin who he is, Yu Yujin looks at him with familiarity, questioning if Myungwoo really doesn't remember him. Sensing Myungwoo's discomfort, he mentions that it has been a long time, so it's understandable. However, inwardly, he realizes that he doesn't know Myungwoo as well as he thought. Nonetheless, Yu Yujin's eyes light up as he looks at Myungwoo's optimal SS rank skill, Master of the Golden Smithy. 
just from the name. It's evident that it's a skill specialized in weapon production, and being an SS rank skill, it's incredibly rare. He knows that a skill like this would have made Mingu a billionaire in the future, with people from all over the world offering him fortunes for his services. Despite this, Mingu's appearance suggests that he has had a difficult life. Maintaining the facade of an old friend, Yu Yujin asks if Mingu is alright and if he has been taking care of himself. Mingu replies, mentioning that he awakened as an F-rank hunter and heard about the 1 million won subsidy for registering. With excitement, Yu Yujin claims to be an F-rank hunter as well, and he asks Mingwu if he wants to receive the basic education with him. Mingwu shakes his head, stating that he only came to receive the subsidy, and that paying for the basic education is useless for an F-rank hunter. He explains that he is poor and can't afford it. Upon hearing this, Yu Yujin reaches out and holds Mingwu's hand, saying that they can get the education at his guild together. He suggests making the education free for Mingwu and even offers to lend him equipment. However, Seong Hin pulls him back, reminding him that only guild members can receive the new education. Yu Yujin insists, suggesting that they bend the rules just a little, but Seong Hin remains firm, unwilling to compromise. Meanwhile, Myung Woo stands there with pride, pointing at Seong Hin and recognizing him as the world's edge guild's Kim Seong Hin. In response to Myung Woo's question, Yu Yujin confirms that Seong Hun is indeed his younger brother and mentions that he will put in a good word so that they can receive the new hunter education together. Just as Myung Woo is about to hesitantly turn down the offer, stating that he doesn't even remember Yu Yujin, Yu Yujin tells him not to worry about it and just accept the offer. He mentions that he wants to help Myung Woo because he's a good person. He acknowledges that Myung Woo deserves this kind of treatment, and upon hearing that, tears stream down his face as he falls to the floor crying. Sitting by the riverbank, Yu Yujin hands him a warm cup of tea. As Myung Woo calms down, he apologizes for his earlier actions, mentioning that it has been a long time since someone said something like that to him. Yu Yujin empathizes, sharing his own life story and stating that he knows how it feels to be looked down upon even after the world changed. He wonders what would have happened if he hadn't spotted Myung Woo. He realizes that he would have never been able to use his talent and would have missed an amazing opportunity. But now, Yu Yujin believes he can change things. Getting up, he encourages Myung Woo, telling him to have confidence in himself. Raising his fists to the sky, Yu Yujin shouts that he is remarkable, even if others can't see it. He mentions that one should love themselves. He turns around and tells Myung Woo that he loves him. As Myung Woo thanks him, a notification window appears, indicating that Myung Woo has been influenced by the keywords. However, things don't go smoothly from there. The World's Edge Guild's HR team leader, Seok Samia, rejects Yu Yujin's request, stating that they can't let a stranger receive the guild's new recruit education. Even with Yu Yujin's insistence, Seok Samia maintains his position, mentioning that they can't just provide such a thing to someone Yu Yujin found somewhere. Yu Yujin scolds him for being so inflexible, but Seok Samia dismisses him, suggesting that it could have been a mere coincidence that Yu Yujin discovered Park Yerim as well. Myung Woo's mental health takes even more damage as he witnesses Yu Yujin being insulted because of him. Finally reaching his breaking point, Myung Woo runs out of the room, crying, with Yu Yujin calling after him. Outside, Yu Yujin insults Seok Samia, calling him a bastard with his cutting remarks, while Myung Woo mentions that the team leader is scary. Taking out his phone, Yu Yujin mentions that he will just call his brother directly. But Myung Woo stops him, saying that it's not necessary. He explains that Yu Yujin told him that he has value and believed in him. For Myung Woo, that's enough. He thanks Yu Yujin, stating that because of him, he has gained a stronger will to live. With newfound confidence, he declares that he won't give up and will keep trying. He mentions that there is a place that said they would give a job to an F-rank hunter like him. Surprised, Yu Yujin asks about it, and Myung Woo explains that they said they would pick him up soon. Just then, a black van stops near them on the road. The door opens, and muscular men appear inside the van, with one of them asking Myung Woo to pay off his debt. While Myung Woo smiles back and mentions that he will contact him later when he makes some money, he enters the van. Yu Yujin is shocked, wondering if the debt collectors really don't look suspicious. As the three loan sharks snatch Myung Woo's money, Yu Yujin confronts them, shouting and demanding to know why they are taking Myung Woo. However, the intimidating faces of the lone sharks respond with a dismissive attitude, stating that it's none of Yu Yujin's business. Yu Yujin, filled with fear, can only mention that he wants to accompany Myung Woo. Inside the van, Yu Yujin sits silently between the two muscular men, visibly scared. He discreetly glances at the scared Myung Woo, mustering the courage to ask why he borrowed money from loan sharks. Myung Woo hesitates before replying that the bank wouldn't lend him any money, questioning why Yu Yujin decided to join him when he doesn't even have any debt. Yu Yujin quickly responds, explaining that he couldn't let Myung Woo go alone. 
the leader of the Lone Sharks interrupts, asking Yu Yujin if he knows Myungwu and if he is also an awakened. Yu Yujin stammers, confirming that he is also an F-rank hunter, hastily covering up Myungwu as he is about to reveal his affiliation with the World's Edge Guild. Thinking on his feet, Yu Yujin fabricates a story, stating that he and Myungwu are childhood friends who met at the Hunter Association. He mentions that Myungwu told him about a job opportunity, which piqued his curiosity. Hearing this, the leader smiles, expressing approval. They offer Yu Yujin and Myungwu the chance to accompany them to the dungeon and mine mana crystals. They acknowledge that guilds don't usually accept F-rank hunters, but they consider themselves different and inclusive of F-ranks. Yu Yujin feigns surprise, maintaining his act, as they mention that they will allow him to come along because he is Myungwu's friend pretending to do him a favor. Acting with excitement, Yu Yujin expresses his gratitude and eagerness to join them. Portraying an innocent and naive F-rank hunter, he smiles and remarks how he thought they were different people but realizes they are actually nice. Everyone shares a laugh at this, suggesting that they should quickly make a contract. Yu Yujin politely thanks them for the job, while inwardly he considers that this is a minor contract one he was conned by in his past life. The Lone Sharks continuously urge Myungwu to cough up valuables, assuring him that they will settle the debt quickly. Maintaining his naive act, Yu Yujin obtains the location of the guild office, Myonmok Dom, from the conmen. Upon arriving at the small, dull building, Myungwu cowers in fear, while Yu Yujin exclaims in happiness at the sight of the building. He continues to act joyful, commenting on the shabbiness but mentioning the hope he feels within its walls. Suddenly, Yu Yujin and Myungwu are forcibly pushed into a room, and the beating begins. The assailants justify their actions, blaming Yu Yujin for getting involved out of curiosity. In that moment, Myungwu apologizes to Yu Yujin, acknowledging that he should have handled the problem himself instead of dragging Yu Yujin into it. Before Yu Yujin can respond, he is pushed onto a couch, where they try to force him into signing a contract. Placing it in front of him, they order him to stamp it with his thumb. Just as he is about to comply, Yu Yujin asks to compare his and Myungwu's contracts, stating that it would be unfair for him to sign a similar contract since he doesn't have any debts. The lone sharks laugh, commending his cleverness. Handing him Myungwu's contract, they explain that he will receive only 10% of the mining proceeds, effectively making it a slave contract. With a cold gaze, Yu Yujin tears up the contract, his legendary curse resistance nullifying the D-rank curse. As the others charge at him, he swiftly dodges their attacks, slamming the head of one assailant into the wall. He then dials a number on his phone, calmly informing the lone sharks that he isn't calling the police. On the other end of the line is Kim sung -hun. Yu Yujin implores sung -hun to create a gap in the metal doors, surrounded by a red aura. As soon as Yu Yujin enters the car, he makes a call to Siong Hen, confident that Siong Hen will understand the situation just from listening. He carefully describes their destination loudly, ensuring Siong Hen hears. Even when one of the gangsters attempts to stab him, the blade stops when it hits his skin. Noting that they should have brought a weapon capable of harming an rank, Siong Hen flicks his hand, sending the gangster crashing to the floor. The lone sharks are quickly subdued upon realizing that Siong Hen is Kim Siong Hen from World's Edge. Yu Yujin takes control and forces the gangsters to sign an S-rank contract, in which they must give 90% of their profits for the next 50 years. When they argue that this contract is a scam, Yu Yujin claps his hands together, innocently mentioning that it's just a job where they have to collect valuable-looking things. He turns their own words against them. As they refuse to sign the contracts, Yu Yujin reminds them of the numerous F-rank hunters they have abused and killed, emphasizing that even as F-rank hunters, they are still humans. In the end, they are handed over to the Hunter Association, with the revenue from their work being used to compensate the victims. Xiong Hin calmly mentions that he will submit a separate report later. In the backseat, Yu Yujin leans onto Myungwu, remarking that it has been a crazy day. Myungwu expresses gratitude for Yu Yujin looking after him, but Yu Yujin dismisses it, knowing that he will benefit greatly when Myungwu awakens his SS skill. Myungwu tearfully acknowledges how Yu Yujin has saved him twice and can't imagine where he would be without him. Hugging Yu Yujin tightly, Myungwu exclaims that he is his true hero. After their return, Yu Yujin goes to meet Seok Simyong and, by throwing a tantrum and using his status as Yerim's patron, manages to secure a dorm room. Upon entering, Yu Yujin says that it feels more like a fancy apartment and it also has four rooms. They decide that Myungwu will stay here while undergoing his hunter education. Yu Yujin then asks Myungwu about his proficiency in household chores, to which Myungwu responds that he knows how to make ramen. Yu Yujin mentions that they don't allow outsiders to live in the dorm, 
but one can bring in their houseworkers. So Yu Yujin decides to hire Myung Wu as his houseworker, allowing him to live there by pretending to be one. Yu Yujin assures Myung Wu that he won't have to do any actual housework. Tears start streaming down Myung Wu's face as he thanks Yu Yujin for being such a kind friend. Later, while looking at Myung Wu's sleeping face, Yu Yujin remembers how he falls asleep so quickly. He plans to retrieve his belongings from Yu Han's residence, but unexpectedly comes face to face with Kim Sing Hoon. Feeling scared, he asks if Yu Han sent Sing Hoon to capture him again. However, Sing Hoon clarifies that he didn't come for that and simply asks Yu Yujin to follow him. Seong Han enters a bar and asks for Kim Minui, and a terrified waitress directs him inside. Once inside the room, the most popular dishes from the menu are presented. As a waitress hastily leaves, Yu Yujin wonders why Seong Han brought him to a place like this. Seong Han, understanding his thoughts, mentions that this is the place recommended by Kim Minui of World's Edge, a fighter around Yu Yujin's age. Pouring sake, Yu Yujin asks why he brought him here. Taking the bottle from him and pouring it himself, Seong Han explains that he acted to apologize as soon as possible. He states that Yu Yujin has been quite unreliable for some time, describing him as the pebble that constantly got in the guildmaster's way. Confused and slightly insulted, Yu Yujin wonders why he is being criticized. Seong Han continues, admitting that he seems to have misjudged Yu Yujin, but smiling, he acknowledges that Yu Yujin is a good person. Despite hearing this, Yu Yujin remains confused. Seong Han mentions how Yu Yujin went out of his way to return and help him when the dungeon broke. He highlights how Yu Yujin gained Miss Park's trust and secured a contract with her. He also praises Yu Yujin for resolving the issue of custody, which could have become problematic in the future. Seong Han emphasizes how Yu Yujin even risked his own life to save Myung Wu. Ultimately, Seong Han concludes that Yu Yujin is someone he can trust and rely on. Realizing this is a great opportunity to deepen their relationship and influence Seong Han, Yu Yujin decides to proceed. They click their glasses together, and Yu Yujin smiles, stating that Seong Hun is praising him too much, but he appreciates it nonetheless. Seong Hun continues to mention how impressive Yu Yujin's sales were while solving the issues that day. Yu Yujin goes with the flow and mentions that he indeed had something he wanted to investigate and had a plan in mind for the lone sharks. Awkwardly rubbing his hand, Yu Yujin mentions how he got captured much faster than he expected. Seong Hin brings up his brother and says it's only natural for the guildmaster to worry so much about him since he is his only living family member. Seong Hin shares that he had a similar situation with his grandfather raising him, as he had no parents. Seong Hin used to visit his grandfather regularly and became a hunter while protecting him from dungeons. Dungeon shocks. Seong Han admits that Yu Hyun even hired a specialized healer for his grandfather, but unfortunately, he passed away from an illness. Acknowledging that Yu Hyun understands the importance of family, Seong Han requests that Yu Yujin doesn't hate him. Yu Yujin reassures him, mentioning that he feels safe knowing someone as elite as Seong Han is his brother's right hand man. When Seong Han points out that he isn't getting drunk even after all that, due to his poison resistance skill, Yu Yujin realizes that he forgot to turn off the skill. The cup falls out of Yu Yujin's hand as the full effect rushes into him together, and he falls asleep on the table. Waking up the next day, Yu Yujin is surprised to see Seong Hun bringing water for him. As he freaks out, seeing Seong Hun in his room early in the morning, he mentions that Yu Yujin's basic education will start today. Opening his status window, Yu Yujin sees that Kim Seong Hun is also included in the influence list now. Poking at Seong Hun's bright face, he can only wonder what happened last night. Seong Han mentions how last night, while drunk, Yu Yujin kept mentioning that he loves Seong Han. Even as Seong Han helps Yu Yujin out of the club, Yu Yujin continues to express his love for him. Upon hearing what he did, Yu Yujin bows down, apologizing for the grave sin he committed. However, Seong Han mentions that he actually likes it. He further explains that it might sound weird, but at that moment, Yu Yujin reminded him of his grandfather and how he used to tell him that he loved him. Seong Han recalls the memory of his grandfather while drunk, escorting him, and mentioning how he loved him. As he says this, a notification appears, stating that the awakener, Seong Han, has been influenced. Wide-eyed, Yu Yujin asks again if he truly reminds him of his grandfather. Yu Yujin thinks how, even in his twenties, Seong Han looks like a crusty old man. Seong Han mentions that it might seem weird, but it had been a long time since he felt so relieved. Seong Han offers that if it's not too much, he can stop by sometimes just to check on Yu Yujin. He explains that he would like to do for Yu Yujin what he couldn't do for the person who raised him. Hearing this, Yu Yujin realizes that this became the title of nurturer. It would make sense considering that Yerim and Mew are so attached to him. They all see him as their caregiver. The effect is more extreme in Yu Han's case because Yu Yujin originally looked after him. 
As Yerim enters her new dorm, she starts quarreling with Myungwu, telling him to stay away from Yu Yujin. Observing all this, Yu Yujin realizes that his skill, nurturer, doesn't just influence people but brainwashes them. He thinks how this is the most powerful skill, perhaps since it can brainwash even S ranks. A few days later, Yu Yujin praises Myungwu's cooking skills, and even Yerim reluctantly commends it. She mentions that if Myungwu is going to freeload, then he should at least cook. Upon hearing Yu Yujin say that she will raise dungeons soon, Yerim turns up with a haughty expression, mentioning that she will have lots of money. Then she can buy a big house and Yu Yujin can just live there with her. As Yerim and Myungwu quarrel again, Yu Yujin mentions that all three of them will take the hunter education together. Just then, Suk Simyong kicks open their door, mentioning that the theoretical portion will be postponed for a bit. So today the three will participate in the practical portion of the dedication. Watching as hundreds of tooth moles rush toward them, the three hear Simyong mention that the test is easy. He puts forth a strange logic, mentioning that if they want to gain experience from fighting monsters, then fighting a lot of them will increase the experience gain. As the two boys are overwhelmed by the sheer number of monsters, Yerim jumps forward with excitement and starts swiftly killing them. Observing her performance, the officials comment that it's expected of an S-rank hunter. Despite being a newcomer, she possesses considerable power. Seok Simyong expresses his concern that the other two won't have any monsters to handle while Yerim finishes them off. As a tooth mole rushes towards Myungwoo from under the pile, fear grips him, causing him to drop his spear and retreat. At the last moment, Yu Yujin assists him in evading the monster's attack. Yu Yujin explains that tooth moles are just E rank creatures, and their difficulty lies in their inability to change directions quickly. The key is to avoid running in a straight line. Observing Yu Yujin's adept handling of the situation, Simeon remarks on how he acts like an experienced hunter. He also notes that the contract he drafted for Yerim is close to the industry standard, wondering what other secrets Yu Yujin may be hiding. Watching Yu Yujin confidently take on the Tooth Mole, Myungwu comments on how he behaves like a seasoned hunter. Upon hearing this, Yu Yujin realizes how others may perceive him based on his actions. Intentionally trying to make a blunder to appear more like a newbie, he stumbles, only to have the Tooth Mole latch onto his shoulders. Witnessing this unexpected turn of events, both Myungwu and Simeon are bewildered. Exiting the practice area, Yerim looks satisfied and radiant, while Myungwu is supported by Yu Yujin wearing a pained expression on his face. Outside, Simeon introduces them to Xiao Kayan, his niece who will oversee the theoretical portion of their studies. Finding her familiar, Yu Yujin realizes that she is the young genius who discovered the principles of dungeon formation. She expresses surprise as Yu Yujin addresses her by her nickname, Dr. White. Noting her astonishment, Yu Yujin deduces that perhaps her research hasn't gained widespread fame yet. Heian explains that she will be staying at World's Edge due to research-related matters. Shaking hands with the beautiful lady, Yu Yujin wonders if his rosy youth is about to begin. Sitting in class with Yerim and Myungwu, Yu Yujin attentively listens to Seok Heian as she delivers a lecture on the history of guilds and the ranks of hunters. He admires how concise and easily understandable her lectures are. However, glancing at her research notes, Yu Yujin realizes that there are some wrong theories she had written down. It's understandable, considering they are from five years ago. Noticing his expression, Seok Heian realizes that he must have discovered something wrong. Curious, she asks about his opinions. Yu Yujin hesitates for a moment before mentioning that it may be incorrect to claim that skills solely develop in dangerous situations, as there are many skills unrelated to combat. Thus, self-preservation may not be the sole reason behind skill acquisition. As he finishes explaining that there might be other determining factors for skills, she excitedly grabs his hands, delighted that he is even aware of the current trends in awakened individuals' manifested skills. She remarks that she now understands why her uncle had his eye on him. Still misunderstanding, she thinks he is conducting individual research. She then suggests combining their findings and having a 10-hour discussion during lunch. Deciding to distract her, Yu Yujin turns to Yerim and asks if she has any questions for the teacher. Yerim inquires about the earnings of an S-rank hunter. Upon hearing this, Seok Heian puts on a show, with currency notes flying around her, mentioning that an S-rank hunter earns approximately 10 million each year. Yu Yujin observes her performance with a poker face, considering if she had already prepared for this question, but he is relieved that he managed to evade her attention. After the class, Yu Hun shows him the infant horn fire lion he managed to bring from the dungeon. Since it possesses a fire attribute like Yu Hyun, it won't burn down if he rides it as a mount. An adult fire lion boasts impressive stats, and even an S-rank hunter would struggle to face it alone. 
Yuhian attempts to tame the feisty creature using an item called the Owner's Token, which should make the monster recognize him as its owner. However, the item seems to have no effect on the infant monster, as it leaps towards Yuhian instead of following his orders. Witnessing this, Yuhian unleashes a blast of flames at the small creature. To his dismay, he forgot that fire attacks have no effect on a horned fire lion. The creature lands safely on Yuhan's face and playfully scratches him with its adorable claws. Despite Yuhan's attempts, he fails to calm it down and tosses it into the indoor garden. Observing the cute monster, Yu Yujin realizes that his title, Nurturer, extends its influence to animals as well. Understanding that he only needs to utter the keywords, he asks Yuhan if he can try taming it. Most dungeon monsters are slain, while a select few are successfully tamed. These creatures are highly sought after due to the vast size of higher ranked dungeons, where using a mount gives one an advantage. Pointing at his brother, Yujin mentions that it will be a great mount for him, as it has fire resistance. If it can be tamed, the world's edge will obtain unrivaled power, and he will receive massive money for taming it, Yujin thinks inwardly. Curious, Yuhian asks how they will tame it to which he replies with food. Yuhian points out that the creature will only consume monster meat if it is mixed with C-class magic stones. Yujin is surprised because each C-class magic stone costs a staggering $10,000. Eventually, he decides to sprinkle magic magic stone powder on top of finely ground monster meat. Yujin is still shocked, calculating that even if they feed it only once a day, it would amount to $3.6 million a year. If they choose to feed it three times a day, the cost would skyrocket to $10 million annually. Yuhian assures Yujin that he will cover the expenses, so he doesn't need to worry about it. Snapping out of his days, Yujin can't help but find the little monster incredibly adorable. As he opens the door to the inner garden and steps inside, the creature immediately assumes a defensive stance. However, Yujin tosses a B-class belt in its direction, and the infant horned lion playfully engages with it. Having worked part-time at an animal hospital in his previous life, Yujin knows that animals enjoy playing tug-of-war. However, due to the lion's significant strength, Yujin finds himself being thrown around. In a trembling state, Yujin raises the master's token item in front of the creature. Its effects are amplified by his title as a perfect nurturer. No longer on guard, the creature begins to exhibit cute behavior. Meanwhile, Yuhan remarks that he has never seen the creature behave this way before. As Yujin continues to interact with the docile creature, Yuhan advises him to be cautious, but it ends up biting Yuhan's hand. Surprisingly, the creature immediately acts cute as Yujin scolds it. Letting out a sigh, Yuhian assures Yujin that everything is fine and encourages him to raise it well. Even if it can't serve as a mount, it will still be able to protect Yujin. With a bright smile, Yujin declares that he will take good care of it. He believes that influencing monsters is better than brainwashing humans. If he succeeds, he can have a group of powerful baby monsters by his side. Lost in his fantasies of becoming a beast tamer, Yujin surprises Yuhian by mentioning that he will raise it in his dorm. Observing Yu Hyun's saddened expression, he asks about the reason. Yu Hyun replies that although they have made amends, they don't get to see each other as often. Patting his head, Yu Jin assures Yu Hyun that he is not moving away and will continue to visit him. He then suggests that they have a drink together the following night, after Yu Jin finishes his dungeon education. Yu Jin contemplates how, if the world were peaceful, these two companions would have shared a drink long ago. With a beaming smile, Yu Han agrees and expresses his anticipation for the occasion. In response to his brother's question, Yujin decides to name the infant horned lion Peace, explaining his belief that the world should be filled with love and peace. The next day, Yujin and the others are taken aback to see Yuhan joining them on their expedition into the dungeon. Observing him closely, Yujin realizes that his brother is still just as weird. Outside the dungeon, the reporters eagerly snap pictures of Yuhan and the others, highlighting how Yuhan is assisting Park Yerim in her first dungeon run. Yuhian mentions that he is here to help the new S rank hunter, Miss Yerim, through her first dungeon raid. On the sidelines, Yujin and Myungwoo discuss how Yuhan strategically maintains his public image. Inwardly, Yujin thinks that Yuhan and Yerim truly make an ideal combination, with their contrasting attributes of fire and ice. He notes that Myungwoo's equipment creation skills and Seonghan's imminent acquisition of an S rank defensive skill add to the synergy of the team. Patting Myungwoo's shoulder with a bright smile, Yujin expresses his anticipation for their upcoming endeavors. As part of the guild, they have access to remarkable equipment for the dungeon run. However, the recovery potions are exclusively provided to guild members. Thus, Yujin instructs Yerim to take all the potions and distribute them to him and Myungwoo under her name. 
the guild official wears a deadpan expression upon witnessing this request. Watching Yujin skillfully suggest a weapon choice to Yerim, Yu Hyun realizes that their team leader, Seok Simeung, was right. Sometimes, Yujin displays a surprising level of knowledge for a new hunter. Misunderstanding the situation, Yu Hyun chuckles, thinking that his older brother has been gathering hunter-related information to assist him. Meanwhile, the reporters are taken aback by the guildmaster's rare smile. The team approaches the gate of the D-rank dungeon, the Obsidian Zone. As Yu Hyun explains the dungeon's mechanics and the functioning of the gate stone, Yujin remembers how it feels like only yesterday when he was treated poorly, regarded as trash. But now, the situation has drastically changed. He is no longer subjected to insults or burdened with debt. The team is awestruck by the breathtaking scenery that greets them inside the dungeon. Drawing his weapon, Yu Hyun slashes his sword, destroying the landscape and setting it on fire. As Yerim complains, Yujin points forward, alerting her to the monsters hiding in the grass. Sheathing his sword, Yu Hyun advises that the first step upon entering a new room in a dungeon is to secure the surroundings. Addressing Yerim, he mentions that they should have learned such a basic principle in their classes. Yujin adds that the primary objective of this dungeon run is for Yerim to reach level 10 by eliminating monsters, thereby earning a random skill. Inwardly, Yujin opens her status screen and ponders how he can select a skill for her, capitalizing on the benefits of his title. Contemplating the options, he decides that the skill Pale Rain would be fitting, as it was the signature skill of the Ice Witch in his past life. Focusing on this choice, Yujin has a hunch that Yerim will gain an area of effect skill, which excites her. Hearing this, Yu Hyun mentions that the experience points required to level up differ significantly between S rank and F rank hunters. S rank hunters need almost five times as much. He mentions that he will look after Yujin and advises Yerim to focus on her own growth. Hearing these words, Yerim becomes angry, accusing Yu Han of being jealous because she's close to Yujin. Yujin intervenes, pinching their cheeks and scolding them to stop quarreling. He tells them to concentrate on their work and fighting the monsters. Yujin emphasizes that if they continue to fight, he won't see them anymore. With tense expressions on their faces, the two reluctantly make up, promising to work together from now on. Observing the pressure exerted by the two, Myungwoo becomes stiff with fear, while Yujin seems unfazed, encouraging them to support each other. Seeing them try to outperform one another, Yujin wonders if they will ever truly work together. In another location, in a peculiar four-dimensional room, folding in on itself, various girls in the room mention how the person who possesses the ability to turn back time has entered a dungeon. Eagerly anticipating his appearance, they mention that the only time they can intervene is when he is inside a dungeon. One of them mentions how she has been waiting for this moment for a long time. In the dungeon, Yerim and Yuhan narrowly evade the monster's attacks, leaving them barely dead for Yujin, an F-rank hunter, to easily kill. Myungwoo and Yujin stand in silent surprise as they witness the massive pile of monsters in front of them, with Yerim and Yuhan asking Yujin to stab them. Meanwhile, Yujin skillfully collects the magic stones from the heap of defeated monsters. Then, he suggests that Myungwoo should also stab a few, noting that he needs to level up as well. Myungwoo asks Yujin if he will also receive a beneficial skill upon leveling up. Hearing this, Yujin confirms that, of course, he will. While contemplating Myungwoo's stats, Yujin thinks about how he will obtain an SS rank skill upon reaching level 10. Just then, Yujin realizes that in addition to reaching level 10, there is another requirement. Apparently, Myungwoo must create 10,000 weapons to acquire the SS rank skill. As Yujin contemplates Myungwoo's lack of skill upon reaching level 10, he wonders who writes these message prompts. Even in the future, when everyone was familiar with the system, they referred to it as a divine gift. However, Yujin doubts that God would make a typing error in Myungwoo's status window. At that moment, a message appears before him, stating, found you. Another window follows, apologizing to him, while the next message reveals that Yu Hyun and Yerim will protect him from the boss monster's attack. Yujin mentions how a boss monster of such caliber shouldn't appear in a D-rank dungeon. They witness the original boss monster being killed by a massive bird that suddenly appeared. However, the dungeon gate does not appear. It becomes obvious that the bird has taken the place of the new boss monster, meaning that they must defeat it. Yujin is surprised, realizing that this situation is the same as what happened when Yu Hyun died in the future, where another powerful boss suddenly appeared in a dungeon. Determined, Yujin informs them that the monster is a class 2 bird creature known as the Golden Beaked Maya. It possesses fire attributes and is at the level of an A-rank dungeon boss. Explaining its weaknesses, he suggests they focus their attacks on its softer head rather than the rest of its body. 
Yu Hyun inquires how Yu Jin possesses such detailed information, to which he replies that he will explain later. Once they finish off the monster, he instructs Yerim to use her skill, Cold Sai, to create a barrier for them, and advises Yu Hyun to eliminate the bird. He warns Yerim that she would burn if she were to engage in direct combat. Fighting a fire-type monster of this strength requires fire-resistance skills like Yu Hyun possesses. Yu Jin glances at his brother, realizing that perhaps Yu Hyun doesn't have the skill Blue Willow leaves, which he uses for flight in the future. Suddenly, the bird launches an attack on the three behind Yu Hyun. Desperate, Yu Hyun finally utilizes Blue Willow leaves. However, to Yu Jin's confusion, Yu Han only ends up confusing the monster with leaves instead of attacking it. Seeing this, Yu Jin shouts at him, mentioning that he's supposed to jump on the leaves and launch an attack. Stepping on them, Yu Hyun is surprised to discover that he can do this. Thus, he positions himself at the same level as the monster's head. An explosion resonates as their attacks collide mid-air. Yu Jin advises Yerim to continue holding her barrier, as all three would be doomed otherwise. As Yu Hyun descends back to the ground, Yu Jin quickly approaches him, inquiring if he's alright. Yu Hyun smiles and praises Yu Jin for coming up with such a brilliant idea. Yu Jin responds, slightly confused, mentioning that he always assumed Yu Hyun used the leaves as a substitute for flight. Yu Hyun admits the thought never crossed his mind but he always felt that he was lacking a flight skill. But now Yu Jin has helped him. Yu Jin smiles at Yu Hyun, acting like a child who received a present on his birthday. In the end, both Yu Hyun and Yerim request Yu Jin to take a look at their other skills as well. Outside, reporters and officials mention they were worried when the color of the dungeon suddenly changed. Yu Hyun explains that it's because an Arank monster emerged out of nowhere. Just then, Seong Hyun approaches Yu Hyun, mentioning how worried he was and that he should have accompanied him. Back at World's Edge, the management offers them an expensive celebratory feast. Seeing Mungu nowhere in sight, Yujin decides to go play with Peace instead. In the end, he ends up battered and bruised, with Peace on his chest after they played and Peace devoured his expensive food. Yujin tells Peace how he always thought that he was going to die today and how strange messages were received from the system. He wonders if all this happened because of something that went wrong as a result of turning back time. Perhaps this is why things that were only supposed to occur in the future are happening now, and that's why the system is trying to communicate with him. Shouting to no one in particular, he states that it's not his fault. If things were meant to go like this, the system should have mentioned it from the beginning. As he opens his status window, he is taken aback to see it transform into a burst of light. Meanwhile, in the peculiar four-dimensional blue room, the girls discuss whether it was transferred successfully. The others reply that the time to interfere was too short. The first girl mentions that it would have been better if they could have provided a more detailed explanation. The girl on the computer mentions that Yujin should be able to understand it. Back with Yujin, he looks at the book containing pictures of Yu Hyun and Yerim under the title Fully Influenced Targets. Observing the empty spaces, he wonders if the system is asking him to raise 50s ranks. Currently, Yujin observes Peace fighting against Tooth Moles while documenting its progress. Noting the recent growth, he realizes that Peace has doubled in size in just two days. At the moment, Yujin has borrowed top tier stamina and strength equipment to match Peace's S rank status, ensuring they can play together easily. Last night, during their drink, Yujin casually mentions to Yu Hyun how he acquired an S-rank skill called Magic Beast Tamer at level 10, using it as a cover for his true skill, Perfect Nurturer. He explains that he can now nurture monsters to their tamed state, and it also works on S-rank creatures. Seeing Yu Hyun's astonishment, Yujin suggests that instead of hiding this skill, they should actively utilize it. Imagine a world where everyone at World's Edge possesses high-ranking mounts thanks to their efforts. Attempting dungeons with mounts would be similar to riding horses if previously they had been walking. With a skill like this, the dynamics of dungeon clearing would rapidly change. Eventually, Yujin manages to convince his brother. Returning to training with peace, Yujin contemplates how if the system wants him to influence 50s ranks, it would be more efficient to brainwash monsters rather than humans. At the end of their training, Yujin feels utterly exhausted while peace remains full of stamina. However, despite his fatigue, he can't give up because as time passes, the number of dungeons will increase. As the difficulty rises, their efficiency in clearing dungeons must also improve. 
Just then, he hears the voice of Seok Simeung praising him for training right after the hunter education class. Simeung mentions how amazed he is that peace has grown significantly merely due to Yujin applying his taming skill. Simeung bows to Yujin, acknowledging his impressive abilities. He apologizes for his previous disrespectful attitude, now realizing that Yujin has analytical skills and taming skills. Simeung pleads with Yujin to join World's Edge as a member, even clinging to his legs. Pushing him away, Yujin reflects on how all this knowledge was obtained from memorized future information. Besides, Yujin doesn't like Simeon. In the previous timeline, Yujin was always afraid of Simeon whenever he came to World's Edge to meet his brother. Now, Yujin holds the superior position over Simeon. With a haughty look, Yujin rejects his offer, stating that Yuhan has already taken care of all the expenses. Instead, he proposes signing a contract as a regular employee, not as a hunter of World's Edge. This way, he can provide mounts and monsters for other guilds as well. Yujin mentions that World's Edge isn't even the strongest guild in the nation, so an exclusive contract would be impractical. If other guilds were to understand that an F rank with such exceptional skills would only benefit World's Edge, they would try to eliminate him. In conclusion, Yujin declares that he will raise mounts for other guilds, forcing them to protect him. Pointing at Simeon, Yujin emphasizes that since he will be a World's Edge employee, they should take care of him and handle negotiations with other guilds on his behalf. Hearing this, Simeon laughs aloud, agreeing to the terms and requesting the video footage of Peace's training to share with other guilds. Walking down the hallway after leaving the room, Simeon wonders if Yujin lacks self-awareness of his own worth. He contemplates how unlike other hunters who obtain S-rank skills, he doesn't act arrogantly and pays attention to others and his surroundings. World's Edge was already prepared to handle the risks of Yujin joining as a hunter. However, if he remains unaffiliated, all eyes will be on Yujin rather than the World's Edge guild. Within a few days, the various guild masters of Korea's top guilds decide to visit World's Edge after watching the video of Yujin playing with Peace. In his room, Yujin sets up a new den for Peace to play in. Shortly after, the other members arrive, and Yerim becomes excited over the adorable creature. Meanwhile, Yujin tells Peace that Myungwoo is not food. Just then, Yu Hyun informs Yujin that the guild masters are coming to meet him. Walking to the room, Yu Hyun mentions that Yujin can decline the meeting if he doesn't want to participate, mentioning the pressure he might feel in front of S ranks. However, Yujin refuses, emphasizing how beneficial it would be for World's Edge's public image to have powerful S ranks visiting their office. Entering the room, all eyes focus on Yujin, and he feels the pressure exerted by the participants. Thankfully, his fear resistance skill activates, nullifying the pressure. Suddenly, another guild's member approaches him, seeking permission to appraise Yujin. Yujin's status and confirm the presence of his taming skill. However, Yujin hesitates, realizing that the appraiser will reveal all his S and L class skills. Just then, Peace jumps in front of Yujin, protecting him. Observing this, the Hunter Association president wonders aloud if Peace detected a skill being used and is trying to protect its owner. The Hanshin Guildmaster, Park Minju, is surprised by Peace's strength. Moon Huna, the Breaker Guildmaster, mentions that seeing Peace protect Yujin confirms that he has tamed it. Yujin admires her tall physique while she expresses surprise at the fact that the World's Edge Guildmaster has a big brother. Seeing her height, Yujin wonders inwardly if Yerim will also grow so tall. She asks Yuhan to give the Breaker Guild one of Peace's offspring, should it ever have one. Yuhan suggests trading it for a baby monster of the highest class with an ice attribute. Choi Seokwon, the MKC Guildmaster, gets angry, claiming that they are being used to obtain an S-rank mount for Miss Yerim. Yuhan suggests that they can easily obtain one by running a dungeon. Choi Seokwon refers to his unaffiliated status as a sham. In response, Yujin explains that he is using the World's Edge Guild to handle everything, including the meeting. He mentions that if his sole intention was to help his brother, he wouldn't offer to raise mounts for other guilds. Moon Hyana stands close to Yujin and playfully grabs his face, complimenting his taming skill and eloquence. She then offers him to leave World's Edge and join the Breaker Guild. Initially embarrassed by the beautiful woman being so close to him, he starts sweating when he realizes his brother is about to burn the room. Reacting quickly, he rejects her offer, stating that he would only make an exception if his brother becomes the best in the nation. Hearing this, Sung Hyungi, the Jupiter Guildmaster, asks if they can buy Yujin since Jupiter is currently the strongest guild in the nation. Not only that, but Yujin is also the strongest hunter in the country. Seeing the angry looks from the other hunters, Yujin clarifies that this offer is only limited to his brother. Other guilds would need to be the best in the world for him to join them exclusively. The other S-ranks suggest that perhaps Yuhyun inherited stubbornness from his older brother. 
Eugen replies that his younger brother is actually more docile and calm compared to him, not to mention more docile than anyone in the room. The room falls silent, prompting Eugen to wonder if he said something strange. The others ask him if he is serious, their faces filled with disbelief. Eugen remembers how kind and caring Yuhyun has always been to him, even when they were children. He explains that Yuhyun has always been docile and kind, even as a kid, never causing any trouble for his older brother. The guildmasters burst into laughter, clutching their stomachs. Moon Hyana points out that Yuhyun is composed today because his big brother is present. Observing this, Yujin accuses them of harassing his younger brother simply because he is younger than them. Eventually, the guildmasters reach an agreement to construct a building in Eugen's name, where he can raise mounts for all the guilds. All five guilds guarantee Eugen's safety and agree to invest equally in this project. Eugen struggles to contain his excitement, trying to hide the broad smile on his face. He realizes that a building in the heart of Seoul will belong solely to him. He envisions bringing Myungwu and Seok Hyun to the building, creating workshops and research areas for them. He indulges in fantasies of future fame and success. Later that night, Myungwoo prepares a delicious feast for him. When Yujin offers Myungwoo to move to the new building, he misunderstands, thinking that Yujin is trying to kick him out. Realizing that Myungwoo is now determined to leave, Yujin employs his acting skills. He mentions that he can't force Myungwoo to stay but expresses his regret since he has discovered some highly valuable information that would greatly benefit Myungwoo. Yujin explains that even though the information is valuable, he cannot share it as Myungwoo is unwilling to listen. He mentions hearing from Seok Hayan that there are methods for hunters like Myungwoo to awaken their skills. By using Seok Hayan's name, it becomes easier to convince Myungwoo, as the information seems to come from an authority figure. In her room, Seok Hayan works diligently in the darkness, whispering about her hopes of gathering answers through her research. Yujin, tossing a cluster of kitchen knives at his feet, explains that this is the ideal method for him. However, he can't mention it to anyone, not even Seok Hayan. He mentions how Myungwoo possesses a skill related to weapons and should try sharpening these knives. Observing Myungwoo's status, Yujin realizes that by sharpening these knives, he can fulfill the requirement of the 10,000 weapon count skill. Myungwoo is delighted to hear this, as all he has to do is sharpen 10,000 knives to obtain an incredible skill. Promising to sharpen 100 knives each day, he estimates that he will finish in 100 days. Myungwoo finds comfort in repetitive work, and he vows to repay Yujin's kindness by doing his best. Yujin thinks that it's now time to convince his retirement asset number two. Few hours later he is listening to Seok Hain praise his knowledge and how nice it is to talk to him. She mentions that he is probably doing some separate research and suggests they should conduct joint research at the university. He mentions that these are all his guesses since he lacks dates since there aren't many dungeons in the country yet. She agrees that they would be able to compile some statistics if they could investigate more dungeons. Upon hearing her mention joining the overseas team, Yujin remembers that she will eventually return to America. In three years, her team will discover the dungeon formation principle, resulting in massive royalties for America from the rest of the world. Moments later, Seok Hain informs him that she has prepared buckwheat jelly to attract the renowned hunter known known as Dokibai. Dokibai is a hunter whose personal information has never been revealed, even five years into the future. The only known fact about him is his special skill called teleportation. By using this skill, they gained fame by rescuing numerous people during dungeon breaks and natural disasters. However, this ability also posed a significant danger, prompting the underworld bosses to conspire to control Dokibai. In a surprising turn, he disrupted their meeting and assured them that although he held many secrets, they would never be exposed. Then, he vanished. Since Dokibai had no affiliations, everyone eventually gave up on controlling him, allowing him to freely roam the world. Hence, Seok Hain spreads roasted buckwheat, suggesting that Dokibai would possess extensive knowledge about dungeons. Suddenly, the electricity goes out, plunging them into darkness. Hain spots a bloodied figure wearing white robes standing behind Yujin. Just as she screams and faints, Yujin's fear resistance skill activates. He realizes that this elaborate performance is likely intended to scare them. He then calls out to Dokibai, asking to reveal themselves. In that moment, Dokibai emerges from a blue portal, apologizing for frightening them. Analyzing Dokibai's status, Yujin recognizes this as an opportunity. If he can influence Dokibai, Heian wouldn't have to go to America. Confidently, he asserts that he wasn't scared in the least by the prank. He then proposes a bet to Dokibai, challenging whether he can truly frighten Yujin or not. In her bed, Heian suddenly opens her eyes and asks about Dokibai. Yujin calmly mentions that he left. 
she expresses her disappointment, mentioning that there were many questions she wanted to ask him. Faced with a research block, Hayen reveals her struggle, and Yujin offers to assist her in acquiring data. Thinking about his encounter with Dokibai, Yujin hints that he knows a way to obtain that information. Two hours earlier, Yujin declares that if he loses the bet, he will become Dokibai's underling. However, if he doesn't get scared, Dokibai must serve as his underling for three years. Dokibai chuckles, suggesting that as an F-rank hunter, it would only be fair if Yujin commits to working for 20 years. Quickly taking out a contract, Yujin agrees. Suspicious, Dokibai speculates that Yujin must be concealing a skill or an item that is the reason for his confidence. Grinning mischievously, Yujin admits to having an ulterior motive. He finds Dokibai incredibly cool. Showering him with praise, Yujin claims that even if he loses, he would gladly become Dokibai's underling. Happy at the compliments, Dokibai accepts the terms of the contract. In Heian's room at present, Yujin mentions that he can't disclose the source, but he can provide her with the necessary data. He proposes that if they unravel the dungeon formation principle together, they can split the profits equally. Yujin reveals his confidence in her ability to yield results. Discussing the recently discovered a rank dungeon in Ikan, Jiongi province, he informs her that the dungeon's environment will consist of either a coast or slime. Yujin possesses this knowledge from his past life. He urges her to seriously consider his proposal if his information proves accurate. Before leaving, he reassures her not to worry about the research results, saying that he is confident in her success. He also reminds her to have her uncle bid for the management rights of the dungeon. Now he only needs to deal with the challenge of enduring Dokibai's scare pranks. Yujin reflects on the failed first attempt while casually playing with peace, paying no mind to the ghostly screams outside his window. The second attempt also proves unsuccessful as a ghost tries to pull his leg. Again in the third scare attempt, Yujin's fear resistance skill saves him. Just then, they spot a fatigued Myungwu with dark circles under his eyes, clutching a sharpened knife. Yujin greets him calmly, while Dokibai is frightened by the sight. Witnessing Dokibai transformed into a ghost, Myungwu also screams with fear and faints. With the third attempt ending in failure, Dokibai loses the bet. As Yujin tends to the sleeping Myungwu, Dokibai sobs in the background over his loss. He confesses that he already had subordinates but can no longer return to them, as they would mock him for recklessly signing a contract. Glancing at Dokibai's status, Yujin notices that their name is Yun Yun, a peculiar name for a person, he thinks. Since Dokibai lost the bet, he reveals that he is simultaneously over a thousand years old and only three years old. A realization strikes Yujin, and he asks if Dokibai was born alongside the system when the dungeons emerged three years ago. Dokibai confirms his suspicion, explaining that the power of the dungeons infused into the soul of an old object, resulting in his creation. This also explains why Dokibai lacks a specific gender. Hearing this, Yujin comprehends the logic behind Dokibai's teleportation skill, as the dungeons are a gateway connecting this space to another. However, he never thought that Dokibai was an actual Dokibai. Yujin reveals the meaning behind Yun, suggesting that Dokibai must have been born from an old water mill. Dokibai is surprised, asking how he knew that. Yujin replies that this is the ability his new boss possesses. Yujin assigns Dokibai the task of investigating dungeons in other countries since they are typically restricted to foreigners. When Dokibai asks why, Yujin bluffs, mentioning that it's to enhance Dokibai's hero status. He emphasizes that the data collected will contribute to the development of the dungeon formation theory ultimately preventing dungeon-related deaths. As this benefits the entire world, Dokibai will naturally become a worldwide hero, with Dokibai-themed toys and figures and people cheering for him. Upon hearing this, Dokibai agrees, with a big smile. Curious, Yujin realizes that the current Dokibai cannot teleport over long distances, indicating that the skill he saw in Dokibai's status may not have awakened yet. Acknowledging this, Yujin emotionlessly expresses his love for Dokibai, using the specific activation phrase. Hearing this, Dokibai releases a confused sound and asks what this means, genuinely surprised. Yujin begins bluffing how Dokibis are inherently filled with love, and a true Dokibai must become accustomed to love. Still embarrassed, Dokibai vanishes in a puff of smoke, teleporting away. The next day, Heian and Simeung burst into his room, wearing wide smiles, confirming that Yujin was right, it is a slime dungeon. The World's Edge Guild has secured a significant source of funds because the slime found in the dungeon is an incredibly valuable material. Heian states that she agrees to Yujin's proposal. Hearing their demands, Yujin flees, urging Simeung to support Heian's research while he focuses on magic beast taming. Running away, Yujin understands that his predictions are currently accurate. 
but he doesn't want to be labeled a liar in the future as events are changing. Observing him running away, the two praise Eugen as a true researcher who selflessly supports the guild without seeking any personal rewards. It appears that despite his refusal, the misunderstanding has only deepened. Currently, Eugen and Peace have been invited to a TV show. Peace amazes the audience with tricks like navigating through a maze and then cuddling with his owner, creating a heartwarming atmosphere. Eugen recalls how a few days ago, Simung asked him to appear on a TV broadcast to increase his fame. He mentioned that no matter how hard they tried, this information would be leaked, so it's better to take control and do it on their own terms. The more attention he receives, the safer he will be. While pondering all this, Yerim, who is accompanying him as his escort, cheers him on from the background. Eugen realizes he doesn't have any pleasant memories of appearing on TV, and fears he might be cursed again. Meanwhile, reporters and staff members swoon over Peace's cuteness. During the break, Eugen, feeling tired, is glad he can showcase his kid's adorable side to the rest of the world. He thinks about creating a social media account for Peace, where he can share cute pictures and Peace will eventually become a global star. In the next moment, he is surprised to find Moon Huna, the Breaker Guildmaster, looking down at him, causing him to scream in surprise. She mentions that at least three rank hunters need to be present to film a monster, so she used it as an excuse to come and meet him. Eugen advises her to be mindful of her image since everyone is watching. In response, she pulls him closer and questions why she should be concerned when he will be the one raising her child. Eugen and everyone else listening are shocked by her statement. He scolds her, stating that she will cause misunderstandings. She requests him to join her guild, mentioning how attractive it is to see him act fearlessly towards her. Eugen calmly replies that his brother is also an S-rank hunter, and ultimately, they are all humans, so he has nothing to fear. She loves hearing him say that, but it does worry her. Then she creates a barrier around the two of them, informing Yerim that she will borrow Eugen for five minutes. While holding the angry piece in place, Eugen inquires about her intentions. She explains that it's simply a soundproofing barrier, and promises to provide a suitable explanation later. She wishes to talk about Yuhian, mentioning her concern that Eugen knows too little about his brother. She clarifies that she has no intentions of coming between the two of them but suggests that Eugen should look deeper into his brother's actions. She then asks if he truly trusts his brother and believes that Yuhan became a guildmaster solely based on skill. She mentions that Yuhian is not some angel descended from heaven because angels don't trample on others to establish their own guilds. Then, she asks Yujin if he genuinely wishes to know how Yuhian lived his life as a hunter. Moon Huna remembers how, after awakening, she could no longer pursue her career as an athlete and quickly rose to the position of guildmaster. However, both she and Choi Siakwen partnered with conglomerates to establish their guilds and ended up becoming mere figureheads. The true guildmasters among Korea's top guilds are Sung Hyungi from Jupiter and Han Yuhian from World's Edge. Han Yuhian is just a stubborn youngster trying to establish his own guild without accepting any sponsors. Moon Huna expects him to fail soon, considering him a childish brat. She had heard rumors that some people even attempted to poison him. Innocent at the time, she felt it was cruel to target a child, so she went to help him. Little did she know, Han Yuhian had massacred those who tried to kill him. Observing his bloodthirsty nature, she realized he must be the child of a beast rather than human. The incident of him killing his enemies was covered up as a gas explosion. Eugen listens to her with a frightened expression on his face. Moon Huna mentions how he must have felt the difference when the brothers reunited after being apart for so long. Whispering in his ear, she reveals that Yuhan is only pretending to be a gentle brother and that he can never know when Yuhan will reveal his true colors. She takes out her phone to see Yuhan calling her and offers to protect Yujin from his brother. Muttering under his breath about his brother having endured his own hell, Yujin snatches her phone. Answering the call, he hears Yuhan asking if she said something strange to him. Calmly, Yujin informs Yuhan that she was talking shit about him. He believes it doesn't matter if his brother has changed or not because he understands how this world works after experiencing his own hardships for five years. Eugen knows his own hands are stained with blood. Moreover, he cannot betray his own brother who sacrificed his life to protect him. He declares that if she wishes to speak ill of others behind their backs, he can return the favor. With that, he begins to talk about an incident that occurred a year ago around April. Hearing Eugen's words, Moon Huda's expression shifts from calm to surprised. Just as he is about to reveal Moon Huna's dark past, which everyone will discover in four years, she snatches her phone and crushes it. Angrily, she asks how he knows about it. She grabs his collar, shaking him, 
and Eugen nonchalantly mentions that he heard about it by chance. He warns her that she can kill him if she wishes, but then she wouldn't get a beast mount. Observing Iram and Moon Hyuna acting close to each other, Eugen wonders if she will join the Breakers Guild after her contract runs out, as the Breakers Guild will soon cease to exist. In the future, neither Moon Hyuna nor Choi Seokwon are able to keep up, and the Breakers and MKC guilds disband after a few years. Eugen thinks about whether he should influence Moon Hyuna, realizing that Yerim would be happier with a fellow female looking after her instead of an old man like him. Walking along a hallway, Myungwoo is surprised that the equipment maintenance department allowed him to utilize their workplace. Yujin reveals that he asked them since Myungwoo can't keep sharpening his knives in the kitchen forever. Yujin suggests that it will be advantageous for him. He mentions that Myungwoo should try to make friends considering he might end up working with them in the future. Myungwoo expresses the same sentiment, emphasizing his aversion to raiding dungeons. Yujin agrees with him, mentioning that Myungwoo doesn't have much aptitude in dungeon raiding. Upon entering the factory, the intense heat of strong fires and metals being melted blasts them in the face. Myungwoo sees an unnaturally large magic crystal and is about to touch it. Just then, a voice sounds from the side, stopping him. Yujin speaks to the head of the department, how HR must have informed him. Remembering, the man greets them mentioning that Myungwoo is supposed to have some skill with sharpening knives. The blacksmith leads them to an old, dusty room containing a lot of junk and a manual grinder instead of the automatic ones outside. He reveals this is where Myungwoo shall work. Although tempted to complain about the unfair treatment, Yujin observes the gazes of the workers fixed upon him, murmuring about his F rank. Some even accuse him of nepotism due to his association with the guildmaster as his brother. With a calm smile, Myungwoo comments that such treatment is normal, considering it a blessing to be granted permission to work here. Watching him sharpen a knife, Yujin sees the bar on his status increasing. As he looks at Myungwoo's determined expression, he is taken aback since it is different from the timid Myungwoo he knew. Previously, Myungwoo always appeared fearful, but now he exudes a remarkable sense of calm. Yujin bids him farewell, stating that he will visit him later, and leaves Myungwoo to his work. However, the following day, Myungwoo finds himself confined to his bed due to severe muscle pain. Within the factory, the other blacksmiths insult Myungwoo, surprised that someone could fall ill after merely a day and accuse him of securing his position solely through nepotism. The next moment, they enter his room and are stunned to discover that Myungwoo had expertly sharpened thousands of knives in a single day. After a week, every worker in the factory is astonished to see Myungwoo sharpening thousands of knives with a determined look on his face. He has already sharpened 5,600 out of 10,000 by now. Back at home, Yujin and Yerim are also greatly surprised to see that the food Myungwoo cooked is glowing brightly. With just a single bite, Yerim eyes well up with tears. Yerim mentions how she feels bored since they only allow her to enter B-class dungeons due to her being a minor. However, she easily clears them and needs to level up faster to acquire new skills and become wealthy. Yujin advises her not to rush into clearing multiple dungeons in a day even with her skills. He explains how it's obvious when one's health is low, but it's difficult to determine exactly how much mana remains. She could end up fainting inside a dungeon if she runs out of mana. In response to his question, she reveals that her mana is 102, which is in stark contrast to Yujin's mere 2 mana, increased by 29 due to his equipment. While Yujin laments his fate in the corner, Yerim suggests to Myungwoo that he can earn a lot of money as a cook. Though Myungwoo enjoys what he does, Yujin gives him his A-class gloves, believing they will assist him in his knife-sharpening work. Overwhelmed with gratitude, tears stream down Myungwoo's face as he embraces Yujin. Gradually, the other workers start recognizing his efforts. They even present him with a towel made of magic stone, designed to stay cool even in the blazing heat of the factory environment. Just as he is about to head home, Myungwoo stumbles upon the same magic crystal he saw on the first day. Once again, the department head approaches him, scolding him for not touching it. He explains that it's an S-class magic stone that could fetch a million dollars. He adds that even the equipment team at their prestigious guild doesn't have someone capable of refining this stone properly. The department head praises the quality of the equipment Myungwoo sharpened for the staff the previous day, noting how it appeared almost brand new. Encouraged by the praise, Myungwoo promises to continue working hard. However, a few days later, two agents enter the factory to question Myungwoo, revealing that Yujin has gone missing. Just then, Yim arrives at the door. She had been informed of Yujin's disappearance and came running. Yuhyun has been notified too. They leave Myungwoo behind, assuring him that he will be safe if he stays there. A few hours ago, we see Yujin relaxing on the couch while peace wreaks havoc in the room. Running around here and there, feeling restless at home, the two decide to go downstairs and train. 
Opening the door, they see an unknown bodyguard, probably appointed by one of the guilds. In the elevator, Yujin glances at his status, noticing that he is a B rank. In the elevator, Peace presses the button for the second basement floor where the training room is located. Observing this, Yujin starts praising Peace, but it seems the bodyguard isn't particularly concerned. Spending the ride in silence, the elevator opens on another floor and some staffers with luggage get on. Glancing at their statuses, he asks them, and they reply that they are from Bricks, a guild under World's Edge. Currently, they are borrowing the training room to test a lot of armor and other items that came from a low-grade dungeon. Arriving at the basement, Yujin thinks they were acting suspicious since they didn't find Peace Cued even once. As he places Peace on the floor, two staffers approach him from behind and sprinkle red powder over him. Messages appear, notifying him of detecting an item called the Watchman Fruit. Fortunately, his poison resistance skills save him, but Peace falls unconscious. The kidnappers throw a napkin over his mouth, curious as to why Yujin didn't fall unconscious. Yujin kicks one of them and runs outside, but the bodyguard from earlier spots him and punches him in the stomach. As the kidnappers strip him of his items, Yujin wonders if the MKC betrayed them. By ripping off his black fairy's earring, his mana decreases by 29, and he falls unconscious due to low mana levels. His last thoughts are that he should have been cautious when they didn't compliment peace. He wakes up with water splashing on his face, finding a scarred face man in front of him. Using his skill, he sees that the B-Rank's name is Kim Wui, a name that doesn't ring any bells. Kim Wui grabs Yujin's hair and orders him to hand over Peace's master token. Yujin thinks that the fact they want the master's token means they haven't killed Peace. They must have brought Peace here as well. Yujin perks up, mentioning that the five major guilds will be looking for him. The man reveals that the bodyguard is still guarding the room and sending daily updates, meaning that his disappearance hasn't been discovered yet. Then he mentions that the container they are in is one of many on the boat. Once they realize he is missing, they will already be in Japan. He mentions that they will receive a sponsorship and half of what Yujin sells for at the auction in Japan. Hearing this, Yujin considers whether he can be saved in time or not. Because once this boat crosses international waters, even the coast guards may not be able to save him. He decides that he needs to buy time. Yujin starts laughing, mentioning that he won't simply hand over the token, and they can't harm him since he is a valuable product. The man calmly places his cigarette down as Yujin keeps insulting him. The next moment, he slams his knee into Yujin's chest. Even as he lies on the floor, spitting blood, Yujin continues insulting him. Then he slams his boot onto Yujin's foot, eliciting a sharp cry of pain from him. All the while, Yujin thinks that if the kidnapper puts him in critical condition by beating him, he will need to be taken to a hospital, buying some more time. Picking up Yujin, he throws him against the metal bars, announcing that they also have a monster they are raising. Yujin sees black tentacles moving across his shoulders. It's the C-rank monster Creek. The kidnapper mentions that it curses its prey with the poison on its tentacles. Closing the container door, the man questions how long it will take for Yujin to break under the immense pain. Back at World's Edge, Yerim grabs Yuhyun's collar, mentioning how the security should have been flawless. Yuhyun says that the bodyguard present on duty wasn't the one originally appointed for the task. It seems that someone inside the MKC guild made the swap. Unlike World's Edge, the MKC guild is sponsored by non-hunters, and their internal powers are split up. This was an act by one of the sponsors. This also means that Choi Seokwin has lost control of the guild. He then asks her to use her white cadaver skill to help find Yujin. Hearing that, Yerim mentions that she was wondering where the smell of blood was coming from. Entering the room filled with blood and corpses, Yuhyun asks her to keep this a secret from Yujin. Back in the container, the man is surprised, wondering why the bodyguard isn't sending his regular updates anymore. Thinking that the bodyguard must have been captured, he goes to see if Yujin has been broken yet or not. Inside, he is surprised to see Yujin lying face down on the floor. As he uses his boot to nudge him awake, Yujin mutters under his breath two words, now, in Kai. Above the kidnapper, we see the tentacle-like monster attack the man the next second. Dodging the tentacles, the kidnapper leaps across the container, surprised by what's happening. With a smile on his face, Yujin orders Inkai to bite him. While one tentacle is wrapped around his wrist, the man shouts how he heard that Yujin can only tame baby monsters. It's because Yujin never revealed that he can tame adult monsters as well. 30 minutes ago, we see Yujin retreating as the creek monster approaches him, taking out a knife from his inventory. He tries to cut off his ties but notices the monster staying away from him, as if scared. Wondering why it is scared if it's an F rank, a message appears mentioning that the title's Dragon Slayer, 
and Robster's natural enemy have been activated. As a result, all his skill effects are increased twofold while facing Creek. Since it is a title he obtained after slaying a cursed poison dragon, it makes sense that it would work against another cursed poison dragon species, Yujin thinks to himself, realizing that his title Perfect Nurturer is also strengthened twofold. Due to Robster's natural enemy, he takes out a finely ground C rank stone from his inventory, offering it to Creek. Getting back to the present, he thanks the man for gifting him a valuable monster. As the tentacles leave poisonous marks on his arm, Yujin stabs Kim Wui in the back. Seeing this, Wui punches Yujin away. But Yujin keeps smiling, mentioning that even a knife works on a weakened B rank due to poison. Again, as Yujin orders Creek to attack him, Wui equips a one handed weapon. The next second, he slices the monster's head off. Wui starts laughing, mentioning how a mere C-rank monster can't defeat a B-rank hunter. The next instant, he falls to the ground, confused as to why he is still weakened even after killing the monster. But Yujin calmly stands up with a cold look in his eyes, the skill final gratitude having transferred all of Blackie's skills and stats twofold to him. Under the effect of Rochester's natural enemy, the effect of final gratitude is again increased twofold. With sharp tentacles surrounding Wuya, Yujin asks where he is keeping peace. Seeing the man insult him, Yujin calmly remarks that it seems he won't spill the information. Grabbing Wuyi's head, he activates his skill Sticky Poison, a black substance dripping across his head. Walking out of the room, Yujin mentions that he would like to leave his corpse intact, but he can't have anyone discovering his true skills. This is because Yerim possesses the white cadaver skill. Behind him, the dead body is being dissolved by the poison. On the boat, as he pulls off a door handle, Yujin thinks about how his powerful state will last for seven days. When he returns, he must conceal this from everyone. Taking a look at Blackie's skills, he observes the D-rank skill Wall Clinging Lizard, which allows him to hide his appearance like a stealth skill. There is also the C-rank skill Weakling's Hunch, enabling him to sense those stronger than him. Activating the stealth skill, he walks forward, his invisible tentacles strangling the throats of the remaining kidnappers. Throwing open the leader's door, he calmly asks him about the location of the horned lion. Threatened by the sight of the poison dissolving even his weapons, the man reveals the location of Peace's cage. The man gives him a contract, ensuring his safety if he hands over the key to Peace's cage. Examining the contract, Yujin signs it. As he is leaving with the key, the man's arm transforms into a red, claw-like monstrosity, and he grabs Yujin by the throat. He laughs, mentioning that the contract carries a powerful blindness curse. If Yujin attacks him, he will suffer the curse. Calmly, Yujin tears off the contract. The vision loss curse is nullified by his L-rank curse resistance skill. With a smile, Yujin apologizes for dashing his hopes, mentioning that he is not a novice but actually has the most experience here. Stepping forward from the dissolved body, Yujin mutters how he had no intention of sparing him from the beginning. He thinks aloud how no one would suspect him for the dissolved bodies. Then he approaches Blackie's body and dissolves it as well, saving it from being broken down as monster materials. Grabbing its monster stone, Yujin thanks Blackie one last time. Standing outside Peace's cage, Yujin shouts that Daddy is here. Gripping the tired Peace, he wishes to leave soon, but that would raise suspicion. Sitting with Peace inside the now closed cage, he softly speaks that everything will be alright. They will be rescued soon while Peace is still sleeping. Looking at Peace's sleeping face, he murmurs that he is glad Peace is safe and asks it not to die before him. Soon, some officers rush to the cage, and upon seeing the two sleeping, they inform their guildmaster that Han Yujin has been found. Yujin is awakened by the activation of his skill weakling hunch, informing him that an S-rank awakener is approaching him. Soon, Yuhan pushes open the cage and asks if Yujin is alright. Then he notices Yerim and Sionhan standing outside the cage as well. Yujin reflects on how he seems to have become an important person. Just then, he feels pain in his foot and stumbles into Yu Hyun, who steadies him. Angered by this, they all inquire about the person responsible for hurting him. Before Yujin can respond that he can walk on his own, Yu Hyun interrupts and carries Yujin in a princess carry, surprising everyone else. Throughout this, Yujin takes pride in Yu Hyun taking care of his big brother but finds it embarrassing. Sitting in the car, Yerim bids him farewell, mentioning that she will join him after she finishes investigating the scene. As the car starts moving, Yujin wonders if she will use the white cadaver skill, and how such a task seems too harsh for a child. Yuhan suggests going to the hospital, stating the need to get Yujin checked up. Yujin realizes that he can't let that happen, otherwise they would discover his inflated stats due to final gratitude. 
With a tear in his eye, he requests to be allowed not to go to the hospital, mentioning that he doesn't want to meet strangers right now. Seeing his brother's vulnerable state, Yu Hyun quickly apologizes and says they will go straight home. Examining Yu Jin closely, Yu Hyun mentions that there is something strange. He senses a fishy reptilian smell coming from Yu Jin, startling him with how keen Yu Hyun's senses are. Making excuses that it might be from the nearby ocean, Yujin activates the stealth skill lizard on the wall as Yuhan mentions that he no longer smells it. After the incident, MKC was temporarily removed from providing security. Security checks were also tightened, with the guildmasters personally providing information on the new security guards. Later, Yujin wakes up sweating at night, having seen the scenes of his kidnapping earlier in the day. He quickly realizes that it's due to the skill that gave him Blackie's memories before it died. He had forgotten about this effect of final gratitude for a long time. Noticing Myungwoo's empty room, he wonders where he has gone off to again. In the factory, we see Myungwoo sharpening knives all alone. He speaks to himself that 9,980 knives are done. Slamming his fist on the table, he calls himself a pathetic bastard, questioning the point of doing all this when his friend was kidnapped. But there was nothing he could do. He remembers how earlier, while searching for Yujin, the guild staff informed him that they had investigated his and Yujin's history. It turns out they were not old friends. As a result, the guild didn't include him in the investigation. Crying to himself alone, he mutters about how he has always been nothing. Yu Hian attends his brother's call, only to hear him shout that Myungwoo has gone missing again. Yujin mentions that Myungwoo definitely ran away from home. He further adds that Myungwoo made beef bone soup before leaving, indicating that he doesn't intend to return for a while. Yujin fears that Myungwoo might be kidnapped while wandering outside. Back to Myungwoo, we see him taking a stroll outside, lamenting how he wasn't able to help when Yujin was kidnapped. He thinks about how he wasn't even Yujin's friend, but he doesn't have anywhere else to go either. Wherever he goes, everyone looks down on him because he is an F rank. He wonders if Yujin and the others will also abandon him when he fails to awaken a useful skill even after sharpening 10,000 knives. Watching him break down in tears in the middle of the road, the kids who had just called him worthless take him along, mentioning that they will help him learn skills. However, Myungwoo's hopes are dashed when he realizes their method of helping him gain skills is to continuously dunk his head in water. When that fails, they have him jump straight down from the second floor. He barely manages to stop the kids before they rush into the fast traffic of an eight-lane road. Upon questioning, the kids mention that they have been doing dangerous stuff like this every day, believing that they should do at least this little if they want to be hunters. When he asks about their education, they say that everyone around them always says that being a combat hunter is the best paying job. Hearing this, Myungwoo realizes that while the focus has shifted from studies to becoming a hunter, the societal pressure on young kids remains the same. Just then, they hear a blast from behind. Turning around, they hear sirens announcing a dungeon break and urging all civilians to head towards the nearest evacuation center. Upon hearing this, the brother and sister start running toward the dungeon gate, mentioning that perhaps they will be able to awaken as hunters too. Myungwoo chases after the kids, shouting at them to stop. A helicopter flies above the location of the dungeon break, reporting the presence of massive spider monsters weaving their webs around the roads and buildings. The abandoned shopping mall, where the unnoticed dungeon gate was located, hadn't been cleared, resulting in the dungeon break. The camera operator is surprised at the fact that some people haven't evacuated yet. On the ground, the two kids and Myungwoo run frantically, trying to escape from the spiders. Suddenly, a massive spider cuts off their path, approaching them from the side. While Myungwoo and the boy stand still in shock, the girl steps forward, vigorously swinging her arms, stating that she will defeat the spider with the S-rank fist skill she has trained over the years. The spider leaps forward and strikes the girl with its leg, sending her flying over the heads of the other two. Just as the spider is about to attack her, Myungwoo lifts her up and starts running with the boy along some stairs. The boy asks if Myungwoo will be able to carry his sister all the way to the top. Although tired, Myungwoo replies, panting and slowing down, that he will do it. Understanding their situation, the girl tearfully asks the two to leave her behind. She mentions that she has just awakened but is an F rank, losing all hope upon realizing her low rank. Suddenly, the boy screams and points behind them, revealing that the spider is climbing the stairs, approaching them. Once again, the girl asks to be left behind, claiming it's all her fault. She shouts that as an F rank, her life is not worth saving, urging Myungwoo to abandon her and go. Wide-eyed, Myungwoo places the girl down and retrieves a knife from his bag. 
With trembling hands and tears in his eyes, he moves toward the spider, stating that he will hold it off while the kids run to the roof. He emphasizes that a young girl like her shouldn't be saying that her life is worthless. Recalling what Yujin said to him when they first met, he mentions that every life holds value. Therefore, they should run up, call for rescue, and then come back to save him. Hearing the running kids say that he shouldn't die, Myungwu thinks, with tears in his eyes, how that could be possible. Charging at the spider, he understands that he is going to die. The spider strikes him with a leg, sending him flying out of the building's window. As he falls down to his death, he recognizes that he truly is a nobody and thanks Yujin in his heart for believing in him. In his final moments, he sees Yujin running down the building, shouting at him to grab on. Grasping Yujin's hand, Myungwu wonders why Yujin is always the one saving him. Myungwu thinks that he doesn't remember much of what happened after that. Yujin carries Myungwu, with the spider chasing behind them. Myungwu's gaze shifts towards Yujin's back, noticing the weird tentacles that emerge from it. Curious, he inquires about these peculiar tentacles when Yujin calmly mentions that he is probably hallucinating, urging him to ignore them. Myungwu continues to ask further questions, but Yujin swiftly strikes his hand against Myungwu's neck, knocking him unconscious. In the next scene, Myungwu suddenly opens his eyes, gasping for air, beads of sweat streaming down his face. He finds himself sprawled on the dormitory couch, where the television broadcasts news of the safe rescue of the children. Yujin enters the room, carrying food, and Myungwu quickly recounts the strange tentacles he saw on Yujin's back. Nonchalantly placing the food down, Yujin casually suggests, that the members of World's Edge, the rescue team, brought Myungwu home, noting that Myungwu must have had a weird dream. Then, with a hint of anger, Yujin scolds Myungwu for recklessly venturing towards the dungeon break. Expressing his deep concern, he begs Myungwu to never leave like that again. As Myungwu starts crying, he asks Yujin if he would still be his friend, even if Myungwu ended up with a seemingly useless skill after sharpening 10,000 knives. Yujin's anger resurfaces as he dismisses Myungwu's anxieties, saying that there's no need for him to worry over such matters. Furthermore, Yujin reminds Myungwu how he was recently scouted by the equipment maintenance department, despite lacking an amazing skill. Feeling embarrassed, Yujin asks if Myungwu would still visit occasionally to cook his exquisite food, even if he were to acquire an amazing skill. He even offers to pay Myungwu for his culinary services. Hearing this, Myungwu bursts into laughter, assuring Yujin that he would cook anything he desires. In that moment, Myungwu recalls how he awakened his E-class skill, Whetstone, in a tiny, dimly lit apartment. Despite receiving the $1,000 hunter registration subsidy, he was informed that finding a job as a hunter would be challenging due to his seemingly useless skill. Leaving the Hunter Association office, he noticed a gathering outside surrounding Park Yerim, believing that a high-class hunter had awakened. Making his way towards the back entrance, he thought about his purposeless existence, feeling utterly alone. Even after awakening his skill, his life hadn't improved. That's when he encountered Yujin. At that time, he pondered if he even deserved everything Yujin was offering him. Unlike Yujin, Yerim, or the Guildmaster, he didn't possess their exceptional abilities. Even after sharpening 10,000 knives, there was no guarantee of acquiring a remarkable skill. However, it was when he overheard the girl suggesting that he should abandon her because she had an F-class skill that Myungwu finally realized something. He understood that Yujin never regarded him as inferior. Yujin never pressured him to excel in combat. Instead, he encouraged Myungwu to pursue what he enjoyed doing. Wiping away his tears while sharpening knives, Myungwu resolves in his heart to become strong, not in the same way as Yujin or Yerim, but to become the best at what he excels in. As he finishes sharpening the last knife, a notification materializes before him, informing him of his awakening of the SS-class skill, Master of the Golden Forge. The following day at the factory, a worker exclaims that the S-class magic stone is missing. In response, the other blacksmiths smile, mentioning that the item has finally found its rightful owner. Yerim, accompanied by a drone recording the scene, flies through the air. She proceeds with the initial test of Myungwu's Parmeni's Ice Tree Spear. With the spear in hand, she launches an attack on a lake below. Within moments, the lake freezes solid. To her astonishment, the icy assault continues, extending all the way up to the mountain in the distance. Later, in front of a massive gathering, the video is presented, announcing the birth of the 16th S-Class weapon. Taking the stage, Myungwu addresses the reporters, confidently declaring that there is no limit to the class of weapons he can produce. However, he explains that to manufacture SS-Class and higher weapons, 
he will need to accumulate more experience. The crowd reacts with surprise, whispering about how the entire world will clamor for an SS-class weapon. Seated beside Yujin, Xiaohen remarks that they will need to assign guards to protect Myungwu. Yujin dismisses the need for such measures, revealing that after crafting the S-class weapon, Myungwu's stats have risen to C rank. Earlier, in Yujin's dorm, Myungwu had left Yujin stunned as he crafted the spear soon after awakening his SS-class skill. Furthermore, he revealed the existence of a subspace containing numerous S and SS-class materials, from which he took the ice branch for spear's handle. He also obtained a production encyclopedia that aided him in manufacturing. Throughout Myungwu's revelation, Yujin's mouth hangs open, lamenting how his own legendary class skill is described in just a single line. While Myungwu received multiple additional effects, Myungwu raises his hand, and a golden door materializes in midair, offering to reveal to Yujin the golden smithy. They appear in a vast hall formed by towering trees, astonishingly resistant to burning despite surrounding the smithy. The fire itself is fueled by a fire spirit. The spirit, named Hiswar, warmly welcomes Myungwu, acknowledging him as the master. Hiswar explains that it came into being through the creator's final breath. Myungwu mentions how everything had already been prepared for him by the previous master, who left behind a bouquet and a card, welcoming him as the future successor. Yujin, aware of the traces of ancient civilizations often discovered in dungeons, wonders if the previous master existed in another world in the past and left all of this for the next possessor of the skill in the next era. Just as Yujin is lost in thought, Myungwu interrupts, presenting the bouquet to him and expressing gratitude for Yujin's important role in his journey. Internally, Yujin feels a sense of joy, realizing that he has gained another ally in Myungwu, similar to Yerim and Xiongen. However, in the next moment, he wears a gloomy expression, saying that Myungwu no longer needs to listen to him. Witnessing Myungwu's surprise, Yujin averts his gaze, rubbing his head, and reluctantly admits that there is something he must tell him. Yujin admits that he was mistaken about their past connection and that they never knew each other. Myungwu, somewhat frustrated, interrupts to say that he already knew that. Nevertheless, Yujin continues, expressing how weird it would be to get entangled in a complicated situation due to being deceived by a stranger. Yujin reassures Myungwu that he doesn't need to worry about him anymore and can pursue his own desires freely. Inwardly, Yujin himself is surprised by these thoughts. Initially, he brought Myungwu in with the intention of leeching off him in the future. However, along the way, he found joy in witnessing Myungwu's growth and improvement. Hence, to not hinder Myungwu's potential, it is best for him not to forcefully keep him by his side. Yujin confirms this, and Myungwu smiles, handing him the bouquet, stating that he will continue doing whatever he wants. So Yujin doesn't need to worry about him. Returning to the present ceremony, Myungwu presents the Farmini Ice Tree Spear to Yerim. It is mentioned that since Myungwu received help from the World's Edge Guild, he has decided to present his first S-Class weapon to a member of World's Edge. In the audience, Yujin inwardly sighs, thinking about how he let go of a bag of money that was within his reach. He thinks how it will at least divert attention from himself to Myungwu. He talks to Kim Seonghan, seated next to him, about how Myungwu won't be staying with him anymore. After all, he is the only equipment production hunter in the world, and various guilds will try to recruit him. In such a scenario, why should he bother staying with someone he only knew for a short while? Listening to Yujin's self-deprecating words, Seonghan is surprised. Meanwhile, on the stage, Myungwu and Yerim express gratitude to Yujin, thinking that since they made such a public declaration, no one should even think of harming Yujin ever again. It seems that they consider Yujin as family, someone more important than anyone else. A few days later, Yujin stands on the top floor of his building. Lately, he hasn't had a reason to leave. Myungwu spends most of his time in the forge, although he still prepares delicious snacks for Yujin. Holding peace, who appears lazy, Yujin decides that they should go out today. Soyoung, his bodyguard for the day, requests to accompany them to the training room. She is in a class hunter recruited by the Jupiter Guild from England. Sung Hyoni personally recruited her due to her remarkable talent, even at the age of 19. Yujin then remembers a scandal between her and his younger brother in the future. In other words, she is Yujin's future sister-in-law. In the elevator, Soyoung reveals her SS class skill, Dragon Rider. However, she complains that obtaining a high-class dragon mount for an A-class hunter is nearly impossible since dragons are the most challenging creatures to tame. She expresses her frustration with having the skill but not being able to use it. Soyoung mentions how, with Yujin's help and the dragon eggs incubated by the Jupiter Guild, taken from the dungeons, she will finally have her own dragon. 
She further states that she needs to protect Yujin since he is the man who will take care of her baby. Upon hearing this, Yujin stumbles, asking why she phrased it that way. Soyoung explains that everyone is saying it like that now, ever since Moon Hyuna said the same words on a TV program. Observing Peace lying lethargically on the floor, Soyoung suggests she knows a lovely place for them to take a walk, a rooftop garden in their guild. Back at the Jupiter Guild, Sung Hyoni agrees, referring to Yujin as a valued guest and mentioning he can visit anytime he desires. As Yujin sets foot in the breathtaking garden, he is taken aback by its beauty. Gently placing peace on the ground, he lets the creature know he can now roam freely in this area. Unexpectedly, Soyoung squats beside him, planting a kiss on his cheek to show peace that she means no harm. While she engages with peace, Yujin cries softly in the background, believing that his sister-in-law shouldn't behave so intimately, wondering if her carefree nature is due to her being a foreigner. Just then, peace starts chasing a butterfly, damaging the plants. Soyeon coos at the magnificent sight, while Yujin apologizes for the mess created by his pet. Soyeon reassures him, expressing her hope that one day her dragon and peace can play together. She reveals that her dragon is a class 3 dark spiked wing drivagon, a creature known for its formidable defense, covered in thick scales and tall spikes. Yujin is familiar with this species and acknowledges its impressive traits. It's a breed with excellent defense even among dragons, covered in dark scales and big spikes. However, he finds Soyoung's description of it as cute rather strange, especially considering its poison lace tail. Just as Yujin begins to enjoy himself, his skill instincts of the weak is triggered. The next moment, Sung Hyoni emerges from behind a pillar. Yujin reflects on how Sung Hyoni was once regarded as the world's strongest hunter until his whereabouts became unknown in the future. Now, Yujin finds himself sharing tea with this enigmatic figure, as Soyeon has decided to leave them alone. Sung Hyoni presents a dragon's wing bone to peace, noting that most carnivorous high-class monsters seem to enjoy it. Observing Peace's surprise and subsequent delight, Sung Hyoni expresses his joy at seeing Yujin healthy after the kidnapping incident, saying that Yujin will raise his baby. Hearing those words again, Yujin thinks how he will make Hyuna pay for her actions. Hyoni highlights Yujin's exceptional abilities as the beast tamer, mentioning that he is the patron of S-Class Hunter Park Yerum and now protected by the world's sole blacksmith. Concluding that Yujin is currently an unparalleled existence, Hyoni states that the other guilds are dying to get a chance to even speak with him. He says that there is no need for Yujin to be modest anymore, as even if he acts selfishly, everyone will fall in line. Perceiving Hyoni's somewhat rotten personality, Yujin stands up, remarking how, as a weak F-class hunter, he is concerned about his safety and cannot afford to act that way. Hyoni swiftly assures Yujin that the problem can be easily solved, revealing their plan to provide a second top-class monster for his protection. Yujin realizes that Yu Haiyan has yet to inform him of such matters. Reflecting on the fact that Yu Haiyan rarely shares important information with him, Yujin ponders how he could have been left clueless and locked up if he had returned late and only possessed his taming skill. Hyoni mentions his inability to comprehend Yu Haiyan's actions and suggests having a proper conversation with him. Yujin thinks about how it seems that Hyoni looks down on him, likely assuming that beast taming is his sole skill. Meanwhile, back at World's Edge, Yerim approaches Yu Haiyan with a concern weighing on her mind. She mentions that during the kidnapping incident, when she used her ability White Cadaver to read the memories of the kidnappers, she discovered a memory of them using sleep powder to render Yujin unconscious. But failing, Yerim emphasizes that Yujin shouldn't possess any antitoxin items like that, implying that he may be hiding something. On the way back, the Jupiter Guild mentions that they will assign a bodyguard stronger than in a class hunter. It turns out Sung Hyoni himself has decided to personally drive Yujin home. Meanwhile, Yujin ponders inwardly if Hyoni doesn't have any work to do. He wonders if it's really acceptable for an S-Class hunter to do as they please like this. Yujin starts to mention how this won't lead to a more favorable negotiation for Hyoni. In the next moment, he sees Hyoni's hand swiftly approaching him. With a smile, Hyoni clicks Yujin's seatbelt in place, mentioning that he needs to wear it since his stats are F rank. Terrified, Yujin agrees, and Hyoni explains that this gesture is to compensate for not providing much help during the kidnapping incident. As Yujin becomes calm again, he mentions how it was all the MKC guild's fault anyway. Sung Hyoni agrees but notes that at least because of that, Yujin ended up paying him a visit. Hyoni comments on how rotten the MKC guild is and that they've decided to sever ties with them. Hearing that, Yujin thinks about how the MKC guild may collapse earlier this time, considering that it was the first major guild to collapse in the future. He realizes that he doesn't know much about Sung Hyoni, 
even though he came back from the future. He wonders if he should use the sprout skill on him. Suddenly, he senses Hyoni's hand on his throat, while the guildmaster is still focused on the road. As P starts growling, Yujin realizes that he sensed him even before he activated the skill. Hyoni takes his hand off and mentions how neither of them did anything, confirming that Yujin understands. Upon reaching the World's Edge Guild, Yujin quickly exits the car, running behind Xianghen and Simeon. Simeon questions why an S-Class hunter is visiting them, mentioning that everyone knows hunter guilds are similar to militia guilds. He goes on to mention that Hyoni should be aware of what happened in the past when S-Class hunters visited another S-Rank hunter's guild. Wondering why Hyoni would personally drive him, Yujin realizes that Hyoni likely did it to provoke World's Edge. Still smiling calmly, Hyoni takes out a flower and places it inside Simeon's coat pocket, much to the team leader's annoyance. Hyoni says that there's no need to be hostile and promises to guarantee Yujin's safety. He then presents Yujin with an item that enhances magic power and possesses a B-class barrier skill. Holding the item, Yujin thinks of its significant value, estimating it to be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Hyoni mentions how he noticed that Yujin hasn't been wearing his earring since the kidnapping incident, thinking that he probably lost it. Hearing that, Yujin is stunned at how he noticed that. As Hyoni holds his car's door, he expresses his desire for Yujin and him to be close from now on. Back in his room, Yujin wears the new earring, checking it out in a mirror. Peace, perched nearby, playfully jumps at him, triggering the activation of a protective barrier, confirming the effectiveness of the earring. While gently washing the forlorn-looking piece, Yujin reflects on the fruitful journey, grateful that the piece was able to replenish his energy and he even acquired mana equipment. Internally, he vows to never visit the Jupiter Guild again. Internally, he is concerned about the difficult task of influencing 50 such dangerous S-rank individuals, like the Jupiter Guildmaster. Just then, Dokibai pays Yujin a visit, bringing along a collection of peace-themed dolls and other items, the most popular internet trend since their appearance on live television. Yujin takes a moment to read the data accumulated by Dokibai, expressing surprise at the absence of information regarding the interior of the dungeons. To his astonishment, Dokibai reveals that it's because he cannot enter dungeons. Yujin deduces that it's likely due to Dokibai possessing the powers of a dungeon, effectively being treated as one. Grabbing hold of Dokibai, Yujin asks him to teleport together. Reluctantly, Dokibai agrees, and in the next instant, they materialize high above towering skyscrapers, the city lights shining below. Yujin feels a striking similarity to entering a dungeon as Dokibai continues teleporting. Gradually, Yujin's status window begins to change, similar to his previous ventures into dungeons. By harnessing Yun Yun's power, Yujin thinks about the possibility of communicating with the system. However, Dokibai murmurs something about being unable to hold back any longer. Suddenly, he grabs Yujin by the belt and slams him onto the road, revealing that Yun Yun truly cannot resist pranking others. Assuring a concerned Dokibai that he's unharmed, Yujin opens his status window. His eyes widen as he notices certain letters in his skills description have been bolded. It appears that the system cannot directly communicate with him outside of a dungeon. Recalling the mysterious escape he received during his last dungeon experience, Yujin mentions how it can only locate him whenever he enters a dungeon. Expressing gratitude to Dokibai for the assistance, Yujin realizes that he has no choice but to venture back into a dungeon. Hearing Yujin's words of praise, Yun Yun stares with an emotional expression, pondering why Yujin reminds him of his former landlady, unintentionally becoming influenced by Yujin. The following day, Yujin disguises himself, planning to enter an F-class dungeon. He realizes that now is his only opportunity to go on such a trip, armed with Inkai's skills. Silently, Yujin maneuvers through the hallway, utilizing his stealth skill. The effects of Wall Clinging Lizard are amplified two times due to the combination of Final Gratitude and Rochester's natural enemy. He realizes that even a rank hunter's would be oblivious to his presence. Seizing the opportunity when another staff member opens the elevator, he quickly slips inside with them. Yujin thinks about the rarity of the stealth skill, typically only possessed by monsters, save for the Dokibai. No one would suspect a person entering and exiting while concealed in stealth. Advancing swiftly through the metal door as another staff member passes through, he arrives at the gate of the F-Class dungeon. Yujin ponders how the journey to this point was more challenging than the dungeon itself. It's fortunate that F-Class dungeons aren't closely monitored. Before entering, he double-checks his potions, gears, and the gate stone he brought along. Stepping through the gate, he finds himself in the heart of a dense jungle, dispatching the monkey-like creatures that attack him effortlessly. He wonders how long it will take for the system to locate him. 
As he slays the monkeys, he calls out to the system, demanding a response. A screen materializes, indicating that Yujin has finally arrived. Another message appears, this time presenting the description of the wishing stone he previously encountered. However, in the next instant, the line stating that the wishing stone cannot bring back the dead vanishes, replaced by a new message apologizing for the lie. Yujin starts shouting and cursing, demanding a proper explanation from the system. Suddenly, multiple screens pop up, expressing the system's awareness of his frustration and its desire to disclose everything, explaining that significant sacrifices will have to be made for a direct conversation. They inform him that unless they wish to be detected, extensive preparations will be necessary, requiring one week. Eugen thinks about the fact that after one week, the effects of final gratitude will expire, meaning he will need an alternative approach. Considering the system's mention of being exposed due to interference, he wonders if there is something beyond the system itself. He speculates on whether this is connected to the high-class boss monsters that repeatedly emerge in lower-ranked dungeons. It appears that the more the system interferes, the greater the danger becomes. Suddenly, the screens before him begin to crack, leading him to understand that something even more dangerous is arriving this time. Considering the amount of messages sent, a beam of light lands on the jungle floor from the sky, exerting pressure that pushes Yujin back. As the dust settles, he observes a small, white, machai-like creature on the ground. Suddenly, it opens its eyes and begins flapping its tiny wings, appearing incredibly adorable. However, Yujin reminds himself not to let his guard down, recognizing that looks can be deceiving, and the creature might be a ferocious monster. He activates the promising sprout skill, but the information displayed is jumbled and illegible, indicating that this is no ordinary monster. Even the system struggles to show its status accurately. Contemplating whether he should eliminate it, Yujin witnesses the cute creature open its mouth to consume a magic stone tainted with poison. Without thinking, he swiftly grabs it before it reaches the creature's mouth. As he marvels at the creature's fluffy and endearing appearance, it starts crying, prompting Yujin to comfort it and promising to feed it magic stones later. Noticing the monkeys lurking in the surrounding trees, he calmly assures the chick that he will swiftly gather some food for it, so it no longer needs to cry. After defeating the dungeon monsters, he notes that the chick devoured all the magic crystals that dropped. Just then, the system announces that he has achieved something remarkable. Despite having F-class stats and attacks, Yujin has successfully cleared an F-rank dungeon, earning him the S-rank title of Miracle Rookie that will double all his dungeon rewards. He watches wide-eyed in astonishment as he receives an S-class title from a low-rank dungeon. However, he still feels dissatisfied since clearing low-class dungeons doesn't yield significant rewards in the first place. Returning safely to the dormitory, peace starts wreaking havoc in the room trying to bite the adorable chick in its jaws. Eugen realizes he should have considered the consequences of bringing a cat and bird-like creature together. Just then, Yu Hyun arrives unexpectedly, surprising Eugen and inquiring about his presence outside his room. Trying to deceive him, Eugen claims he found the little monster in the hallway. Yu Hyun grows anxious, realizing that a monster was able to freely roam the building. With Yu Hyun's assistance, Eugen manages to control peace, explaining that the baby bird is its new sibling. Yuhyun grabs the mischievous piece, throws him across the room instead, suggesting that Yujin can now answer his questions. However, before he can say anything further, Yujin becomes angry, demanding an explanation for his treatment of peace. Observing Yujin's intense anger, Yuhan quickly backs down, mentioning that peace is an S-rank monster, so everything will be fine. However, Yujin shouts in response, asking if Yuhyun would throw anything as long as their stats were high enough, saying that it's not a valid excuse. Continuing to scold his brother, Yujin mentions how Kang Soyoung spoke about treating her dragon mount like her baby, and even the Jupiter Guildmaster bought Peace a present. Pointing at Yuhyun, Yujin mentions that despite being the owner, Yuhyun treats Peace as a mere piece of equipment, lacking interest in him. Yu Hyun attempts to defend himself, stating that he is interested and acknowledges Peace's value as equipment. Yu Jin interrupts him again, saying that Peace doesn't listen to Yu Hyun because he considers him nothing more than equipment. Shouting loudly, Yu Jin asks if Yu Hyun has done anything for Peace other than paying for his food, while Yu Jin has been the one raising him all this time. Though Yu Hyun apologizes with his head down, Yu Jin knows that he doesn't truly understand. Yujin reflects on how Yu Hyun has always been like this since he was a child, showing no regard for others and casually breaking tree branches. When Yu Hyun gets up after Yujin asks for a hug, Yujin shouts he meant to hug Peace. As a result, Yu Hyun and Peace wrap themselves around one another without touching, 
presenting an awkward sight. Eugen sits back down, and Peace approaches him, looking down. Understanding that Peace feels like he is being scolded for trying to harm Peepo, Eugen assures him that he won't hurt him anymore. He then hands Peepo to Yuhun, and this time, Peace doesn't attempt to eat him. Getting up from the couch, Yujin suggests that they should visit a dungeon over the weekend, and he'll take a look at Yuhan's skills for him. Staring at his brother's back, Yuhan realizes that Yujin scolded him for such a trivial reason just to avoid answering questions about the baby monster's origins. Yuhan's curiosity grows regarding what his brother is hiding. Afterward, Yujin enters an E-rank and a D-rank dungeon. The system greets him, and he obtains another S-rank title, Veteran F-Class, for clearing the dungeon with his F-rank stats. This title doubles the effectiveness of his attack skills. Eugen grabs the message notification, filled with anger, exclaiming that he doesn't have any attack skills to begin with. In the next encounter, the system gives him a few more seemingly useless skills. He receives the S-rank title Unfindable, declaring him a master of stealth. This title comes with two skills attached to it, an A-rank stealth skill and another S-rank skill called One More Just Because. The latter allows him to share the effects of a single S-class or higher title or skill with one person he is in physical contact with. Back in his room, Eugen checks the steady growth of his social media accounts, marveling at how adorable his babies are. In the following days, he is informed that the monster taming facility will be built next to the World's Edge Guild within two weeks. Thinking of the upcoming meeting with the system, Eugen wonders if something went wrong due to his regression in time. As Mew Mu once again prepares a variety of exquisite dishes, all four of them gather around the table. Yujin and Yerim praise Myungwu's culinary skills, while Yuhan comments that the eggs Yujin cooked are sufficient for him, creating an awkward moment due to his low energy. It appears that Yuhan and Myungwu haven't become good friends yet. Myungwu mentions that it's fine, stating that they will both move to the new building in a few weeks anyway. When Yujin asks Myungwu about the equipment he would like him to make, Yuhan sits with a gloomy expression, his grip on the glass cracking it. While washing dishes with Yerim, Yujin laments how distant Yuhyun has become lately. Recalling her conversation with Yuhyun, Yerim suggests that there might be other reasons for his cold mood. She quickly changes the subject when Yujin inquires about those reasons. Even when the two of them venture into the dungeon a few days later, Yuhyun still hasn't loosened up. Observing his brother's cold demeanor, Yujin realizes that he may need to have a conversation with him. In the dungeon, they are attacked by a group of monkeys, but Peace effortlessly takes care of them. Yuhyun suggests that Yujin should level up as well but keeps interfering with Yujin's fights by killing monsters that approach him. Having reached his limit, Yujin confronts Yuhyun, urging him to speak up if something is bothering him. Yuhyun coldly retorts that Yujin never gives him a straight answer. Enraged, Yujin shouts about how Yuhyun never tells him anything and had kept him imprisoned for so long. Eugen explains that with his newfound power, most guild leaders won't be able to lay a finger on him, so Yuhan doesn't need to be overly protective. Yuhan clarifies that is not what he meant. He asks Yujin to just be comfortable where he is and to refrain from entering dungeons again. Surprised by Yuhan's statement, Yujin recalls these same words from Yuhan's future memories. Realizing something, Yujin questions whether there is a reason why Yuhan can't speak up. However, before Yuhan can respond, a system notification appears, indicating that they are now prepared. In the next moment, Yujin is teleported away, leaving Yuhan standing there, filled with worry. Standing still, Yuhan is surprised, wondering where his older brother has disappeared to. Meanwhile, Yujin finds himself being transported through a realm filled with blue and white lights. Suddenly, he comes to a halt, and several animated faces appear before him. They warmly greet him, asking if he can see them clearly. Addressing him as Honey, they ask if he has any questions. Just as Yujin is about to mention his name, they caution him that if the amount of information shared exceeds a threshold, the connection will break. When he inquires about who they are hiding from, they simply reply as the one who cannot be named. The enigmatic figures proceed to discuss Eugen's ability to turn back time. They appear within a forest of shimmering trees, urging him to think of each tree as a distinct world. Upon activating the Wishing Stone, only their world is sent back in time by five years, while the other worlds remain unaffected. This explains the rapid increase in the number and difficulty of dungeons. The system entities reveal their attempts to slow down this process, but someone is striving to expand their influence through these dungeons. Therefore, Eugen must apply the keyword to 50 S-ranked individuals to safeguard his world. The system entities mention the impending disappearance of the status windows, calling them as guides for reminders. While they are currently convenient, these windows limit people's beliefs, leading them to think that F-ranked individuals cannot progress no matter how hard they try. 
However, there are exceptions to this stereotype, such as Myungwoo. Upon hearing this, Yujin seizes the smiling face, demanding that they change the peculiar keyword. It's not feasible for him to confess his love to 50 different people. The system entities clarify that they don't choose the keywords, they merely evaluate the skills and stats and provide descriptions accordingly. In response to Yujin's complaint about Myungwoo receiving numerous additional effects from his skill, they explain that these effects originated from the previous world's information. Just like how the golden smithy was created there and sent to their world, the previous skill holders sacrificed themselves to protect the future of their successors. The system's role is to categorize the existing skills and information, lacking the authority to alter the keyword. They also mention that the title Perfect Nurturer is unique, since there was no pre-existing information about it. The system entities had to make educated guesses. They explain that to obtain the Nurturer title, an S-ranked individual at birth must acknowledge the user. Most hunters with a predicted potential rank of S evolve based on their environment, eventually becoming either a ranked or S-ranked. However, there are a few who are destined to be S-ranked from birth, such as Han Yuhian and Sun Hyoni. These individuals are exceptionally rare and surpass the limits of their species. However, their exceptional abilities make it difficult for them to connect with other humans, causing discomfort even among their parents. That's why the nurturer title holds such significance. Nurturers also have a shorter lifespan, often sacrificing their lives to protect the S-ranked individuals at birth. Hence, they wish for Yujin to safely gather 50 S-ranked individuals within five years. As the connection weakens, the surroundings begin to shift. In a panic, Yujin asks if he can inform his brother about everything. They inform him that he can only tell his brother that he is assisting them. They also mention that the dungeon creation rule remains the same, although some dungeons from five years in the future may occasionally appear, but they are swiftly eliminated. Ultimately, they assure Yujin that he will definitely unravel everything in due time. Just then, Yuhyun appears in the sky of the dungeon, falling downwards. Opening his eyes as he lands on the ground, he discovers the entire dungeon consumed by raging flames. Unable to recognize the area he finds himself in, he wonders if he has been sent to the wrong dungeon. Just as Yuhyun is caught off guard, a ferocious horned lion leaps in front of him. Initially gripped by fear, he quickly checks its status and realizes that it's actually peace. Yujin, surprised by Yuhan's sudden appearance, is picked up by his brother. It dawns on Yujin that Yuhan was responsible for burning down the entire forest. Urging Yuhan to calm down, he promises to explain everything later, but Yuhan remains angry. Shouting, Yuhan expresses his frustration, mentioning how he had believed Yujin could handle everything and he would no longer need to worry. He throws Yujin to the ground, stating that he no longer has a choice. Brandishing his flaming sword, he threatens to inform everyone of Yujin's death in a dungeon raid, suggesting that a severed limb would serve as sufficient evidence. Yujin recalls what the system told him, how the goodwill of an S-class individual can be misinterpreted as violence. Raising his voice, Yujin points out that he won't be grateful if Yuhyun resorts to such actions. In a moment of hesitation, Yuhyun grabs Yujin, but Yujin swiftly takes out the master token, and peace lunges at Yuhyun. However, within seconds, Yuhyun slams peace to the ground, knocking the creature unconscious. Raising his sword, the stabs it just above Yujin's shoulder. Yuhyun confesses how he ignored everything, believing it would be fine and questions what else Yujin has lied to him about. The beast taming skill, the blacksmith, and the recent bird acquisition. With his head lowered, Yuhian asks how he is supposed to manage all of this. He mentions taking some blood or a chunk of flesh since he can't bring himself to sever Yujin's arms. Before Yuhian can follow through with his actions, a system screen appears between them. Seizing the opportunity, Yujin slides back from his brother. He repeats that this is why he asked to let him explain everything. Yujin reveals his intention to raise peace when he first encountered him and how the skill he acquired was actually an S-class one. He discloses his secret ventures into dungeons and how he acquired Chirpy. Yujin mentions that all of this occurred because he had been assisting the system. Administering a healing potion to the fallen peace, Yujin speaks about how worried Yuhian must have been. He explains that the security at the world's edge remains as intact and that he used a stealth skill to escape. He also mentions possessing skills such as skill sharing, poison resistance, curse resistance, and fear resistance. As Yuhyun comments on how peculiar Yujin's skills are, Yujin realizes that he can't reveal the truth about final gratitude. With Peace's face now healed, Yujin suggests that if Yuhyun has any questions, he should ask him directly instead of bearing the burden alone. Following Yuhyun's apology, Yujin pulls him into a hug, thinking how he would have felt just as worried if their roles were reversed. 
As they break off the hug, Yujin is surprised to see Peace shrinking in size. Curious, he asks why Peace is getting smaller, and Yu Hyun explains that it's because Yujin can't hug him when he's big. It turns out that Peace has been intentionally keeping his size small, hugging the adorable baby. Yujin requests that Peace at least inform him when he grows bigger, observing the two brothers through a screen. The system entities engage in a discussion amongst themselves. They debate the potential of Yu Hyun and Myungwu, pondering who has more promise. One of them notes that there isn't enough time for the blacksmith, Myungwu, to fully develop. Another suggests the option of placing Myungwu in another world if this one doesn't succeed. The shorter entity proposes including Honey in the next world as well, although they acknowledge that Yujin would likely refuse and will break down emotionally if they forced him. They express conflicted feelings about their actions but recognize the need to make sacrifices for the greater good. Deciding to decorate Honey's room, one of them suggests waiting and having fun in the meantime. Yujin thinks how things have been smoother since their return and noting the growing comfort between Yujin and his brother. Peace is also growing well. Providing Haiyan with the documentation collected by Yoon Yoon, Yujin sees her dance in joy. She mentions how her uncle had already proposed establishing a research center, but she worries that if her research becomes affiliated with a guild, it will be exploited for profit. Upon hearing this, Yujin offers to provide her with a research center next to the monster breeding facility currently under construction. He assures her that anyone will be able to freely access the research data, making it easier to acquire information if hunters from all over the world visit. With wide eyes, Heian asks why he is willing to do so much. Striking a dramatic pose, he explains that such measures are necessary for the goal of worldwide peace. Heian then requests permission to bring her friends over, whom Eugen recalls as the dungeon persons the team that will uncover the laws of dungeon creation in the future. Delighted, he agrees with a big smile, finalizing their agreement. Eugen considers it another investment, noting the importance of diversifying his investments beyond just buildings. He decides to invest the rest of his money in stocks, particularly in a company that will successfully develop a hair loss medicine within a few months. At the docks, Eugen, accompanied by Yuhyun, Yerim, Hyuna, and Soyeon, awaits the arrival of the new baby monsters to be tamed. With her arm around his neck, Hyuna asks if Yujin can lend her one of the three new monsters. She suggests that since the highest ranked one will go to Yujin anyway, borrowing it from time to time would be a win-win situation. Meanwhile, Yuhyun watches them with an intense gaze. Before leaving, Soyeon also holds Yujin's hand, confirming whether he will still raise her baby or not. Yuhyun then hands him a translating item, mentioning how people from overseas will arrive once the breeding facility opens. Hearing his brother's assurance that he won't stop Yujin but will offer help when needed, Yujin looks at him with a bright expression, understanding how people can change when they work things out. Determined to create a good life for himself and his brother, Yujin approaches the first cage. The staff hand over the master tokens. Just then, a shout rings out as one of the monsters escapes its cage. Flying through the sky, the group observes that it's a griffin, a creature with the body of a lion and the head and wings of an eagle, unmatched in aerial combat. As the griffin looks at Yujin, a notification informs him that the title Perfect Nurturer enhances the effects of the master's token. Displaying favorability towards him, the griffin approaches Yujin, only to be swatted down to the ground by Yuhan. The griffin quickly recovers and rushes towards the other cages, but the S-rank hunters catch it moments later. Holding the adorable griffin wrapped in a blanket made from dungeon materials and seeing the mess caused in the process, the girls wonder if it's even possible to tame such a creature in the first place. Yuhan suggests that it's probably better to just kill it. Just then, Yujin rises from the ground and mentions that the griffin didn't intentionally harm him. It's because the griffin has only encountered high-class hunters until now. Examining its status, Yujin notes that it still doesn't know how to control its strength against low-class hunters. Instructing his brother to stay put, Yujin addresses the griffin, motioning for it to fly towards him. With a joyful expression, the griffin leaps onto his arm only to quickly recoil in surprise as blood spurts from Yujin's arm like a fountain. Pouring a potion over his injuries, Yujin beckons the bird again. After numerous attempts resulting in injuries, the griffin finally lands on his arm without harming him. After cuddling with it, Yujin asks Hyuna to hold the griffin for a moment and cover his eyes. Pointing towards the other cage containing the shadow unicorns, he explains that the griffin was excited because of them. Griffins primarily feed on meat from horse-like monsters like unicorns. With a bright expression, Huna mentions that her guild can provide such meat from their dungeons. Observing the frightened shadow unicorns warming up to Yujin, Huna is impressed by how an F-rank hunter is accomplishing what no one else can. 
As she looks at his back, she decides to place her trust in him. In the next scene, a tall, muscular woman holds a man by his throat. She says that she was the one who sold the contract with the high-class curse of blindness to the Bricks Guild. But someone tore up her contract, and she intends to find out who. Unfortunately, the man cries out that he doesn't know. Believing him, she mentions that there's no need to keep him alive. She kills him, thinking about how the person who bought the contract is dead and no one from the Kidnapper Guild has any information. Picking up a photo of Eugen from the debris, she realizes that she has no choice but to go ask the person who was kidnapped. The new monsters quickly adjust to their new environment. The unicorn's names are slightly changed to white and black after Yerim expresses frustration with Eugen's poor naming sense. The griffin, now named Blue, develops a habit of causing messes on the dinner table. However, upon witnessing the pressure exerted by Peace, Blue quickly falls in line and even starts cleaning up after itself. Peace established his dominance quickly on the first day. As Eugen looks at the soundly sleeping monsters, he wipes his brow, realizing that raising children can be challenging. Exhausted, he falls onto his bed, wondering how he will collect 50 S ranks. Just then, a message appears, informing Eugen of the detection of a cursed poison dragon named Dio Valchasis. Additionally, the title Rochester's natural enemy activates, enhancing his skill effects. He quickly takes out his phone to search for nearby dungeons. Suddenly, a head emerges from a portal above him. A tall, muscular woman steps out and begins speaking in French, grabbing his phone. Eugen wonders if she is the cursed poison dragon, but she appears human. Using a translator item, she greets him. Checking her status, Eugen discovers that her name is Riet, an S-rank hunter. Just like Yu Hyun and Sung Hyoni, she was born as an S-rank. Eugen finds it weird that he never heard of this hunter in the future. Meanwhile, she brings her face inches away from his, asking what he's reading so intently. Startled, Eugen realizes that just like the Jupiter Guildmaster, she sensed him immediately. And not only that, she also bypassed the security system. Maintaining his composure, he addresses her by name and mentions that if she had business with him, she could have asked to see him during the day. With a smile, Riet rises from the bed and explains that the other guild members were in the way, and even his brother was going out, giving various warnings. Noting that he doesn't seem like a normal F-class hunter, she lightly touches his forehead. After a few minutes, she tears open his shirt and mentions that he must be hiding a resistance skill. She smiles and states that he is the one who tore the contract. She goes on to explain how she recently started a business of providing illegal contracts. Hearing this, Eugen recalls the contract he tore during his kidnapping. Still trying to bluff, he mentions that he is just a normal weak F-class hunter. Riet then grabs both of his hands from behind and tears the contract with his hands. Of course, the blindness curse is reflected due to his legendary curse resistance skill. She smiles, assuring him that she won't harm him. She explains her curse skill, mentioning that she obtained it from a vanished dungeon. She reveals that the dungeon disappeared after she finished raiding it, asking if he knows anything about it. Eugen realizes that this must be a dungeon that was supposed to appear in the future, and the system eliminated it because he turned back time, resulting in her acquiring a skill she originally didn't have. Now understanding the situation, he says that she must have obtained the SSS class title Dio Valchus's twin by killing Dio Valchus's along with its twin. Riet reveals that her brother is also an S-class hunter and gained this power alongside her. Eugen realizes that she consumed the power of a dragon and ended up becoming a half-human, half-dragon hybrid. Observing him, she mentions that he also feels like a dragon and smells like an enemy that could easily defeat Dio Valchus. Quickly thinking, he realizes that it's because of the tidal rochester's natural enemy that he acquired after killing it. Mentioning how she is no longer attracted to ordinary humans, she pushes him down, expressing how excited she is. Quickly gesturing to her shoes, Eugen suggests that she shouldn't bring them onto the bed. As she gets off the bed, she cutely asks him to raise her child. Meanwhile, Eugen inwardly curses Huna, realizing how much of a loudmouth she can be. Riet mentions that she wishes for him to raise a monster baby. Holding a knife to his throat, she explains that she is making a discreet request. Eugen dryly responds, praising her amazing attitude despite asking for a favor. He inwardly thinks that this isn't an unfair offer. After all, it would be a shame to let an S rank with an SSS class title simply leave like that. It's better to get involved with her in this way. The next day, Eugen's room is a mess and he is sprawled on the floor when Yoon Wen enters. In the end, Eugen accepts her request and saves her contact. Despite everything being done her way, he realizes that everything went well. After all, he could have died, and even Yu Hyun would have been able to face her while protecting him. 
He believes that she is too unpredictable, so it's probably a good thing he didn't try to influence her. He is surprised to see that Xiangna has cleaned up his room while he was lost in thought. Praising him, a message appears indicating that Xiangna has reached the requirements for growth. Yujin runs to Yuhan's office to inform his brother that he can turn Xiangna into an S rank. To achieve S rank stats, Xiangna must fulfill one of the three given requirements. They decide on the requirement of Xiangna defeating in a class dungeon boss with a single attack. The plan is to provide him with powerful offensive equipment. Then, Yerim will buff him with her skill Shadowless Day to enhance his offense. Yujin will share his offense power doubling skill with Xianghen through physical contact. However, Yuhyun rejects the idea, mentioning that as an F-class, Yujin won't be able to withstand the aftereffects of the fight since it requires constant physical contact with others. Yujin presents a new shield item prepared by Myungwu on his request. It's a one-use item that nullifies all damage for 10 minutes. Yujin is beyond surprised upon hearing the item's description. Later on, even Myungwu and Xiangha are against the idea of Yujin entering the dungeon. However, Yujin manages to convince them. He also enlists Hyuna's help in case anything goes wrong. But moments later, Sung Hyuni also arrives, surprising Yujin. The lower class dungeon, Black Golem City, is inhabited by golems and undead legions. However, the S-class hunters swiftly dispatch the monsters, even though it would take a group of A-class hunters a week to clear. Yujin can't help but feel excited, realizing that even in the future, there was never a team of four S-ranks. Xiangheng mentions that it's actually against the law for a group of S-class hunters to enter a dungeon together. One of the reasons is that their strong widespread attacks interfere with each other, as they lack the concept of teamwork. Then, Yujin wonders why Sung Hyoni isn't doing anything, despite entering the dungeon with them. He is the only one equipped with SS class gear, Flame Dragon Salikia's wings, which provides flame resistance. In the future rankings, Yujin knows that Yuhan will lose to Sung Hyoni just because of this SS rank item. He wishes he could tear up that coat. Caught staring, he quickly makes an excuse, thanking the Jupiter Guildmaster for coming all the way here. Calmly, Hyoni mentions that he came for an inspection since they are borrowing his dungeon. Moon Hyuna taunts him from down the cliff. In response, he snaps his fingers, and a light attack falls right next to her. Now enraged, she leaps upwards, swinging her spear towards him. Seeing her attack him, Sung Hyoni moves near Yuyujin. Unfortunately, Moon Hyuna can barely deflect her attack, stopping just in front of the group. As she curses Sung Hyoni, Yuhan steps in front of Yuyujin, cautioning her to be more careful from now on. The two of them start arguing, with Yuhyun mentioning that she should have better control over her temper. Moments later, they begin fighting each other. Ignoring Yuyujin's request to intervene, Sung Hyoni remarks that S-class hunters always hunt individually instead of in groups. However, now that dungeon breaks occur less frequently, and it's forbidden to enter dungeons together, he suggests that since they are all here, it's their best chance to go for each other's throats. Mouth open in surprise, Yuyujin now understands why S-ranks don't enter dungeons together. Yerim gracefully eliminates the golems, absorbing their magic stones with a smile. She thinks about selling them to pay off the ice spear installments and acquire the next equipment. Suddenly, she hears the sounds of Yuhyun and Moon Hyuna fighting. Upon hearing Yu Yujin cough, Yu Hyun interrupts the fight and quickly approaches his brother, concerned if the smoke or anything else is causing pain. Seeing how they are no longer fighting, Yu Yujin dramatically expresses his anxiety, claiming he is too weak due to his F rank. He mentions the absence of a healer while the S-class hunters bicker amongst themselves. Scolding them, he mentions that Peace and Xiangjin are displaying much better behavior. Sternly, Yu Yujin suggests they focus on completing the hunt instead of getting distracted, as that's the only way to escape this situation. Saying that they are not children, the three S-rankers line up under his command. Riding Peace on the edge of the cliff, Yu Yujin issues directions to the S-rankers, separating them into different locations to prevent further conflicts. Just then, a message appears, indicating the acquisition of an SS class skill. The Scary Chick class teacher skill allows him to control and direct the awakened entities that typically act as they please. While Yu Yujin is surprised and starts reading the skill description, the overseeing system entities remark on how perfect the skill is for him. Nighttime descends upon the dungeon, and Xiangheng offers Yu Yujin a warm mug, suggesting they camp for the night. Witnessing the S-rankers swiftly clearing the dungeons, the two of them anticipate a quick escape. 
observing the remnants of an old structure. Yu Yujin wonders aloud if it used to be a cable or a church. He recalls how these destroyed remains represent the world's failure to halt the increasing number of dungeons, and also the existence working towards increased dungeon influence. He ponders whether they, too, will meet the same fate if they fail to stop the dungeons. Can he gather 50 of these uncontrollable S-rankers and save the world? Gazing around the campfire, Yerim expresses her frustration at others hogging all the fun and her desire to participate in the fights. Yuhian calmly remarks that her skills and experience are lacking. Noticing her burnt hair tips, Yuno laments how the executives will be displeased, as she needs her long hair for commercials. Additionally, the old financiers of her guild, being boomers, stress the importance of maintaining her grace as a female S-class hunter. Embracing Yerim, she advises her to do as she pleases and grow without concern for such matters. Hyuna asks aloud whether Breaker should have also become independent like the other two guilds. Sung Hyoni suggests there is no need to obey orders forever. He explains that their primary concern is money, referencing the MKC incident as an example. He concludes by stating that regular humans cannot be considered the same species as them, given the vast difference in strength. Hearing this, Yujin begins to comprehend why S-ranks carry themselves with such arrogance, engaging in dungeon battles for weeks, wielding absolute power over otherworldly creatures, cultivates such behavior. Observing his brother, Yujin wonders if Yufan's calm and composed behavior is because of his brother being an F-rank hunter. Perhaps he suppresses his true desires, not out of kindness but for Yujin's sake. While the others advise Yu Yujin to rest, mentioning their plans to continue exploring as S-classes in pairs, a thought crosses his mind. He questions if they plan to duel each other again, causing them all to sweat. Yu Yujin points out Yerim clutching a collection of potions, Huni wearing his gloves, and his brother continuously sharpening his knife. Pointing at them, he warns that if caught fighting amongst each other, he will inform Yunwu to refrain from making equipment for them. Settling inside his bag to sleep, he contemplates that by accomplishing small tasks, over time, he may gather 50 S ranks and save the world. The next day, he is taken aback by the sight of a gigantic toad-like monster before them. After achieving his S-class advancement, Seonghyun mentions his intention to leave World's Edge and challenge Yuhyun to a fight. The other S-rankers also join in, causing Yujin to worry about the stability of the building. Shouting at them to stop their actions, Yujin abruptly opens his eyes, realizing it was just a dream. Getting up, he anxiously asks Seonghyun to promise not to go independent after becoming an S-class. Seonghyun raises his hands, assuring Yujin that he will continue serving as World's Edge's shield, and asks the reason behind the sudden request. At that moment, lightning flashes in the distance. Yujin turns around and realizes with a shout that the S-rankers are fighting once again. In the distance, Hyuna pours a potion over her wounds while questioning Sung Hyoni why he joined them to enter this dungeon. Hyoni responds, mentioning that Yujin is remarkably brave for an F rank. Before he can finish his sentence, Hyuna attacks him, warning him not to meddle with Yujin and stating how he may end up breaking a rare marble by playing with it. She insists that they wait until she acquires her mount, emphasizing how he has already caused enough harm. Observing the S-Class clash, Seonghan experiences the pressure emanating from them, realizing he cannot speak or approach. Just as he composes himself, he sees Yujin standing in front of him, shouting that he has news of S-Ranks using a dungeon for sparring. Witnessing the two of them descend, Seonghan complains about warning them not to fight the previous night. While scolding the two for their childish behavior and emphasizing the potential for injury, Hyuna whispers that Yujin is certainly unique. It seems as if he isn't even slightly afraid of S-Ranks. At that moment, a message appears, informing Yujin of space interference and advising him to run. Holding his pounding head, he asks the others to quickly escape. Suddenly, they feel the ground tremble. Seonghan activates his shield, preventing rocks from hitting Yujin. Even Yuhyun and Yerim appear, shouting at Yujin to move away swiftly. As they retreat, cracks appear in the ground where they have been standing. It appears that something is rising from beneath the surface. Checking the status of the colossal monster that emerged, Yujin informs the others that it is a first-class giant toad named Mountain Eater Bavar. It is an SS-class supersized monster covered entirely in rocks. Observing Yujin, Sung Hyoni wonders how Yujin sensed something unusual even before the monster appeared. Curiosity piqued, he thinks to himself what other secrets Yujin might be hiding. Back at the dormitory, Blue wreaks havoc, causing chaos in the room. Just as the staff member notices, Chirpy rushes into Yujin's room. Worried, Chirpy starts crying and searches for Yujin, the staff member saying his father isn't present. 
determined. Chirpy activates his legendary skill, Dominator of Space, and manages to glimpse Yujin riding atop piece in the dungeon. Before he can approach the screen, Blue crashes into him from above, knocking him unconscious. Meanwhile, in the dungeon, the hunters are stunned, wondering why such a monstrous creature is present in an A-class dungeon. The monster begins slowly advancing towards them, each step causing the ground to flatten beneath its immense weight. They realize they can't use the agate stone to escape, fearing that the monster might break free from the dungeon. Eugen recalls a similar incident with this monster occurring a few years later in China, where the creature caused significant damage just by walking around. Even this dungeon is located in the heart of the city, so the region could be destroyed if the dungeon breaks. Yerim enhances Yuhun's mana stats and the attributes of his flame. Xiangheng observes from a distance, suggesting that the SS class flames should be effective. Noticing this, Yujin shouts to Yuhan that the monster's neck is its weakness. Yujin realizes he already knows how to defeat this monster, and the hunters possess a powerful combination of skills. However, their equipment, stats, and experience are currently lacking. Both Yuhian and Hyuna struggle to inflict damage, and Bavar quickly regenerates any damage it sustains. Sung Hyoni surrounds the monster with his lightning chains and attempts to electrocute it, but it proves futile. In response, Bavar jumps into the air and lands forcefully, destroying the surrounding terrain under the immense pressure. Ignoring Yuhan's plea to leave first, Yujin requests their attention, explaining that it is possible for them to defeat the monster. He reveals that the creature's skin won't break with a normal attack, so they must synchronize their attacks to weaken it. First, he orders Yerim to freeze its neck, and then Yuhan will rapidly heat it up. This drastic temperature difference should weaken the monster. Hearing this plan, Huni asks if Yujin can truly receive such information with his monster training skill. Yujin simply replies that he can. Next, Yujin instructs Huna to target the monster's weak point at the right moment. However, there is a risk of it spiraling out of control, as they only have one chance at this. Huna expresses how much easier it would be if telepathy were possible. Surprisingly, Yujin dismounts from peace and proposes that telepathy might indeed be possible. Opening his status menu, Yujin explains that he can establish a form of connection between them using the skill he received the previous day. Yujin explains to the others about the skill he acquired yesterday, known as the Scary Chick Class Teacher, an SS rank skill that enhances teamwork. It allows the skill user to connect multiple people and synchronize their actions, with the skill user positioned at the center. He takes out numerous mana potions and instructs Yujin to stand beside Yerim. However, there is a condition, if the person on whom the skill is used rejects it, it can affect the skill user. Asking them not to reject it, Yujin activates the skill on them. In an instant, their eyes turn yellow, signifying the connection. As a result, Yujin can now understand the future movements of Yuhian and Yerim as if they shared the same body. He proceeds to establish a connection between Yuhian and Yerim as well. With this deep understanding of each other's actions in advance, the two attack, their weapons miraculously meeting at the very tips. Yujin consumes another potion and informs Hyuna that she will strike after Yuhian's attack. He suggests she ride on peace, as it will minimize the flame's effect on her. Thrilled at the opportunity to ride peace, Hyuna unveils the saddle she had brought just in case. Yujin recognizes that the negative effect of the skill is reduced when the recipient has been influenced by the keyword. Expressing his gratitude, he mentions that he loves her, and surprisingly, the keyword ends up influencing her. Turning to Hyoni, Yujin contemplates the fourth extra explanation regarding the skill. The more advanced the recipient's stats are, the greater the pressure on the skill user. However, when Yujin attempts to use the keyword on Hyoni, it fails to work as expected. Urging Hyoni to accept the skill, Yujin activates it. At the last moment, Hyoni rejects the skill, causing Yujin to experience intense pain from the backlash. Smiling, Hyoni casually remarks that it was only a slight rejection. As Hyoni puts his SS class coat on his back, Yujin is tempted to just snatch it and run off. However, since the goal is to promote Xiangin to SS class, Yujin understands that Xiangin must go first. Standing on the edge of a cliff, Xiangin releases an arrow that merely bounces off the monster's tough skin. Yerim enhances her mana stats using Shadowless Knight and Freezing Psy, bolstering her attack strength. Swinging her spear downwards, she activates Pale Rain, covering the monster's scaly skin with enormous ice crystals. Employing here's shoes to teleport away, Yujin calculates the ideal timing for Hyuna to strike after the flames have subsided a little but before the weakened skin regenerates. With closed eyes, Yujin takes into account various factors, Peace's leg strength, Hyuna's speed, the residual flames from Yuhun, and the timing of Hyoni's attack. Supporting Yujin's body, Hyoni grabs Yujin's arm, assuring him that he knows his timing 
and Yudin should focus solely on Hyuna. At the perfect moment, Yudin communicates with Hyuna through their connection, while Hyoni prepares to launch his attack. In the beginning, when Dungeon Break started appearing, initially only low-level monsters were seen. But as time goes on, the dungeons have become more difficult. The S-Class Hunters, who used to hunt individually, now need to join forces. That's when the Command System skill appeared. The principle behind it is that if a person of equal strength tries to give orders, they will be rejected. However, a weak F-Class's control isn't anything to worry about, and that skill led to the first cooperation between the S-Classes. Riding on peace, Huna charges towards the monster, her spear held in front. Park Serum and the others are amazed to see that this time the spear pierces the monster's skin, even though it is scorching hot due to Yuhan's flames, and her skin is blistering. Huna shouts with joy as she pulls back, green thick blood spurting from the wound. Above the monster in the area, Yujin activates his bracelet shield item, giving Hyoni the go-ahead. Both Yerim's buff and Yujin's veteran F-class skill increase Hyoni's offensive strength. Activating the attack, even Hyoni is visibly surprised to see the power behind it. Moments later, the toad-like monster falls dead to the ground, crumbling into rock fragments that fall towards Yerim and Yuhyun. As the promotion requirements are now met, Kim Seonghyun's stats and skills are increased to S rank. He easily activates a barrier shielding a gigantic area. Standing on top of a cliff's edge, Yujin begins to ask if everyone is alright, only to suddenly spurt blood from his nostrils. The next second, he falls unconscious. The fight was successful because of their teamwork, but the emotions lingered. On the ground, Hyuna praises peace, calling him cute. Even Yerim and Yuhan share a jubilant high-five due to the thrill of taking down an SS rank enemy. Hyunho runs towards the Jupiter Guildmaster but stops in the middle just to see him placing Yujin carefully on the ground. Feeling the joy of his strength doubled, Hyoni understands how convenient Yujin's skill is. In the blue room filled with holograms, we see the dungeon's entities shouting about how someone clearly targeted Han Yujin. A monster that was supposed to be sealed away for another five years appeared now. They also mention that someone tried to use teleportation skills in the dungeon's world. The others are confused because to do so, one would need to be SSS or L-class. Looking at Yujin with a dangerous glint in his eyes, Hyoni thinks to himself. He thinks that aside from the magic beast taming, Yujin is undeniably hiding something else. How Yujin was the first to notice that something was wrong, and how the command skill conveniently arrived. Also, the ability to share a skill that doubles attack power. He thinks it would have been better if Yujin was an item instead of a human. Both Yuhyun and Hyungda now wear surprised and angry expressions as they confront Hyoni. Landing beside the others, Yerim also requests Hyoni to hand back Yujin. Faced with the 4S class hunters demanding Yujin's return, Hyoni contemplates whether he should kill Yujin or kill the others since Yujin's skill which doubles his attack power, is still active. Pointing her spear at him, Hyunga coldly mentions that unlike the guild members who are afraid of hurting Yujin, she will go straight for Hyoni's neck. Considering how Yujin's bracelet item is now broken, Hyoni reluctantly hands him back to Hyuna. The next moment, he blocks Yuhan's attack with lightning chains appearing around him. As the two start attacking each other, Serum creates a giant crystal between them. Telling them to stop, she mentions that they need to get out of here with Yujin first. Even Hyuna throws Hyoni's jacket at him while asking Yuhyun to hold and carry his brother. As Yuhyun threatens Hyoni to never come near his brother again, Hyoni replies that it's going to be difficult since he really likes him now. Hearing that, both Yuhyun and Hyuna are stunned. Looking at Hyoni, Hyunga mentions how Yujin's safety is guaranteed as long as Hyoni appreciates his skills. Finally, the dungeon raid is over. A few days later, the whole public is discussing the appearance of an SS-class monster in a dungeon. Kim seong promotion to S-rank is also making headlines worldwide. Back at the Breakers Guild, a staff member is shocked to see Hyuna cutting her long hair. She calmly mentions that she had to shave off the burnt ends. While the staffer worries and asks Hyuna if the old geezers will be okay with this, Hyuna leaves the room with a smile, stating that it's not something to fret over. It turns out that everyone was expecting change. In the Jupiter Guild, we see Hyoni on the phone, asking someone to bring Dio Valshis's twin siblings back to Korea. Opening his eyes in his bed, Yujin is gently slapped on the cheek by Chirpy. The next moment, he sees Seojgan, Serum, and Moonwalk all crying tears of joy as Yujin finally wakes up. 
It turns out he had slept for two whole days. With a stern look, Mu Wok starts berating Xiangen, asking how even 4S class hunters couldn't take care of Yujin. Feeling like he has become such a scary person, Xiangen and Yerim bow their heads and apologize. As Yujin starts playing with Chirpy, Serum mentions that she was also worried about Yujin, so they had to bring him over. Opening his status, Yujin is surprised to see that soon after he left, Peace became an S class too. He quickly gets up from the bed, surprising everyone. Thinking how he might have finally grown up, Yujin mentions that he is going to see Peace. Xianghan mentions that Peace entered a dungeon with Yu Hyun. Yujin is stunned when told that Yu Hyun and Peace entered an S class dungeon by themselves. They remember how, before entering the dungeon gate, Peace suddenly grew in size, looking more majestic than ever before. Realizing that Peace's has now fully matured, Yu Hyun addresses the others, mentioning that only he will be clearing the dungeon with Peace. Even in his current state, Yujin is unable to calm down, acknowledging that there is nothing he can do since the dungeon gate is probably closed by now. Growing increasingly angry, he starts cursing Yu Hyun, loudly questioning what he was thinking. Witnessing this, Yerim and Xiang Hun urge him to calm down. Despite their efforts, Yujin continues to bite his lips in worry, contemplating how an S-class dungeon takes 10 days to raid, meaning that Yu Hyun and Peace won't even have the opportunity to sleep in between. Trying to pacify him, Xiang Hin mentions that the Guildmaster had a gate stone as well. Shifting the topic, Yerim proudly displays her SS-class earnings, revealing the Mermaid Queen's earrings she received as a reward for killing Bavar. These earrings enhance her mana and mentality, boosting her water and ice skills efficiency by 30% in aquatic environments. Surprised, Yujin remarks that no one will be able to defeat her in water-themed dungeons now. Smirking, Yerim mentions her plans to raid all the water-themed dungeons from now on and soon settle all her debts. However, she quickly realizes that she will be in debt again once she buys equipment. She also mentions the need for ice-resistant items for her team. Observing her complaints, Yujin contemplates how she is gradually growing. He also acknowledges that, unlike other S-class hunters who grow individually, she is being taken care of by other S-ranks. Feeling proud of her, Yujin eagerly anticipates witnessing her further growth. Meanwhile, Xianghan and Yerim silently acknowledge that they successfully distracted Yujin. Opening his status, Yujin checks his rewards and discovers that he obtained an SS rank item called the Nameless Demon King's Old Water Wheel. Uncertain of its usage, he considers asking the system for guidance when he enters a dungeon again. Later that day, Yujin switches on the TV and is surprised to hear the news that Xianghan will soon be promoted to the Vice Guildmaster of World's Edge. His eyes widen in astonishment as he takes in the information. With a bright smile, he grabs Xianghan's hand, claiming that he is a perfect fit for the role. Suggesting a promotion party, Xianghen mentions that it's unnecessary as he has already received congratulations from everyone. It turns out that the Hanshin Guild also sent him flowers. Xianghen blushes as he reveals that he used to be an employee at Hanshin Corporation. After his awakening, he was asked to marry the president's daughter. However, his co-worker, Park Mingus, awakened as an S-rank hunter and ended up marrying the daughter and becoming the guildmaster. Xianghen confesses that their relationship has been strained since then, while Yujin inwardly notes how it's like a Korean drama. Ultimately, Xianghen believes it to be a positive development as World's Edge is now more stable. Observing Xianghen, Yujin realizes that he values the guild more than his personal feelings. Continuing the conversation, Yujin expresses his preference for being a supportive character rather than a guild master and promises to assist Xianghen to the best of his ability, much to Yujin's excitement. Smiling brightly, Yujin envisions a bright future for the guild. Just then, Dakibai appears at the window. It seems that Yun Yun has brought a gift for Yujin so they can have a meal together. Expressing his love, Yujin sees Yun Yun's window pop up, indicating that he cannot be influenced due to being an incomplete species. Surprised, Yujin ponders how the basic elements of a Dakibai's species is water. Just as Yujin finally realizes the significance of his rewards, he wonders if the system gave the water wheel to him to use on Yun Yun. Offering the water wheel to Yun Yun, he mentions that it is even older than him. Correctly deducing that it once belonged to a demon king, the Dokibai explains how he will be awakening the demon king in this edition. Surprised before Yujin can inquire further, a black fog starts rising out of the water wheel, enveloping Yun Yun. Yujin watches as Yun Yun's appearance undergoes a transformation, now with darker skin, tall horns, and bat-like wings. Checking Yun Yun's status, Yujin discovers that he has truly become an SS rank demon. Meanwhile, Yun Yun shouts about becoming a demon king. While covering his face with his hands, Yujin is surprised to see Yun Yun transform into an SS rank demon king. 
He realizes that this means Yun Yun is now stronger than even Bavar. Looking at the crazed Yun Yun, Yujin realizes that if he goes on a rampage, this place will be destroyed. Even Xiangheng won't be able to handle him. Just then, he comes to a realization, wondering why he is unaffected when even Xiangheng's shield was shattered by the dark energies surrounding Yun Yun. He understands that the influence must still be in effect even after becoming a demon king. It turns out that even after becoming a demon king, Yun Yun still considers him his grandpa. Thinking that he should scold him in a loud, angry voice, Yujin grabs a toy fishing rod he used to play with peace and starts playfully scolding the new demon king. Seeing his actions, even Yun Yun is surprised that Yujin isn't afraid of him even after he became a demon king. Hearing this, Yujin retorts, mentioning that even a goblin is scarier than this. Thinking inwardly, Yujin realizes that Yun Yun still likes to scare people. Seeing Yujin's pleading look, even Xiangheng starts exclaiming how he was only scared because he thought Yujin might be in danger. Otherwise, Yun Yun was definitely less scarier than a goblin. Looking at them, Yun Yun claims with a smile on his face that he won't be a demon king anymore. His status changes from demon king to the great goblin king Yun Yun. Even his mask breaks away, revealing the handsome face underneath. Mentioning that he still possesses some demon king powers, Yun Yun asks if they want to see his skills. As Xiang Hin goes outside to calm the hospital staff, Yujin assures him that everything will be alright. Yujin's eyes widen with surprise upon seeing Yun Yun looking exactly like him. It turns out Yun Yun has a new transformation skill called Goblin Mask, though he can only copy appearances and not the skills or stats. Showing off his long-distance skill, a demon gate appears in the room. Once every 10 days, Yun Yun can travel to a faraway place, though it has to be somewhere he has visited before. Hearing this, Yujin jumps in excitement, much to Yun Yun's shock. He thinks about how dungeon exploration will become easier because of this skill. To Yujin's excitement, Yun Yun suggests going to visit a dungeon to gather his own subjects since he is a demon king now. Seeing him leave, Yujin asks him to research the dungeons in China and Japan as well, to which Yun Yun agrees. Back at the World's Edge Guild, Siok Simeon angrily slams his phone down. It seems that the Hunter Management Association is sending a representative to escort Yujin from the hospital to the newly constructed building. The next day, Yurim is taken aback by the destroyed appearance of the specially constructed hunter ward of the hospital. Yujin calmly assures her that nothing happened and that he is still fine. Yurim points out his dark circles, mentioning that he probably didn't sleep the whole night. Yujin thinks to himself that it's because he had to keep checking to see if his brother was still alive in the dungeon. Pointing at her, he asks why she's here instead of at school. Avoiding eye contact, she mentions that the teacher sent her here. Hearing that, Yujin accurately guesses what actually happened. He admonishes her, stating that even though she's a hunter, she still needs to abide by the rules and shouldn't be proud of being a juvenile delinquent. Walking through the hallway, he thinks that this isn't something to be laughed at. The Awakened have always been able to easily bypass legal regulations, especially high-ranking hunters who possess more authority than their governments in some foreign countries. Korea only functions normally because of one man. Looking at Yurim, he tells her to go to school since he already has someone who will be picking him up. He mentions that the association is sending someone to show him around the recently completed facilities. The only person who remains a public servant even after becoming an S-rank is Chief Song, the former police officer who comes to arrest S-rank hunters whenever they disobey the law. It's Chief Song who came to pick him up. Outside, they see a tall officer with broad shoulders. He presents his card, proving his identity as Song T1 from the Awakened Management Bureau. Looking at him, they think about how huge he is in person. Even among the S ranks, he stands out. He asks them to wait there since he will be parking nearby. They see him awkwardly squeezing into a car that is too small for his stature, having to bend forward to drive. Just then, another car crashes into Chief Song's car. As an S rank, Song T1 safely emerges from his wrecked car. From the other car, Hyoni steps out, jokingly saying that it wasn't intentional. He mentions that when he saw Chief Song packed into such a small car, he accidentally pressed the accelerator. Yujin quiets down Yurim as she starts cursing Hyoni. Looking at the two S ranks facing each other, he wonders if they will have to evacuate the hospital. It's because Song T1 possesses a special investigator permit and is a major annoyance to the major guilds. With a smile, Hyoni offers Chief Song to send the bill for repairs to his guild or perhaps he would like to use Sung Hyoni's car for now. Surprising everyone, Song T1 calmly states that if he were to accept anything above a certain threshold, it would be considered bribery. Instead, he will be sending the bill. Both Yujin and Yurim are surprised that Song T1 didn't confront Hyoni. 
they are even more surprised to see him cleaning up the broken pieces of his car. The two think about how he is truly different from the other S ranks. With a suspicious look, Yujin thinks that this likely isn't the first time Hyoni did something like this. With a feigned worried expression, Hyoni asks if Song T1 really intended to drive around Yujin in a car with such manufacturing problems, all the while ignoring that he was the one who crashed into it. He mentions that a public servant should avoid causing harm to someone as important as Yujin. Hearing that, Song T1 bows to Yujin, apologizing for his short-sightedness. Raising his hands, Yujin mentions that he will slowly have the world's edge send him a car. He then says that Hyoni is probably busy and doesn't need to escort him. Hearing this, Hyoni puts on a contrite expression, mentioning how he poured his heart and soul into improving their relationship, prompting Yujin to think about how Hyoni sent a lot of equipment and good food for peace sent him. Walking alongside Sung Hyoni, Yujin mentions that they can go together. Behind them, Yerim looks at Song Tiwon's dark expression, realizing that he is actually looking at Yujin instead of Sung Hyoni. She wonders if Chief Song has another objective for coming here. Together, the four of them visit the magnificent taming facility that was just constructed. Sung Hyoni takes the lead, introducing the building all by himself. Just then, Kang Soyam runs toward them with a joyful smile. She holds a basket in her hands, presenting the baby female thorn-winged dragon to the others. She mentions that she tamed it recently. Yujin looks at its status and discovers that it has possible stats ranging from A to S class. He greets the baby dragon and takes out the master's token. His title is the perfect nurturer amplifying its effects. The dragon cutely perches on his head as both Yujin and someone else start praising how adorable it is. Suddenly, Song T1 looks back and sees a griffin flying toward them. Before he can react to the apparent danger, the griffin lands on Yujin's shoulder and affectionately rubs its head against him. Yujin introduces the griffin as Blue, his new sister, but to their surprise, Blue starts asserting her dominance in front of the new addition. Yujin takes out a few musical instruments, distracting the two monsters and allowing the girls to catch them. Observing this with a clenched fist, Song T1 thinks to himself that something is definitely amiss here. With the creatures finally captured, Soyang mentions that she will come to visit every day since she doesn't have any dungeons to raid. With a tear in his eye, Yujin wishes that Yuhan could be even a tenth as kind as she is. Looking at the other S ranks, Yujin suggests that they should leave as well, intending to weed out the distractions. Unfortunately, Yerim and Hyoni mention how they don't mind spending some more time here. As he looks at Hunter Song, Yujin is aware that he has another reason to escort him. He assumes that the reason is probably related to his brother since Yuhan is not doing well. He wonders if it will be like a parent-teacher conference. Pushing Yerim away, he mentions that Hunter Song is a public servant, so it's unlikely he will kidnap him or something. Encouraging Chief Song to agree, Yujin thinks to himself how he doesn't need to know about his past involvement in crimes such as murder, assault, and blackmail. Looking at Hyoni, Yujin suggests that since he has already put in a lot of effort for him, he shouldn't distract him anymore. As the two of them leave, Yujin and Hunter Song go to the break room for a coffee. Meanwhile, Yujin prepares himself to hear any complaints about Yu Hyun. Later, Song T1 mentions that dealing with S ranks has become more manageable since there have been fewer dungeon breaks recently. In the past, S ranks would often encounter one another randomly, making it hard to control them. Agreeing, Song T1 mentions that Yu Hyun once blew up his arm. Hearing that, he expresses his shame as a parent. Trying to reassure him, Song tells him not to worry, mentioning that arms can be easily fixed and that Yu Hyun even helped him retrieve his removed arm back then. He explains that the reason he came there today was to check on Yujin. Suddenly, Song T1 grabs Yujin's shoulder and asks him to truthfully answer whether he has received any physical or psychological damage from the S rank hunters in the dungeon. Surprised, Yujin mentions that he is worrying too much. Just Gen Officer Song grabs Yujin's neck, saying that he was already suspicious of Yujin. He mentions that the problem is with Yujin himself, while Yujin starts wondering why he is choking him. As he lifts Yujin into the air, gripping his neck tightly with both hands, Yujin wonders why there could be any reason for Song T1 to behave this way. Just then, Hunter Kang Soyoung bursts into the room, dropping the toys she was carrying and immediately charging at Hunter Song. Yujin realizes that as an A class hunter, Soyoung can't do much against the S rank Song T1. Bowing to the two, Song T1 hands Yujin a healing potion for his neck. Kang Soyoung, dropping the potion, questions why he would offer a healing potion after choking him. Hearing this, Song T1 acknowledges that Yujin should indeed be more careful. He continues to explain that he has observed how Yujin interacts with S-rank hunters and monsters as if they were nothing. 
he points out that Yujin is the only low-rank hunter who is so comfortable around high-ranking individuals. Normal humans don't typically exhibit this kind of behavior when faced with monsters of significantly higher levels. Even in the presence of Hyoni and while being choked, Yujin didn't seem afraid. Yujin realizes to himself that it might be because he has fear resistance. Just then, he realizes that he didn't receive a pop-up notification indicating that his fear resistance had been activated while being choked. Fear resistance is a skill that activates when someone experiences fear beyond a certain threshold. Song Tiwan suggests that instead of being brave, it seems like Yujin's warning system is turned off, meaning he doesn't recognize when something is dangerous. Before Song Tiwan can react further, Kang Soyoung raises her weapon cutting him off and stating that they will file an official complaint as a guild. Yujin intervenes with a smile, acknowledging that Song Tiwon was right, and thanking Chief Song for his advice. Chief Song leaves his business card, mentioning that Yujin is indeed a peculiar individual, and offering to help whenever Yujin needs assistance. Late that night, Yujin stands in front of a mirror, feeling relieved that the bruise marks on his neck have disappeared. He remembers the effort it took to calm Soyoung down afterward. He also recalls that in a few years, Hunter Song will die during a dungeon raid. After that incident, the Jupiter Guild left Korea without a word, and everyone assumed Hyoni had killed him. Some suspected Yu Hyun, but Yujin's brother couldn't have done such a thing. Despite Song t ones earlier behavior, it seemed as if he was genuinely worried about Yujin rather than threatening him. Yujin understands that he does seem to be desensitized to danger. Just then, Myungwoo arrives with his stuff, swiftly moving into the penthouse of their new building. Yujin requests Myungwoo to create a mentality improving device for him when he has the time. He knows that if his mental state is improved, the side effects of fear resistance will be diminished. Plus, he will need it when he uses the command skill again. Just then Yerim arrives breaking through a wall mentioning that she heard something happened. Yujin has a difficult time consoling the two as he mentions how Song T1 attempted to kill him. With a worried expression, she mentions that in the Guildmaster's absence, she is supposed to be the one protecting him. Yujin assures her that he will be careful from now on. In the morning of that day, Yerim pays a visit to Yujin and the monsters on the rooftop garden. Unlike the energetic monsters, Yujin is lying lethargically in a corner. He couldn't sleep at night because Fomit is actually a nocturnal creature. Apart from that, Blue is constantly causing trouble. Yerim wonders why he considers Blue smart when it's wrecking the garden. Growing frustrated with Blue's antics, Yerim grabs it by the throat, threatening it to stop. Yujin simply smiles and mentions that such behavior is natural for monsters, and you can't force human expectations on them. Observing the chaos, Yerim comments that the monsters must be glad to have Yujin looking after them. She suggests that he can leave them to her and take a break. However, he refuses, stating that today is the day the store opens. He thinks about how many people from overseas will visit his building and leave their monsters here, allowing him to easily influence both the monsters and their hunters. Looking at his phone, he remembers that Riet is his first customer today. He recalls how, in exchange for taking care of Riet's magical beast, he asked her to introduce him to her brother. Due to the Rochester's natural enemy skill, its effects will double, allowing him to easily influence her brother. He remembers Riet mentioning how she raised her younger brother just like Yujin, perfecting him piece by piece. Although Yujin is filled with anxiety, picturing her brother as an overbearing and irrational S-rank hunter, he feels relieved that at least he has an S-rank guard with him. Meanwhile, Yerim suggests that they must have arrived since she can hear them. Although Yujin thinks he will be terrible, they are surprised to see a well-dressed and amicable-looking man greeting them. He introduces himself as Riet's brother, Noah Lu here. Politely, he thanks them for the invitation and then apologizes for his sister's rude behavior. Yujin can't help but think about how different he is from his sister. Noah mentions that due to their titles, their appearances have changed, which is why the brother and sister don't resemble each other. He adds that he is also a guild master in France, belonging to a guild called Arc specializing in support skills. Before he acquired his title, they only had healing and support skills, making it challenging to expand. Noah mentions that his sister is quite carefree, which is why the two siblings don't often work together. She only contacts Noah when she needs something and tends to disregard his schedule, occasionally asking for his help. Understanding their relationship better now, Yujin realizes that he is like a supporting brother enslaved by his sister. Thinking about this, Yujin realizes that he has hit the jackpot by encountering a polite and supportive S-class hunter. Not only that, Noah's personality is also great. Once he gains influence over him, Noah will view Yujin similarly to how Riet sees him, making him more likely to listen. Yujin envisions a future where Noah and Yuhan could become friends and how he can influence Riet as well. 
Smiling at Noah, Yujin considers how tough it must be for him since his sister forced him to come to Korea. Hearing that Noah came to Korea for some other business, the two offer to assist him if he needs any help, to which Noah politely accepts, expressing gratitude for their kindness. With a triumphant smile, Yujin takes his seat, mentioning that, as a client, Noah is easy to manipulate. Noah ends up successfully being influenced, much to Yujin's satisfaction. However, as they continue their conversation, something seems off. Eugen and Yerim turn their attention to Noah, who sits still with his head down. Suddenly, Noah mutters something quietly under his breath, then grabs the corner of the table, breaking it in his hands. Before he can smash the table into pieces, Yerim quickly grabs Eugen and jumps away. As they fall to the ground, Eugen asks Noah what he's doing as his hands transform into claws. Glancing at Eugen without saying a word, Noah looks at him with a menacing gaze. Eugen wonders why there always seems to be something wrong with his clients. Suddenly, Noah stops in his tracks. Looking behind he sees shadows and ice crystals connecting him and Yerim. In an instant, Yerim and Noah start exchanging fierce blows. Despite Yerim's efforts, it becomes evident that the difference in their skill levels is too great and she is at a disadvantage. With Yujin by her side, she cannot unleash her strongest wide area attacks. Seizing the opportunity, Noah strikes Yerim's arm with a poisonous attack, leaving dark purple marks on her skin. As she collapses onto her knees, Noah lunges towards her with his clawed hands. Yujin urgently commands Noah to stop. Hearing Yujin's voice, Noah snaps out of his trance and jumps back from Yerim. Yujin realizes that his influence over Noah is working. But Noah still stands, his hand pressed against his head. Seizing the chance, Yujin uses his command skill on Noah, amplifying the effects of his influence. By sharing senses with Noah, Yujin can now anticipate and evade his attacks as Noah rushes at him. Only sustaining minor cuts, Yujin understands that if Noah were in his right state of mind, he would already be dead. Closing his eyes, Yujin focuses on Noah's senses, projecting his mind into Noah's body. He hears a voice echoing in Noah's head, urging him to kill when his target is weak. Observing through Noah's sight, Yujin realizes that Noah is mistaking him for his sister, Riet. Witnessing this, Yujin wonders if the person Noah wants to kill is actually his sister. Before Noah can attack him again, a golden barrier materializes, pushing him back. Xiangwen arrives and asks if Yujin is alright. Alongside Xiangwen, members of the association and the Jupiter Guild's master start to arrive. In the next moment, Noah is swiftly incapacitated as Xiangwen's shoe collides with his enraged face. Yujin rushes to Yerim's side as she shouts that the antidote isn't working, urging him to stay away. Yujin reassures her that he has poison resistance. Kyoni witnesses the scene, noting that Yujin seems to possess numerous skills, including this poison resistance. Looking down, Kyoni pierces Noah's hand with his lightning chains, mentioning that he caused trouble as soon as he landed in Korea. Just as Hyoni contemplates dealing with Noah, he hears Yujin calling out to him. Yujin expresses gratitude for Hyoni's assistance, but requests that he refrains from harming his guest. Meanwhile, Seonghan stands behind Hyoni with a surprised expression, cautioning Yujin about approaching. Hyoni questions whether it's wise for Yujin to defend his guest considering the state of the damaged building. He wonders why Yujin is always so helpless. Stepping aside, Hyoni addresses Noah, expressing his desire to know what happened. Yujin contacts Riet, and the moment her voice reaches his ears through the phone, Noah's demeanor abruptly changes. Riet asks Yujin if he has met her brother and comments on how adorable he is. Yujin confirms that he has met him but explains that an issue arose, leading to Noah's attack. Hearing this, Noah starts sweating even more, a fearful expression plastered across his face. Riet chides Noah, reminding him of her instructions to be kind. As this unfolds, Yujin continues to utilize sense sharing on Noah, sensing the immense terror he feels. It becomes evident that Noah is obedient solely to his sister due to an overwhelming fear of her. Yujin then examines Noah's status and discovers that despite his awakening being limited to a rank, Noah has forced his body to reach an S-class level, surpassing the system's imposed limitations. It appears that Riet has done something remarkable to her brother, completing him to perfection piece by piece. Yujin thinks with a grim expression, wondering what Riet has done to her brother. As Riet scolds Noah over the phone he just keeps trembling. Seeing this interaction, Hyoni addresses Riet, mentioning that she must have met Yujin while she was in Korea. Hearing his voice, Riet mentions to Yujin that he is being accompanied by a very dangerous man. Cutting her off, Yuan mentions that it seems her brother harbors a lot of negative feelings towards her. Yuan thinks to himself that it's his own mistake. After all, no one said that all nurturers are good people. Riet refuses this, mentioning that she raised him to be strong. 
all the while Noah has a traumatized look on his face. Riette mentions that she raised him instead of throwing him out when Noah was a little weakling. Eugen replies that he should have been in a rank back Jen. Riette retorts that a rank is not good enough for her brother. Even without needing to share his senses Eugen can sense anxiety and fear inside Noah, the tracks of abuse that can't be covered up. Rit keeps talking about how even today Noah made a mistake when meeting Eugen, asking Noah when he will eventually become useful. She keeps talking that anyone else would have already thrown him out, but she didn't because she loves her brother too much. Eugen calms himself down thinking that he can use this situation for his benefit. Finally, in an angry voice Eugen speaks to Riet saying that her brother has harmed a Korean awakened so he will be requesting that the Hunter Association keep him here for a while. Hearing this Riet asks if he can't just let him go. While Eugen thinks this way he can even learn something new, not just about Noah but also about Riet. Then with a cold voice he says that he can ban Riet as well if he reports her for the illegal contract. Riet, unable to understand why he is being so angry, points out that she introduced her brother to him like he asked her to. Unable to keep calm, Eugen ends up shouting at Riet, calling her a piece of shit for gaslighting her own brother. He asks how she can be so cruel to him while saying that she loves him, how she should have known that her brother is dying from fear. Hearing him shout, everyone is surprised. He keeps shouting at her saying that there is a difference between scolding and bullying a perfectly fine kid. He mentions that even if her brother is weak she should just protect him, asking how she could have done that to her own brother just because he is weak. He tells her to fix herself before entering Korea and to forget about showing her face unless it's to bow down and to apologize to her brother. Before she can say anything else he disconnects the call. Seeing Riet's missed calls being piled up, all Eugen can think of is how he is in big trouble now. He fears that perhaps his warning system is really off, although she won't completely kill him since he has to raise her monster. He wipes the sweat off his face while Hyoni is clapping in the background. Looking at Yujin, Noah realizes that his sister couldn't even say anything back to Yujin. In the end Noah was escorted to the Hunter Association. Of course Hunter Song didn't forget to mention that he shouldn't have expected Yujin to be more careful. He mentions that since there hadn't been any harm to an unawakened, after detention is over they will receive a request for settlement. Although Hunter Song offers the choice, Eugen asks not to kick Noah out of the country until they are done with the settlement procedure. Although he does ask him to ban Riet's entry instead to separate the siblings and also for Eugen's own safety. Hearing Officer Song agree, Eugen addresses Noah with a smile saying that now his sister won't be able to come see him. Causing tears to appear in his eyes, Eugen mentions that they will talk more once things have settled down. As a healer from the Jupiter's Guild heals their injuries, Eugen thinks that perhaps he can take Noah in as a healer as well. Yerim tears off his shirt allowing the healer to heal Eugen's injuries. Meanwhile Eugen thinks about how he has been going around saying the key phrase without any fear, wondering that perhaps this is also because of his fear resistance. He also used the key phrase in front of Sung Hyoni. Finally healed he turns to Yerim thanking her again mentioning how things would have gone poorly without her. Touched by his words she sits beside him talking that she still has a long way to go since she couldn't even protect him this time. Surprising Yerim he mentioned he has L-class poison resistance though he asks her to keep it a secret. While Yerim is surprised at hearing of a greater class, Eugen thinks back to how it seemed that the Jupiter Guild Master already knew Noah and Riet from before. At the Hunter Detention Center we see Sung Hyoni visit Noah. He mentions that it hasn't been long since they made Noah useful so how could he mess things up so badly? As Noah raises his head, Sung Hyoni mentions that he needs to keep his promise. In the room, Sung Hyoni asks Noah why he did that, mentioning that he made things difficult for himself as soon as he arrived. Hyoni mentions that he needs to keep his promise to pay. Giving in to his anger, Noah forcefully smashes the table with his hands, denting it, and asks why he needs to pay. He accuses Hyoni of informing his sister about the dungeon where the siblings can work together successfully to complete the raid. Letting out a sigh, Hyoni mentions that his promise was to make Noah strong, not stronger than his sister. In the next moment, he smashes Noah against the wall, causing it to crack. Bending his head down to him, Hyoni asks Noah again why he attacked Yujin. Later, walking through the hallway, Hyoni thinks back to Noah's answer. Noah replied that he had a strange feeling since he laid eyes on Yujin. He felt like a cursed poison dragon, similar to him and his sister but of a higher class. He felt like his sister, despite his weakness. Reflecting on his answer, Hyoni wonders if Yujin has a hidden talent, perhaps the reason for his resistance to poison. 
but how can someone with F-class stats obtain such a title? Hyoni considers how Yujin doesn't seem to possess any outstanding attack skills. Just then, he comes across Officer Song T1. Song accuses Hyoni, mentioning that he suspected he was involved in this incident. In response, Sung Hyoni explains that he was just visiting as someone who helped resolve the incident. Song T1 simply advises him not to put Han Yujin in any danger. T1 mentions that an F-class is not much different from an ordinary person, so he shouldn't expose Yujin to further danger. Patting T1's shoulder, Hyoni suggests that he should learn from how concerned Officer Song is for Yujin. Walking alone, Hyoni thinks that Yujin is not the one being swept up in all of this. Yujin is actually the reason behind these incidents. It is the World's Edge Guild that will be affected by Yujin's actions. At a dungeon gate, we see journalists reporting how the World's Edge Guildmaster cleared an S-rank dungeon in less than a week despite it being expected to take at least 10 days. Just then, Yujin and Seonghan arrive at the scene in a car. As people warn him to be careful, Yujin runs towards the dungeon gate with Seonghan following him. Upon reaching there, peace in its majestic adult form, with Yuhan walking besides it. Yuhan greets him while Yujin starts scolding him for recklessly entering an S-class dungeon alone. It turns out that at some point, Yuhan's potions ran out, and he wasn't able to heal the injuries on his body and face. While Yujin closely inspects Yuhan's face for any injuries, Xiangja feels immense fear looking at Yuhan, who just cleared a dungeon. Hesitating for a moment, Xiangja realizes it's too dangerous to approach Yuhan right now. But how can Yujin act so casually around them? In another place, Hyoni speaks quietly to himself about why S-rankers are drawn to Yujin. It's like a cat grooming a lion. S-rankers, who exist outside the social standards, usually receive envy and fear. But Yujin is different, evident from the fact that while others keep their distance, Yujin drapes a coat over Yuhyun. Hugging the small piece sleeping in his hands, Yujin stands firmly in front of Yuhyun, telling the reporters to make sure they mention how hard Yuhyun has been working without any sleep. For these S-rankers to meet someone who cares for them or even treats them like a kid. In the Hunter Association room, Noah thinks to himself how he has ruined everything. He remembers his sister's words, calling him a failure and how he can't do anything, despite being an S-class. He feels that it's all his fault. Breaking his handcuffs, Noah gets up, muttering to himself how he needs to fix things somehow. In the car, Yujin leans against his brother, sound asleep, while peace rests in his lap. Seonghan, searching for the driver's seat, comments on how Yujin hasn't slept properly for the past few nights. He expresses his concern for Yuhyun, noting how strange it is that despite being an S-rank hunter known by the entire world, Yujin still behaves like a mother. Yuhyun responds, suggesting that Yujin is just naturally peculiar. He believes that Yujin treats him and monsters with powers on a different level than his own. Even before awakening as a hunter, Yujin has always been protective like this. Yuhyun contemplates how that might be the reason strange things happen around Yujin. Even S-rank hunters or powerful monsters wouldn't mind such affection and care. He wonders how it's possible that Yujin is so different, considering how cautious and passive he used to be. Now, everyone seems to like him, and his safety is relatively secured, allowing Yuhyun to focus more on training in dungeons. Yuhyun's thoughts shift back to the dungeon he cleared and how Peace decided to cooperate with him, as both of their priorities are ensuring Yujin's safety. That's why they entered the S-rank dungeon alone, aiming to increase their stats. Yuhyun asks Seonghan if anything significant happened while he was away, causing Seonghan to stiffen instantly. Sweat appears on his face as he mentions that many things happened, but he will report them when they return. Just then, Yuhyun notices some photos sent to his phone. Opening them, he sees Yujin with bruises around his neck, dressed in bloodied clothes. In the next moment, Yujin wakes up, seeing Yuhyun before him with an angry expression and a cracked phone in his hand. Before Yujin can apologize for leaning on him, Yuhan tears off his shirt and quickly scans him for any injuries. Amid Yuhan's angry questioning, Yujin explains that he got caught up in a fight between siblings, mentioning Noah and how he is the guildmaster of Ark. Yujin adds that even Sung Hyoni called him a healer. With a hurt look on his face, Yuhan murmurs how he wasn't gone for a week and Yujin had already been harmed. Even though Yuhan didn't take any S-rank hunters with him just in case, this still happened. He questions the point of going to dungeons at this rate. Understanding why Peace and Yuhyun entered the dungeon alone, Yujin pats Yuhyun's head, mentioning how Seonghun and Yaim protected him. Hearing that the Jupiter Guildmaster left Noah alive, Yuhyun speculates with a suspicious look that he must be involved with him. Yujin wonders if it's a logical conclusion to make, considering all the guilds after him. Yuhyun then asks Yujin about the mark on his neck. Yujin lets out a sigh and explains everything about his encounter with Officer Song. 
Yu Jin tells Yu Hyun not to get angry, to which Yu Hyun calmly replies that he understands. Yu Hyun mentions how Yu Jin needs to listen and be more cautious. Yu Jin thinks that it seems many people are after him, and the situation can only be resolved by surrounding himself with Ali. As they are about to enter the building, Yu Hyun starts looking around, while Yu Jin receives a call from Officer Song, informing him to stay indoors as Noah just escaped. Turning back, they see Noah standing a few steps away from them. Peace jumps down and transforms into his adult form, while Yujin asks Noah what he's doing there. Noah sits on the ground and begins apologizing for his actions. Bending down, he asks Yujin to please take in his sister's monster. Yujin stops Yu Hyun from attacking him and tells Noah to get up, mentioning that he will also talk with Riet. Although Noah will have to apologize to Yerim in the morning as well. Looking at Yujin holding his torn shirt and Yu Hyun standing beside him, Noah asks if Yujin is being bullied by his brother. As Yu Hyun introduces himself, Noah's eyes start trembling, and sweat runs down his face. He asks Yujin why he isn't scared of Yu Hyun. Feeling the pressure exerted by Yu Hyun's presence, Noah starts muttering how Yu Jin will be treated like he was. He acts confused when he realizes that Yu Han is a complete human. Yu Hyun pushes Yu Jin back, mentioning that Noah is acting strangely. Hearing Yu Hyun call Yu Jin weak reminds Noah of his traumatic experiences. The next instant, Noah lunges toward the brothers, but Yu Hyun moves to stand in front of Yu Jin. Yu Hyun pushes his brother back. An explosion rings out in front of the building. Sitting beside Peace, Yujin watches Yu Hyun pinning Noah to the ground. Holding Noah's arm, Yujin asks if this was the same arm that injured Park Hiram. Before he can break his arm, Yu Hyun is forced to let go as a long tail emerges from Noah. Looking at his arm, Yu Hyun notices purple poison marks. Equipping his sword, Yu Hyun simply cuts off the poison part of his arm before it can spread. With the call still ongoing, Officer Song mentions that he is reaching there as quickly as he can. While Yu Hyun pours antitoxin over his arm, Noah holds his head in his hands as dragon wings sprout from his back. In a few seconds, in Noah's place is stands a tall dragon. Looking at the complete transformation, Yu Jin thinks how he has never seen something like this before. With a smile, Yu Hyun questions that since he is just a monster, he can kill him now. Activating blue willow leaves, Yu Hyun jumps into the air and dashes at the dragon. Even when it tries to shoot poison at him, Yu Hyun just burns it away. Suffering a lot of injuries, it crashes to the ground. Still in the air, Yu Hyun lines up his sword, mentioning that this is for harming his brother. To his surprise, Noah activates his healing hand, swiftly recovering from all his injuries and lunges towards Yu Hyun in mid-air. Now in S rank, Noah contemplates how he can close the gap, fearing his sister's insults if he appears weak again. Ultimately, Noah's is swiftly brought down to the ground by the binding ropes conjured by Yu Hyun. Before he can strike the final blow against the dragon, Yu Jin employs his command skill, warning Yu Hyun that if he doesn't cease his attack, he will transmit all of Yu Hyun's senses to Noah. This way, Noah will have the upper hand, knowing Yu Hyun's every move in advance. Hearing this, Yu Hyun questions why Yu Jin is being so protective of Noah, mentioning that Noah attacked first. Yu Jin argues that they have already engaged in enough fighting and points out the near destruction of the building. Gazing down at the injured Noah, Yu Jin asks if he is alright, assuring him not to worry and emphasizing he and Yu Hyun are very close. Sitting up, Noah wonders why he was saved by an F rank. He ponders how he once believed that becoming an S rank would earn him recognition from his sister. However, even with a guild and a title, he still sees himself as a weakling. He mentions how he always ruins everything and becomes frightened at the mere thought of his sister, unable to focus. In tears, Noah apologizes to Yujin, attributing his weakness as the cause of their troubles. Responding with a deadpan expression, Yujin questions what Noah means by that. Yujin mentions that the problem lies not with Noah but with Riet. Draping a cloth over Noah, Yujin asserts that the way Riet treats him is unjust. It is evident that she has mistreated him, fueling his fear. As Noah continues to express his frustrations, Yujin interrupts, stating that it doesn't matter whether he is weak or strong. No one should be subjected to such treatment. Yujin continues, affirming that Noah is not weak, acknowledging his efforts in obtaining a guild and a title. He reassures Noah that he has done exceptionally well and is strong enough. Smiling gently, Yujin mentions how Noah just fought to protect him, emphasizing that a weak person wouldn't have been capable of such bravery. Wiping away his tears, Noah admits that no one has ever said that to him before. Meanwhile, Yujin wonders why no one had intervened before, considering the obvious strain in the sibling's relationship. Recognizing the hardships Noah must have endured, Yujin advises him to distance himself from Riet, at least for the time being. 
Tearfully, Noah asks if he can stay with them until he is no longer afraid of his sister. Taken aback by the request, Yujin agrees, offering his support. Observing their interaction, Yuhan remarks that he should have simply killed Noah earlier, something Peace seems to agree with. Office Song arrives promptly to retrieve Noah, and with him standing tearfully in the background, he discusses proceeding with the settlement on the following day. It seems that before arriving her officer Song had evacuated the surrounding buildings. Yu Hyun, still somewhat annoyed with office Song, throws a quick jab, but the tension is swiftly resolved. It is ultimately decided that Noah will stay with them temporarily and work as a security guard, serving as a free S-class guard to compensate for the damages incurred. Of course, Yerim forgives him quite easily, mentioning their exciting fight. She suggests they have a rematch later, with her freezing his poison using her ice abilities. Noah eagerly agrees, and Eugen wonders if this is how S-ranks typically reconcile their differences. As Noah waves goodbye to Yerim, he questions whether it's truly alright for Eugen to take in someone who attacked him right after they met. Yerim jokes, calling Eugen a fearless bunny and questioning if he truly knows the meaning of fear. Upon studying Eugen's eyes intently, Yerim contemplates whether he has been influenced by a skill or some form of manipulation. While Eugen thinks that is his skill, Eugen responds, expressing his sympathy for Noah, emphasizing that he is still young and that helping others is generally a good action. Yerim argues that this is precisely the issue with Eugen, saying that merely being in the presence of an S rank is intimidating for everyone. She discloses that she has to conceal her own energy at school to prevent her friends from feeling scared. Pointing at him, she playfully teases Eugen, calling him a hamster. Seated comfortably, she muses about Eugen's occasional peculiarities, finding him to be quite odd at times. Eugen retorts that he isn't weird. Eugen mentions that Noah is the same age as Yu Hyun, hence why Hai isn't scared of Hai. She remarks that Yujin's relationship with Yuhan is also peculiar, particularly how he speaks as if he raised Yuhan himself. Yujin maintains his gaze, revealing that he has indeed raised Yuhan ever since his preschool days. Surprised, Yerim inquires whether their parents were not on good terms during that period. Reflecting on the past, Yujin recalls that their parents were, in fact, on excellent terms. They would frequently go out together, enjoying meals and various activities. Tragically, their parents passed away during a trip they took alone. Stunned, Yerim questions if their parents simply left the brothers at home, finding it somewhat peculiar. With a wide smile, Yujin explains that as long as their parents were happy, it didn't matter. Yujin thinks about his childhood, overhearing his parents discussing Yu Hyun, mentioning how he neither cried nor laughed. Despite the hospital assuring them that nothing was wrong with Yu Hyun, their parents always felt uneasy around him. Yujin's mother even expressed that Yu Hyun didn't feel like her child. Approaching Yu Hyun's crib, Yujin wonders aloud why their parents made such remarks about him. Looking down at his brother, Yujin speaks how calm and kind Yu Hyun is. Whenever their parents asked Yujin if he wanted to go out with them, he would always inquire about Yu Hyun. Yujin was content staying at home with his brother, and his parents wondered why Yu Hyun had no effect on him. Observing how Yu Hyun spent so much time with his younger brother, their mom questioned if there was something wrong with her. Others would consider it crazy if she mentioned that Yu Hyun didn't feel like her child. Their father even confessed to being frightened of Yu Hyun. Witnessing Yujin's casual and joyful interactions with Yu Hyun, who instilled existential fear in their parents, they realized that it wasn't just Yu Hyun. Perhaps their eldest son was just as strange as his brother. From then on, the two brothers spent most of their time alone at home, receiving allowances from their parents. Holding Yu Hyun's hand during Christmas, Yujin mentions how they can celebrate Yu Hyun's birthday with just the two of them. Looking down at his brother, Yujin smiles, describing how Yu Hyun's birthday always coincides with Christmas, making it extra special. Now, as Yu Hyun observes Yujin conversing with Yerim and Noah, he thinks how his brother could have led a normal, happy life if he hadn't spent so much time taking care of him. During the night at Jupiter's Guild, Sung Hyunhee engages in a phone conversation about Noah, calling it similar to training a dog that eventually ran away, referring to Noah's loyalty toward Yujin. Hyoni confidently asserts that Yujin is undoubtedly the reason for this. On the other end of the line, a gray-haired lady expresses her hope that Yujin doesn't end up taming Noah, given his half-monster nature. Hyoni finds the idea quite amusing. When asked why he isn't upset, Hyoni explains that things aren't unfolding as he expected, making it even more entertaining. Gazing at a picture of Yujin, he expresses his desire to complain to the new owner of the dog. 
Currently, Kang Soyeon walks down the street, carrying supplies and toys for her dragon. Suddenly, she is taken aback as she witnesses a person leaping from a tall skyscraper. Prepared to save them, she is astonished when the individual transforms into a magnificent dragon and gracefully soars away. With awe in her eyes, she gazes at the dragon-human hybrid, as her possibility of becoming Yujin's sister-in-law is now completely shattered. In the sky, Noah flies alongside Blue and several other flying creatures. It turns out that Yujin, using his command skill, can share the griffin's senses with Noah, allowing him to get used to flying. Observing the scene from a nearby building, Yujin remarks that he will be able to learn a lot by observing how Blue handles the flight. He advises Noah to copy Blue's wing movements. Appreciating Noah's progress, Yujin feels the sensation of wings on his back even though he doesn't possess them. Nevertheless, the experience of flying through the sky is refreshing until he starts feeling nauseous. Amidst his discomfort, Yujin scolds the overly excited Blue, reminding him not to perform any dangerous stunts while flying. Kneeling on the roof due to his nausea, he assures Noah that he's alright. Meanwhile, Noah happily plays with Blue as Yujin takes a moment to check his status. Notably, Noah possesses a B-rank skill called Healing Hand. Unlike other healers, Noah is an S-rank, so he doesn't need to worry about getting injured. He also possesses the S-rank skill screaming without a sound, which causes his opponents to feel twice the pain he experiences. Yujin reflects on how dangerous it would have been if Yuhian had injured Noah anywhere other than his wings. Indoors, under the supervision of Yuhian and Peace, Noah activates his skill on Yujin, allowing him to borrow stats from his strength stat. Yujin punches the floor, effortlessly shattering it into bits, with cracks appearing around him. This skill, called stat borrowing, permits Noah to borrow or lend half of a stat for half an hour each day. Excitedly, Yujin commends Noah's strength despite being a healer. Yujin contemplates that if he combines his own attack skill amplification ability and the Rochester's natural enemy skill with stat borrowing, the power would be amplified four times. Since he possesses poison resistance, if Noah allows Yujin to ride him in his dragon form, most monsters would be unable to approach them, enabling them to clear high rank dungeons. Yujin praises Noah, declaring him the best, to which Noah tearfully responds that he has never received such praise before. It appears that Noah is genuinely satisfied with his life here. Additionally, Blue is also making significant progress while training with Noah. On the roof, the griffin decides to be mischievous and dives toward Peace. Seeing this, Peace transforms into his adult form and begins disciplining the misbehaving bird. Yujin has to intervene, requesting Peace to be gentle. Yujin considers that Peace might not appreciate the fact that his father is taking on more work instead of resting. Rubbing their faces together, Yujin reassures Peace that this is his job. However, a few days later, Sung Hyoni shows up again, carrying a bouquet to congratulate Blue's growth. Upon seeing him, Yujin immediately activates his command skill. As Hyoni mentions that the flowers are from Soyeong, Yujin wonders why he needed to personally deliver them. Hyoni explains that he came here to apprehend a runaway debtor as an investor. Noah, in his dragon form, lands beside Yujin, expressing his commitment to not running away and keeping his promise. He tells Hyoni not to involve Yujin in the situation. When Hyoni questions if Noah was hired as a pet, Yujin takes control of the situation, stating that he was the one who hired Noah and instructs Hyoni to discuss the debt matter with him. Yujin raises his hand, questioning what Hyoni wants in return for Noah. On GTV, the news announces that the affected guild has decided to dissolve. The reason behind the accident has been concluded as a dungeon break, triggered by the appearance of a golden dragon in the midst of the guild. Sung Hyoni, upon hearing this, reflects on how his investment is truly paying off. He contemplates how Noah's unique ability to transform into monsters is the most valuable asset. Though known hunters possess such a skill, making Noah an invaluable asset for his plans. Hyoni envisions a strategy where Noah eliminates the target, disguising it as a dungeon break. This way, he intends to eliminate all the supporting figures behind the Hashin and Breaker guilds, weakening their power. Hyoni realizes that by doing so, he will once again have Han Yujin's exceptional skills under his control. Sitting next to Yujin, Hyoni offers him a bouquet of different flowers while wondering if Yujin is even aware that he has foiled his plan. Hyoni mentions how he has invested a significant amount into Noah. Although he can't go into the details, he had gathered some information that proved useful to Noah. Hyoni reveals how he saw the potential usefulness of Noah and helped him set up his guild to distance him from Riet. Looking directly at Yujin, Hyoni mentions that Noah has now come to him. Yujin expresses surprise upon learning that the Ark Guild has been dissolved with just a phone call. Noah gazes at Yujin with determined eyes and states that he has decided to stay with him from now on. 
Hyoni acknowledges that he had planned to let Yujin believe that the Ark Guild was unrelated to his own benefit. But Yujin had found out regardless. Yujin and Noah give a dead look, seeing that Hyoni confessed this information himself. Noah speaks up, stating that as an S-class hunter, he can pay for what he owes on his own. He even offers to join them on any dungeon raids. Hyoni replies that their guild is not lacking in hunters. With a smile, Hyoni emphasizes how useful Noah is to Yujin. With Yujin's poison resistance and the ability to ride Noah in his dragon form, they could enter high-class dungeons together. Hyoni repeats that Yujin doesn't need to worry about raiding dungeons alone or dealing with weak opponents anymore. Yujin reflects on how Hyoni has seen through all his plans. Getting straight to the point, Yujin asks Hyoni what he wants. Hyoni thinks for a moment and then asks Yujin to help him three times whenever he needs it. Yujin stands up, stating that it's too vague, and suggests at least signing a contract. Hyoni mentions that he would be hurt if Yujin were to ignore him in the future, but he trusts Yujin to keep his promise. Yujin contemplates if Hyoni is insane to expect a verbal promise in return for an S-class item. While finding it a bit weird, Yujin realizes there isn't much he can do about it. To Noah's surprise, Yujin agrees to the arrangement but adds that he will reject any requests for help that he cannot fulfill or that harm others. Shaking Hyoni's hand, Yujin assures him that he won't have to worry since he doesn't intend to hurt anyone. Holding his hand, Hyoni asks if Yujin always requires a damage invalidating item like the bracelet before using his skill that doubles attack power. When Yujin confirms this, Hyoni requests him to inform him whenever Minwu creates a similar item. Now, at least Yujin is aware that Hyoni desires his skills. Chuckling inwardly, Yujin realizes he will never assist Hyoni since that item is exceedingly rare. A few days later in the Golden Smithy, Myungwoo presents three marbles to Yujin, known as Charlotte's Marbles, mentioning they are similar to the previous bracelet. Yujin notices Myungwoo's tired appearance and inquires if he ever sleeps. Glancing around, Yuhyun mentions that they will continue to use the secluded dimension of the Golden Smithy when they raid dungeons. Myungwoo states how he doesn't want anyone else entering. Yujin quickly expresses his gratitude to Myungwoo for granting Yuhyun access to the smithy. Yuhyun's purpose for coming here is to inquire if Myungwoo knows about the SSS class item called the Red Tinted Egg. It was a reward Yuhyun and Peace received for clearing the S class dungeon. Yujin remembers that it is a part of an egg series that rarely appeared before the time reversal. No one discovered its purpose since they had no reaction to it, and the eggs didn't break. He considers the possibility that Myungwu or the first spirit, Hiswar, might be able to utilize it. Gazing at his brother's emotionless face, Yujin feels annoyed, thinking that he arranged this meeting to facilitate friendship between Yuhan and Myungwu. Just then, Hismore approaches Yuhyun and sends a small flame towards the egg, causing cracks to appear on its shell. The egg shatters in a burst of flames, revealing a palm-sized red lizard. As Yuhyun looks back at Yujin's face, the little lizard leaps towards him, entering his eye momentarily before jumping back onto his hand. Handing it to Yujin, Yuhyun mentions that it was merely there for a moment, perhaps it likes the inner eye. Curious about its significance, Yujin examines its status, discovering that it is now an F-class flame spirit contracted to Han Yuhyun. Yujin contemplates how this might be the reason the eggs didn't break in the future, as they lacked any spirits at that time. He considers it another opportunity that emerged due to the time regression. Releasing purple flames from his finger, Yuhan discovers that the red lizard is completely resistant to flames. Yujin suggests that Yuhan should try taking care of it, speculating that since it originated from an SSS class egg, it may become as strong as Hismoir. Yungwu begins consoling the disheartened Hismoir, reassuring him that a small creature like the red lizard could never match his strength. Yujin thinks it was a good idea to bring Yuhan here, as he also obtained a damage invalidating item. It has been a while since Hyoni mentioned that promise. Yujin adopts a wide grin, contemplating that there is no way he will inform Hyoni about possessing this item. After all, if Yujin wants to enter a dungeon, he can do so with his own guild members. Yujin reflects on how it all begins with the subtle changes. Hyuna pays a visit to Blue, delivering a portion of ranked horse meat. Blue gazes at the large cuts of meat in her hand with affection. Yujin comments on her newly shortened hair, and she laughs, mentioning how the old folks scolded her for it. They sit together, and she mentions that baby monsters are now in high demand worldwide. Everyone is trying to acquire one and leave them with Yujin. She expresses her desire to get a monster baby as well. Yujin, looking tired, explains that he currently doesn't have the capacity for new monsters. Huda reminds him of his promise and hugs him, mentioning that he also vowed to let her ride blue when he grows up. Yujin, meanwhile, thinks to himself how a casual hug like that could potentially kill him. 
Just Jen Yujin mentions he heard she was at a new S-Class dungeon raid recently, asking what she got as rewards. Pinching his cheeks, Huna mentions that she got a really good one. Inwardly Yujin thinks how he already knows what it is. The one-time use item festival's white whale tier. It imbues ice type skill to any equipment. In the future, Huna had put it up for auction since all his skills are wind natured. But now that he has Yerim he can buy it and give it to her. Huna brings out a golden container. Yujin's eyes bulge out while she describes it as a rare item, even better than a potion, calling it an extra life. Yujin asks if she obtained something like a skill imbuing item. Huna says no, mentioning that she obtained a pair of S-Class gloves. Yujin ponders the small size of the dungeon they cleared and how the rewards have changed, something that never happened before. Huna notices his perplexed expression and asks if he has fallen in love with her. Yujin scrunches up his face, denying it. He observes her laughter and realizes that even the smallest things are different in this altered future, including her hairstyle. Yujin notices Blue's bloated belly, and Yerim inquires about what happened to him. Yujin tries to protect Noah from Huna, knowing that she will ask for a ride. He acknowledges that even the rewards for dungeon clearing can now be changed. Yujin lounges on a chair and uses his phone to look up the s rank dungeon reward ratings, finding them similar to what he knows from the future. He contemplates how the dungeon Huna cleared might have been an exception. Still, he asks Yuhan to enter a dungeon again. Despite his attempts to remain calm, the different rewards continue to bother him. While sitting in the car, he explains to Yuhyun that he needs to ask the system about Chirpai and other matters. He doesn't mention the real reason, which is his time travel and the changes in the future. He recalls discovering that no skills work on Chirpai and how she isn't growing like other monsters. He also remembers waking up in the middle of the night to see Chirpai watching Hunter-related news. Seeing how she was able to climb the sofa and switch on the TV by, he starts praising her calling her a genius and offers her a mana stone. But to his surprise Chirpai refuses to eat it. But moments later she acts stupid and starts running towards the mana stone. He asks Yuhyun in the car wondering if there is something wrong with her like multiple personality disorder. Yuhyun mentions that some monsters who grow extra heads when they mature have multiple personalities. Imagining a Chirpai with three necks and heads Yujin admits that he isn't ready for that. He cannot take Chirpai into the dungeon since she is an F-class and cannot equip any items. Peace, perched on Yujin's lap, approaches the red lizard on Yuhian's arm. He stares at the lizard, which crawls along Yuhian's shoulder in silence. Despite being an F-class, the lizard remains unharmed as long as it stays attached to Yuhian. It can even enter Yuhian's skin. Observing Yuhian's happy expression, Yujin realizes that Yuhian has also changed. Yuhian advises Yujin to stay close to him in the dungeon and Yujin praises his brother's reliability, reflecting on how everything has changed for the better since he regressed back in time. Just then, Peace jumps onto Yuhan's face, attempting to locate the lizard. Yujin thinks that at least his brother is safe, remembering the sacrifices he made in the past. Those sorrowful memories will not happen now. In the dungeon, surrounded by snow-covered mountains, Yujin remarks that this should be a desert dungeon. They don't encounter any monsters, leaving Yuhan confused about what happened here. Yujin wraps Peace around his neck like a scarf, speculating that it might be related to the system. He wonders what kind of person could change a dungeon to such an extent. Yuhan interrupts him, cautioning that the system is not always trustworthy, or it could be someone else trying to harm them. Yujin questions if Yuhan is hiding something from him. Yuhan explains he can't divulge information about them due to a contract. Suddenly, an arrow flies toward them, but it gets stuck in Yuhan's arm. Yuhian tells Yujin to take out his marble, and his piece transforms into his adult form. Yujin is astonished that the arrow pierced the arm of an S-Class hunter. A toy soldier wielding a bow emerges from the snow in the distance. The contractor's name is blurred on its status, but it's clearly an S-Class toy. More soldiers appear, surrounding them. Yujin wonders inwardly if these system bastards are up to something. As Yuhian desperately fires shots to free them from their captors, Yujin realizes that he alone won't be able to hold them all back. Suddenly, a group of s rank toy soldiers leaps at them, but a voice reverberates through the dungeon, commanding them to halt. A box materializes in mid-air, sucking all the toy soldiers into it. Then, a volleyball with an animated face appears, apologizing to Yujin about how it must have scared him again. Yujin recognizes that it's one of the entities from the system. The volleyball, introducing itself as newbie, asks Yujin to call it by that name. Yujin, fuming, angrily starts dribbling the volleyball, upset that it had shot an arrow into his brother's arm. Nubi retorts that it's partly his brother's fault. Yujin turns around and sees Yuhan and Peace surrounded by a barrier. 
Newbie explains that they are blocked because they are not allowed to hear the conversation taking place. Newbie reveals that this place was specifically designed for honey, and it can't allow the dungeon to be completely burned down, unlike last time. Eugen ponders how back then, the system energy had teleported him away without any explanation. Using a hand gesture, Yujin reassures Yuhun that everything is alright. The volleyball apologizes for attacking Yuhun, mentioning that Yuhun's involvement with the entities cannot be disclosed. Remembering Yuhun's cryptic comment, Yujin anxiously asks if it's some kind of cult. Newbie cryptically mentions that they can't reveal much but assures Yujin that these individuals won't be able to do anything to him or his brother directly. Direct force is against the rules. With that, Yujin starts stretching the volleyball, expressing how these entities have already broken the rules multiple times. Sensing a sudden shift in the dungeon, the volleyball warns Yujin that talking about them is dangerous and requests him to refrain from asking further questions. Yujin realizes that the force after Yuhian is also an enemy of the system. He wonders if they can even fight against them and how his brother got involved in the first place. The volleyball reassures him, stating that they will be alright as long as they stick together, emphasizing Honey's safety is their priority. Then, he asks about Chirpai, noting that her status window seems a bit broken. Newbie asks if Yujin is certain that Chirpai is affected by his influence. Yujin mentions that the keyword worked successfully, and Newbie requests him to bring her next time. Newbie adds that they will delete her if she becomes a problem, but Yujin throws the volleyball away, stating there's no reason to harm her. Newbie comments that if it's a problem, they should get rid of Chirpai. Yujin wonders if these system entities are psychopaths. Doubting whether he can trust them, he realizes that the more answers he receives, the more anxious he becomes. Recalling the story of a deity with a purpose but devoid of human emotions, granting twisted wishes to humans, Yujin realizes that these system entities had already scammed him once with the wish stone. Curious about the altered reward of an S-class dungeon, which was different from what he knew in his past life, Yujin ponders how, at least this time, things are better. Nubi asks if the reward he remembered was a one-time use item, suggesting that it might have been changed if it was used. Yujin argues that since he turned back time, even if it was a one-time use item, it should still be unused. Nubi mentions that just because Yujin turned back time doesn't mean that the things that happened didn't happen. Stunned, Yujin is at a loss for words. Newbie continues to explain the concept, comparing it to overriding data. The future Yujin witness doesn't disappear, it is simply overwritten. Since most beings remain identical, the system can merge their information seamlessly. As Yujin regresses, he has overwritten the information from five years in the future onto the present. For others, their present information overwrites their original future. The future doesn't vanish, it is merely overwritten. Usually, beings are unaware that they are being overwritten in this manner. However, any information excluded from the world's data before turning back time will be considered deleted and cut off from the world, including the deceased future Yuhin. In such cases, their information isn't overwritten but instead a new clone of the person is created. Taking a moment to comprehend what he has just heard, Yujin realizes that the 25-year-old Yuhian from the future, who suffered alone for eight years and died protecting him, will still have gone through all that, and his lifeless body will remain in the dungeon where Yujin left him, disconnected from this world. Ignoring Nubi's words, Yujin walks up to the barrier that Yuhian is trapped in, demanding that Nubi let him out. Shouting angrily, he questions why they would separate him from his brother, leaving him all alone in such a place. Nubi mentions that their time is running out anyway, and the barrier disappears. As Yujin holds his head down, Yuhyun rushes up to him, asking if the conversation is over. Nubi vanishes while mentioning that Yujin only needs to knock on the gate three times, and then he will be able to return to this place again. Holding his brother's shoulder, Yujin quietly apologizes with his head down, thinking how cold Yuhian must have felt. Yuhian starts explaining that as an S-class, he doesn't easily feel cold, only to stand silent, when Yujin hugs him tightly, apologizing repeatedly. Yujin wonders if he regressed too quickly, thinking that he should have at least begged them to bring back his brother using the wishing stone. He wonders if his little brother's body, who died saving him, has already been cut off from this world, meaning that he may still be abandoned somewhere. In his room, we see shoes and backpack thrown on the floor as Eugen lies down, contemplating his brother's suffering and struggle to protect him for eight years, only to die alone. He realizes how naive he was to think that everything from his past life would be nullified. Peace enters the room, expressing concern, and Eugen gets up, holding Peace and asking if he's worried about him and assuring him that he's alright now. Hugging Peace tightly, he resolves to be okay this time and focuses on the present. 
he suspects that there are suspicious individuals involved with his still alive brother, a group powerful enough for the system to be wary of. Yuhyun hasn't answered any of his questions on the ride back, and he only received a fragment of Yuhyun's memories through final gratitude. Taking out his phone, Yujin thinks of the only person who might be aware of these things. As the call connects, he asks Hyoni if he knows of a cult similar to Confucianism. Hearing us Hyoni's hesitation, mentioning how Yuhyun will be angry if Yujin gets involved by asking that question. Yujin thinks how Sung Hyoni has always been suspicious, even before his regression and that he would likely have knowledge about it. Yujin assures Hyuni that if he doesn't answer, Yujin will get angry. Laughing, Hyuni remarks that Yujin is more dangerous when he's angry. He hints that he can't tell him directly but can show him. Hyuni advises Yujin to prepare the flag nullifying items and his attack reinforcement skill. Yujin asks what if everything is already prepared, to which Hyuni replies that they will have to enter a high-class dungeon to start fishing. The next day, Yuhyun is surprised to hear that Yujin is going to an A-class dungeon. Yujin makes an excuse, saying he has become interested in dungeon ruins and that Hyoni knows of a dungeon with fortress wall remains. Yuhyun asks to accompany him, but Yujin waves him off, mentioning that it's just like a picnic. Yujin recalls Hyoni's words from the previous night, emphasizing that they shouldn't draw too much attention, as the group won't get involved if it's too obvious, like with Yuhyun. Although Yujin doesn't fully understand what Hyoni means by bait, he has already decided to reject Yuhyun's offer. He mentions that Noah will be accompanying him. Yuhyun counters, questioning what if it's a trap. Yujin argues that no enemy would put so much effort into killing an F-class hunter that they could easily defeat. Besides, it won't be a dungeon belonging to the Jupiter Guild but one associated with Sudom's Guild. Sudom is the last S-class hunter from the nation whom Yujin has yet to meet. It is the guild Yoon kyung -soo belongs to. Yujin has always been curious since Yoon kyung -soo never came to see him along with the other S-class hunters. After introducing himself as Yujin, he eagerly reaches out to shake Yoon's hand. But Yoon steps back, mentioning that he might hurt Yujin or something. Standing behind them at the gate, Yoon nonchalantly states that they are only lending them the dungeon, so he doesn't care if they enter or not. Yoon tells Yujin to let his brother know that he didn't even touch him, so he can stop nagging. Reflecting on Yoon's behavior, Yujin says that Sudom's guild must be displeased with the World's Edge guild. Hyoni mentions that it's more likely that they are hated. Surprised, Yujin asks why they are entering Sudom's dungeon. Hyoni explains that since it's Sudom's guild, it's likely that the group will try to attack them inside. He speculates that the group might have even gained some extra support to ensure their victory. With a smirk, Hyoni mentions that their goal this time is to lure out that support. Shocked, Yujin realizes that they are willingly going into an anticipated attack and that it would be better to stay alert. Hyoni then hands over a picnic basket to Yujin, much to his confusion. Mentioning that he brought cake as well, Hyoni promises that he'll be a good tour guide and says that this will be fun. Yujin thinks to himself that he's probably safe with Hyoni by his side, no matter who comes to attack. Meanwhile, outside the Mexico Hunter Association, a crowd protests the lack of safety measures in countryside dungeons. Some of them criticize the emigration of high-class hunters, shouting about there being only two S ranks currently present in the capital. Inside, Riet stands with her luggage wearing Mexican clothing, instructing the staff to put in a complaint to the Korean Hunter Association. She mentions that an entry ban just for some illegal contracts is too harsh. While the staff mention that they don't have the power to do something like that, they point to the crowd, speaking that they are already in a lot of trouble. Riet asks the staff to sneak in her documents while everything is chaotic. Just as the staffer is about to contact the higher-ups, there is an explosion at the association building. Nonchalantly standing there, Riet observes the situation unfold. It turns out that some members of the public have arrived in a fire truck, chanting that the dungeon break is God's will, and that they should not resist it. Riet steps back as the staffer mentions how the terrorists have attacked again. With a swift motion, Riet throws her robe onto a staff member and assures them that she'll take care of the situation. But in return, they have to arrange her transportation to Korea. Standing near them, she activates her eternal severance skill and swiftly deals with the terrorists. When she turns around, she sees the previously dead hunters walking towards her, each one asking her to sign the contract. Hearing their pleas, Riet mentions how she warned them to stay away from her and her brother. Just then, she hears a commanding voice ordering the firstborn of the cursed poison dragon. Dio vouches, causing her to kneel under the order. Her knees buckle under the pressure, and one of the corpses refers to her as the blood of curse and poison, asking her to obey. 
The voice orders her to kill Jupiter Guild Sung Hyun Yi and bring back Han Yu Hyun's brother. With an angry glare at being ordered around, Riet instantly kills the remaining corpses. In a dazed state, she speaks that she can't go to Korea right now, even if she wants to. In the next moment, MKC's guildmaster, Chu Siokwin, enters the room, mentioning that he can help her with that. With a smile, he reveals that he has prepared a nearby jet, just like the talking corpse told him to. Inside Sudom's a class dungeon, the trio has successfully eliminated the nearby monsters. Floating in the air, Noah is concerned about leaving Yujin and Hyoni alone, as Yujin had mentioned that they had important matters to discuss. Noah wonders what kind of serious and dangerous conversation could be taking place in his absence. On the ground, overlooking the lake, Hyoni provides Yujin with information about the parameters and the monsters inhabiting the lake. With a sandwich in his mouth, Yujin casually asks Hyoni how he obtained that information. Hyoni jokingly responds that he made it up on the spot, with Yujin replying that he is more of a fraud than a tour guide. Yujin mentions that he would have complained to the tour department if they had customer service in the dungeon. Playing along, Hyoni pretends to be from the Jupiter's customer service. While Yujin ponders if this is really the kind of conversation he should be having with the world's strongest man, he asks if Sudom will actually show up if they just wander around. Hyoni replies that they will have to wait and see, as the dungeon gate is about to close soon. Yujin has already realized that Hyoni is using him as bait. As they observe the picnic basket, Yujin inquires why there is a grudge between World's Edge and Sudom, and if something happened between them and Yuhyun. Hyoni explains that it occurred when Yuhyun had just awakened, and Yoon Kyung Soo underestimated him, facing the consequences. Chuckling to himself, Hyoni mentions how entertaining it was to witness an S class hunter being hospitalized. Yujin, munching on his food, acknowledges that it is simply the consequence of his own actions. Hyoni remarks that Yujin's response is funny as well. Hyoni continues to explain that since then, every time they met, Yuhyun acted as if he would kill Yoon Kyung Soo, causing Sudom to back down. This is the main reason why Sudom Guild hasn't been able to grow much. Hyoni adds that a subordinate dog finds it difficult to bare its teeth, which is why Yuhyun agreed to send Yujin here. Looking at his pocket watch, Hyoni comments that it would be a different story if that group was supporting Sudom. Observing Hyoni closely, Yujin realizes that Hyoni seems to be more deeply connected to the group than Yuhan. This leads him to believe that there is no guarantee Hyoni isn't also working for them. In the same moment, Hyoni mentions that the group also wants to kill him. Surprised, Yujin responds that he thought Hyoni was on their side. He explains that he does have a contract with them and originally intended to extract information before leaving. But their attitude forced him to make a full turn. Yujin contemplates how a few years later, Hyoni would have betrayed the group, and since the group is outside this world, they remembered that information and turned their back on Hyoni first. Hyoni mentions that Yujin still came here even if he thought Hyoni was on their side. Suddenly, Noah alerts them that people are approaching. It turns out to be members of Sudom Guild along with MKC Guildmaster Chu Siokwin. Standing next to Noah, Yujin watches as Hyoni steps forward, his lightning chains crackling around him, expressing his disappointment that they underestimated him. Yun Kyung Soo presents a sealing item that bans the use of electricity-based skills in the area, causing the lightning to disappear from Hyoni's chains. Yujin is surprised to see this and Hyoni remarks that he will enjoy himself a little since they have such a cool item. Yujin offers to amplify his attack skill, but Hyoni declines, stating that he can handle it on his own. Hyoni asks Yujin to use his sense-sharing skill, mentioning that he will show him something great. Jumping down, Hyoni unleashes his powers, causing the members of Sudom Guild to be frightened by the immense pressure he exudes. Hyung Su urges them to follow their practice plan. First, they activate a dome shield around themselves, and then all the members activate their buffs on Chu Siokwin amplifying his stats and skills multiple times. His attack power increases by 30%, dexterity by 55%, and stamina by 45%. With veins appearing on his face and a bright purple aura surrounding him, Chu Siokwin attacks while Hyoni smiles, mentioning that it has been 10 years since their last fight. Yujin mounts Noah and activates his command skill, assuring Noah that there is no need to worry and that Hyoni is just playing with his opponent. Inwardly, Yujin is astonished by what he sees through Hyoni's eyes. It seems that Sung Hyoni can predict the opponent's movements and attacks. Yujin realizes that there is no way Siokwin will win against a skill like that. He comprehends the true power of Hyoni's battle foresight skill, which allows him to predict the opponent's movements and attacks. Yujin now understands why Hyoni is so overpowered. 
On the floor, Hyoni effortlessly evades Seokwon's attacks. Yujin ponders if he can acquire that skill, envisioning a legion of S-class members who would synergize well with his battle foresight skill. With the beast mounts, they could conquer any dungeon with ease. Gripping his chest, Yujin's crazed expression reveals his intense desire for that skill, questioning why it had to fall into the hands of someone like Hyoni. Meanwhile, back on the ground, Yoon kyung su orders the long-range members to join the assault. Hyoni manipulates his chains as they quickly disappear into the ground. In a matter of seconds, the support team members are mercilessly slain by the chains merging form the ground near them. As all the buffs are lifted from Choi Seokwon, Hyoni lands a direct blow on his face. Standing over the unconscious body of Seokwon, Hyoni comments that if this is all they have, he will be disappointed. Suddenly sensing something, Hyoni shouts at Noah to look behind him. Unfortunately, Noah and Yujin are caught off guard as Riet appears out of nowhere and kicks Noah aside. In midair, Riet seizes Yujin, while Hyoni remarks that this was unexpected. Wearing an emotionless expression, Riet states that she has unfinished business to attend to and has been ordered to eliminate Hyoni and take Yujin with her. As Yujin realizes that she called him by his name, he speculates that she might be either brainwashed or under the influence of a psychological skill. Seizing her chance, Yujin embraces Riet tightly around her abdomen. Tears well up in his eyes as he gazes up at her dramatically, urging her to gather herself together. He mentions that she should do it for their sake, emphasizing their deep friendship and the cherished memories they share. Everyone is stunned to hear him speak of their friendship and the bond they have. Having had enough, Riet flings Noah aside and reaches out to grab Yujin's hand. Desperately, Yujin wishes in his mind for something to break the controlling effect over Riet, contemplating all the skills he has. Suddenly, a radiant golden glow envelops them both. As they open their eyes, Yujin's face is gently held by Riet, who looks at him with a tender expression. She affectionately addresses him as honey and thanks him for helping her regain clarity. Blushing, she acknowledges that he saved her. As he mentions that he is glad to have her back she starts hugging him. But much to his astonishment, Riet grabs his head and licks his face mentioning that she can't ignore this amusing situation anymore. As she starts transforming onto her dragon firm she speaks how at five years of age her dream was to become an evil dragon kike the one she saw in AA book and kidnap a princess. Looking at the huge dark dragon with spikes all around it and an evil red gleam in his eyes, supporting a crazed smile that looks terrifying. Yujin shouts how her dragon is nothing like her twins. Carrying him through the air she calls him babe, asking him to shout for a prince to save him. Reaching the castle in the distance Riet shouts that she will be taking the princess with her. If anyone wants him back they will have to reach the top of the tower. While Yoon kyung su is standing wide-eyed at what happened Hyoni smiles, speaking that this is just like a traditional fairy tale. Inside the tower, sitting on the old bed, Yujin tries to come to terms with what has just happened. Reverting back to her human form, Riet asks him if he feels comfortable enough. Eugen closes his eyes and tells her to put on some clothes, only to realize that she has transformed back alongside her clothes. Riet mentions that she only needs to use the cursed skill, and upon hearing this, Eugen asks her to teach it to Noah as well. Sitting beside him, she remarks how it feels like they're in a great role-playing adventure, with Eugen playing the part of a princess. Eugen, devoid of emotion, congratulates her on achieving her dream. She looks at him with a slightly crazed expression and asks if she is supposed to eat him after the kidnapping. Eugen responds that they need to wait for someone to come and save him first. He then asks if she also has a contract with the cult. Confused, Riet answers in the negative. Eugen refers to how she mentioned following orders before. She starts thinking and mentions how she has consistently rejected the cult's offers. They tried to entice her with information and items when she awakened, but she told them to screw off. She considers it a lame offer. However, they later attempted to use her brother against her. For a while, they left her alone after she defeated them. But recently, they appeared again, referring to her as the cursed dragon Dio Valchus's firstborn and giving her orders. Somehow, she found herself following their commands. Eugen speculates that it may be because of her title. Riet mentions that she senses a similar cursed poison dragon aura from them as she does from Eugen. Eugen realizes that if it's the curse of a cursed poison dragon holding Riet in its grasp, his curse resistance would have twice the effect. It's a stroke of luck that she managed to break free. Just then, she pushes Eugen onto the bed and crawls over him, remarking how her head is clearer now, thanks to him, and how she always knew he was special. Eugen asks her to get off him, and she suggests they pick up where they left off last time. Seeing the infatuated look on her face, Eugen tells her to transform back into a dragon and go guard the tower or something. 
She accuses him of having a unique fetish and accuses him of enjoying her dragon form more. At that moment, Hyoni bursts through the door with Noah, exclaiming that he has come to save the princess. Looking at the two on the bed, Hyoni asks with a disappointed expression if it was all just an 18 plus thing disguised as a fairy tale. Observing the lightning coating his chains, Riet guesses that he can probably use his skills again. Yujin watches as the two start fighting, calling them psychos and mentioning that they will destroy the whole castle in the process. Thankfully, he is able to leave before that happens, thanks to Noah. From a distance, they watch as the two wreck the entire castle with their flashy attacks. Noah comments that they are just having fun and that no one will die or anything. He adds that it would have been worse if his sister hadn't come to her senses. Letting out a sigh, Yujin expresses gratitude for his luck, considering that the opponent happens to be a cursed dragon. However, suddenly his expression turns grim, contemplating whether it is merely a coincidence or not. After all, he has encountered numerous species of cursed poison dragons lately. He encountered Blackie during his kidnapping, then the Dio Valshisis twins, the current enemies lurking in the shadows, and the rochsters who appeared before his regression. Drawing a conclusion with widened eyes, he hurriedly asks Noah to recount the details of the dungeon he entered to earn the Dio Valshisis title. Amidst the crumbling rubble and engulfed in flames, Riet swiftly consumes a potion, expressing satisfaction, stating that it has been a while since she last fought like this. Summoning the prince to come forth, Hyoni leaps down from above, clutching his poisoned arm and realizing the limitations of an antidote item. Even with his battle foresight, he is unable to evade the insidious poison fog. If the other S-classes and Dryad had united to attack him, the situation would have become perilous. Just then, he is taken aback as Yujin calls out from Noah's back, asking Hyoni to catch him. Startled, Hyoni releases a shudder as Yujin swiftly shares his poison resistance with him, instantly curing his arm. Surprised by this turn of events, Hyoni realizes that Yujin's actions have not only neutralized the poison but also freed Riet from her subservience. Consequently, an F-class ruined the group's plan single-handedly. Yujin then proceeds to inquire Hyoni about the information the group had given him to lure Noah into the dungeon. Elaborating further, Yujin explains that the cult individual attempted to make Riet their subordinate instead of Hyoni. However, when she learned that her brother was involved, she rejected his offer. The dungeon with the cursed poison dragon was devised to exploit the siblings' unique abilities through their titles. They orchestrated the release of information, counting on Hyoni to fall into their trap. Reflecting on recent events, Yujin asks Hyoni if he already suspected that things will turn out this way. Hyoni shakes his head, clarifying that he isn't a prophet. Yujin ponders how Noah had informed him about a high-ranking cursed poison dragon appearing in the dungeon he had visited. It is similar to Rochester's appearance in Yujin's own dungeon before his regression in time. Additionally, Han Yuhan's arrival to rescue Yujin suggests that he might have foreseen something similar occurring. Lost in thought, Yujin urges Hyoni to share everything he knows about the group, wondering whether the dungeon where Yuhan vanished was also changed by this same group. As Yujin questions Hyoni, Riet quietly approaches from behind and embraces Noah by the neck. She asks what he is scared of, assuring him that she has already forgiven him for what transpired. In a composed voice, Noah responds, suggesting that she should be the one seeking forgiveness. Chuckling at the scene unfolding below, Riet mentions that they shouldn't disturb them as they are engaged in an important conversation. On the ground, Yujin raises his voice, stating that if Hyoni can't tell him anything due to the contract, he will nullify it on his behalf. Taking hold of Yujin's coat, Hyoni reveals that he had suspected Yujin possessed curse resistance as well. He deduced this because Riet wouldn't have come to Korea without a significant reason. Speculating aloud, he suggests that Yujin's skill is probably an SSS or L rank. Reluctantly, Yujin confirms that it's an L rank skill, but Hyoni interrupts him, remarking that it won't be enough. Hyoni raises his hand, and a deep red contract materializes between the two. He explains that the contract is of L rank and that only equal rank resistances can nullify it. He mentions that his right arm and right eye are at risk. A stunned Suyon asks why he would agree to such a contract, while Noah and Riet look at the contract in surprise, with Riet muttering that it is stronger than the contract she creates. Hyoni remarks that he would have been safe as long as he kept his mouth shut. Yujin speculates if those bastards made the same contract with Yuhyun. Yujin shouts that his skill's effect is doubled when used against cursed poison dragons. Hyoni cuts him off, acknowledging the impressiveness of the skill, but questions if Yujin is certain it will work, expressing his displeasure at being treated like a lab rat. Yujin declares that he will take responsibility, vowing to do whatever he can to compensate Hyoni if anything goes wrong. 
With his face darkening and his eyes turning red, Hyoni grabs his neck, stating that he appreciates Yujin but not enough to sacrifice parts of his body. In the face of Hyoni's strong intimidation, Yujin's fear resistance activates, and he clings to Hyoni's coat, noting that it's only an arm and an eye at risk, not even his life. With a smile, Yujin reminds Hyoni that he signed the contract to avoid living in ignorance. Yujin admits that he himself is hiding many secrets from Hyoni. After a few seconds, Hyoni smirks and releases Yujin. He mentions how it has been a while since he gambled, and he feels nervous. He pushes the contract towards Yujin but at the last moment tells him to remember that he risked his arm and eye for him. Narrowing his eyes, he mentions that he looks forward to seeing how Yujin will repay this debt. Holding on to the contract, Yujin assures Hyoni that he won't forget. With the contract in one hand, Yujin places his other hand on Hyoni's shoulder. Hyoni looks up at him, asking what Yujin would do if there were parents who desired for the world to end and had a child willing to fulfill that dream. Confused, Yujin asks why Hyoni is suddenly bringing this up. Hyoni clasps his hands together, explaining that it is their goal and how he would explain them. They cannot directly intervene, so they use dungeons and items as bait to recruit subordinates through contracts. That's how they increase their influence in the world, leading it towards destruction as nature intended. Yujin is taken aback, asking why anyone would sign such a contract. With a sad smile, Hyoni mentions that the world is already collapsing inwardly, and it will eventually reach its end. There are too many dungeons appearing, and the monsters are becoming more powerful. With his eyes now resolute, Hyoni states that the group promised to help him leave the world if he assists them. It's like a lifeboat, do as they say in exchange for safety. As the contract begins to react, Hyoni strengthens his resolve, stating that acquiring subordinates, hastening the world's destruction and eliminating the key interrupting this process is the goal of the so-called final piety addicts. Reacting to his words, the bodily harm curse activates due to the violation of the contract. At the same time, Yujin's curse resistance also activates, displaying a notification window that all skill effects will be doubled since the enemy is the cursed poison dragon king's master. Moments later, Hyoni raises his still intact right arm, saying that he is fine. He mentions that Yujin has won the gamble. But Yujin seems to ignore his words, consumed by the fact that this master is responsible for the lizard that tore Yuhian apart. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed and if you did make sure to subscribe to not miss any future content. If you haven't watched part 1 to 4 go watch it, link in the description. Enjoy. Yujin suspects that the skill effects of Rao Cheetah's Bane are active, doubling the impact of his curse resistance skill. A notification reveals their opponent as the venomous cursed Dragon King's master, although its name remains undisclosed. Yujin surveys his limbs, relieved that he hasn't lost an arm or an eye in the process. He's on the verge of announcing their victory, but a glimpse of Yujin's expression halts him. Yujin's intense glare hints at his belief that the venomous cursed Dragon King's master indeed exists, the mastermind behind the lizard that claimed his brother's life. Yujin turns to Huni, curious if the filial piety addicts have also coerced his brother into becoming their subordinate. Huni clarifies that Yu Hun isn't exactly a subordinate, as he severed contact with them. Puzzled by Yu Hun's limited involvement, Huni now comprehends that it's likely due to Yujin. Huni firmly believes that Yu Hun wouldn't abandon his older brother, especially given Yujin's SF rank status. He further speculates that Yu Hun may have distanced himself after realizing the risks involved. Yujin nods in agreement as Huni's words strike a chord. Memories of Yu Hyun keeping his distance and his confession about not wanting to burden his older brother resonate with Yujin. He realizes that Yu Hyun had his best interests at heart. Huni's commitment, symbolized by the sacrifice of his eye and arm to the filial piety addicts, and Riet's difficult choices, driven by threats against her brother, underscore the complexity of the situation. In this context, Riet's decisions appear more prudent than Yu Hyun's. Yu Jin reflects on those he knows and concludes that Yu Hyun must have refrained from involving Yu Jin in his struggles even after cutting ties with the filial piety addicts. Yu Hyun likely understood that Yu Jin's well-being remained at risk. Yu Jin is touched by his brother's protective stance. Yu Jin's thoughts are abruptly interrupted when a lizard-like hand ensnares his leg, inflicting an injury. A brilliant burst of explosive light follows, revealing a humanoid dragon-like creature emerging from the ground. It looms menacingly over Yujin. Yujin attributes this dire situation to the shattered contract. He directs a fierce glare at the creature, brimming with determination to vanquish the formidable foe before him. Riet rushes toward Yujin, urging him to stay back. She engages the dragon, but in an instant, the creature shifts its position. 
Its tail lashes out, targeting Riet. Noah calls out to Yujin, but Yujin vehemently instructs him to keep his distance. Yujin finds himself grappling with a challenge that even an S-ranker would find daunting. Yujin discerns that their adversary is a tier 2 ancient dragon of curse and poison, known as Vicus, classified as SS class. He ponders whether this species too was dispatched by the enigmatic lizard master. Before subduing this formidable foe, Yujin fixes the creature with a piercing gaze, his golden eyes ablaze with determination to do whatever it takes to eliminate it. Yujin introduces everyone to the stern mother Hendril Sergeant's skill, experiencing its effects for the first time. Simultaneously, Huni acknowledges that relying solely on this skill won't suffice, even with his utilization of battle foresight. His doubts persist until he observes Yujin, who latches onto the enemy's leg, struggling to apply the same skill to their formidable adversary. Yujin's intent is clear. He aims to link the other three ancient dragons with Vicus, sharing their movements and senses. However, Vicus initially rejects the skill, subjecting Yujin to the repercussions of this rejection. Despite the pain, Yujin persists and attempts to apply the skill once more, coupling it with Rao Cheetah's bane to compel the dragon's acceptance. Vicus resists once again, but Yujin remains resolute, repeatedly employing the skill until, at last, it takes hold. Yujin issues a fervent command to his allies through their shared connection urging them to unite their efforts and vanquish Vicus. Thrown off balance in the battle, Yujin watches as the three S-rankers remain steadfast in their determination to defeat Vicus. The battle rages on, with each of them unleashing their full arsenal to overcome the formidable ancient dragon. All three charge at once, transforming the skirmish into a coordinated assault. Riet adopts a dragon-like form, unleashing a barrage of attacks, cognizant of her inability to prevail single-handedly. Huni intervenes, deploying his chains to halt Vicuse's attacks, before launching an electrifying counterattack. Vicuse, however, does not falter. Instead, it crouches down, building up energy, and releases a toxic fog like assault. Recognizing the impending danger, Riet understands that her poison resistance won't last long. Fortunately, Noah intervenes, using his healing hand to mend Riet's poison state. Noah's assistance stems from the exigencies of their current situation, not forgiveness. Riet acknowledges Noah's growth, remarking on how he has matured. Puny watches the exchange between them, relieved that they have bought themselves more time. Eugen requests Huni's aid in removing the claws embedded in his leg. Huni suggests using painkillers, but Eugen declines due to the necessity of maintaining his resistance to poison particularly amidst the toxic fog. Huni grapples with the dilemma, considering Eugen's pain threshold. Frustration mounts within Eugen as he urges Huni to extract the claws, instructing him to wake him if he faints from the excruciating pain. In preparation, Eugen bites down on his sleeve, bracing himself for the impending ordeal. Yuhyun contributes to the treatment by applying a healing potion to Eugen's injured leg, advising him to rest. Yujin implores his brother to hide for safety, but Yuhyun adamantly refuses, citing Yujin's inherent stubbornness. Yujin remains resolute in his intention to aid in vanquishing the enemy lizard. To aid in their strategy, Yujin retrieves the Shalos beads from his inventory, explaining their functionality, and highlighting that there are still 17 minutes remaining. Yujin speculates that Huni can conclude the battle within the next 10 minutes or more. Huni, intrigued by Yujin's actions and demeanor, observes the unfolding events with a sense of curiosity. Amidst the gravity of the situation, Huni's inquisitiveness adds a unique dimension to the atmosphere. Yujin and Huni arrive on the battlefield, with Huni holding Yujin securely around the waist. Yujin surprises Noah by requesting some mana stats, to which Yujin responds reassuringly, sharing his skill with Huni. They both marvel at the newfound surge of power, and Huni is informed that they can use Yujin as a shield while doubling their attacks. Yujin elaborates on how the skill sharing operates, emphasizing the necessity of maintaining physical contact. Abruptly, Huni raises an unexpected query, asking if Yujin can dance, leaving Yujin bewildered. Huni rationalizes that dancing can foster teamwork prompting Yujin to admit his lack of dancing skills. Noah intervenes by activating stat rental, sharing his mana stats. Yujin, however, laments that he doesn't have the luxury to learn to dance amidst their dire circumstances. Although Huni's chains are referred to as secrets chains, for simplicity, we continue to use the term chains. Riet commends the remarkable release of power, while Huni revels in the satisfaction of unleashing such immense energy in a single blast. Eugen expresses surprise that their adversary still stands resolute despite the inflicted damage. Vicus utters indecipherable words in an unfamiliar language and prepares to charge at them. 
Eugen succumbs to panic, but Huni steadies him, suggesting they maintain composure. Undeterred, Vicus persists in its assault. Huni seizes Eugen's arm, prompting an unconventional response, they begin to dance, executing even famous dance moves. In the midst of the dynamic dance, Eugen and Huni adeptly evade Vicus's relentless attacks. Eugen strategically embeds needles on the lizard's back, explaining the phenomenon of electricity losing impact when discharged into the open air. While Eugen grapples with a degree of agitation, Huni remains the picture of tranquility. Riet discerns their tactical maneuver and springs into action. She retrieves a sword from her inventory and invokes Eternity's severance, thrusting the blade into the enemy's shoulder. Noah initially harbors doubts, but he soon comprehends the strategy's intent, concentrating the electricity to amplify its effectiveness. Huni ascends into the air, enveloped by his electrified chains. Nearby, Eugen alights on the ground, urging Huni to unleash his fiery sword. Gracefully, Huni assumes a ballroom pose, raising Eugen into the air. He channels electricity through his chains, directing it towards Vicus. The culmination of their combined might gives birth to a blinding burst of light that shatters the earth beneath them. They gently touch down, and Eugen assesses the scorched lizard before them, pondering whether the battle has finally reached its conclusion. Eugen initially assumes that the discharged electricity was weaker, but a sudden realization dawns upon him. It wasn't weaker. Instead, it had been concentrated at a single point, sending the full force of the electricity coursing through their adversary. Vicus responds with a thunderous roar, causing Eugen to flinch, and in an instant, the dragon clamps its fangs onto the ground. With caution, Riet approaches the seemingly lifeless lizard, inspecting it for any signs of lingering danger. She turns to Eugen, inquisitive about the skill he employed. However, the fallen dragon's claws swipe unexpectedly in Riet's direction, narrowly missing her as she leaps away. Noah watches with concern for his sister, while Riet voices her disbelief at the enemy's enduring resilience. It appears that whenever the cult is involved, instances of zombie-like tenacity become more prevalent. Huni ponders the nature of Vicus's movements, attributing them to sheer willpower, yet Eugen holds a divergent viewpoint. Eugen perceives the enemy not as an entity driven by will, but rather as a cursed puppet compelled to carry out orders. Huni proceeds to discharge another surge of electricity at the enemy, causing it to convulse further. Eugen contemplates how his brother became entangled with such enigmatic beings. As Vicus inches closer, uttering incomprehensible words, Huni expresses concerns regarding safety. Eugen assures him that they are secure, as the enemy lacks the strength to stand. Kneeling before Vicus, Eugen activates the valuable skill known as the Stern Mother Hendral Sergeant, which manifests as ethereal purple wisps enveloping him. Eugen finds himself utterly taken aback by the sudden turn of events, his senses enveloped in darkness as he calls out for his companions. The ground beneath him is strewn with dark remnants, which, upon closer inspection, resemble the remains of dragons. Shocked and bewildered, Eugen swiftly rises to his feet his gaze scanning the enigmatic surroundings. Suddenly, a voice slices through the eerie silence, explaining the overlap of their consciousness in that singular moment. The speaker materializes as a towering figure adorned with four penetrating eyes and expansive wings. This figure seems almost like a ruler, seated upon a throne-like structure, with a colossal dragon looming ominously in the backdrop. He remarks on Eugen's unexpected arrival and proceeds to cast blame upon Eugen for the disruption of his grand designs. The mysterious figure subtly alludes to Vicus, prompting Eugen to cautiously inquire if he is, indeed, the master of the venomous cursed dragon. Approaching the four-eyed enigma with care, Eugen raises questions about the alleged plot to send Rachidas to assassinate his younger brother, Yuhyun. Rather than delivering a direct response, the figure raises a commanding finger, summoning forth a massive, clawed hand that swiftly subdues Eugen, forcing him to collapse onto the ground. The enigmatic being initiates a discourse about the demise of the Union, admitting that he hadn't foreseen such an outcome. Yet, he continues to evade Eugen's inquiries, and given the unfolding circumstances, it becomes increasingly apparent that this four-eyed figure has orchestrated the intricate web of events leading to this moment. With an unsettling grip on Eugen's face, the four-eyed figure unveils that the dungeon was meticulously devised to eradicate Eugen, solely due to his role as the pivotal reason for Yuhian's refusal to cooperate with their intentions. Eugen's perplexity deepens, and he seeks further clarification. The four-eyed entity expounds upon how Yuhian elected death because Eugen had survived. These words inflict a profound wound upon Eugen, causing him to clench his fists in a turmoil of frustration. The figure continues to taunt him, implying that if not for Eugen's interference, both brothers might have endured. 
The four-eyed figure paints a vivid picture of Yujin as an obstacle in his brother's path and suggests that Yuhan might have retained autonomy even without entering into a binding contract. He piles on the guilt, asserting that Yujin's very existence weighed heavily on Yuhan's shoulders, painting Yujin as a burden responsible for his brother's demise and his own continued existence. These cutting words serve as a catalyst for a rush of memories surging through Yujin's mind. Memories of abandonment by his brother due to his F-class status, memories of admonishments from his brother, and the indelible memory of his brother's tragic death. Yujin, overwhelmed by guilt and grief, admits that he doesn't believe he deserves to continue living. In a poignant moment, he clutches the leg of the four-eyed figure, raising his gaze to meet the enigma's eyes. Eugen elucidates that this very sentiment fuels his relentless pursuit of vengeance against the master of the lizard responsible for his brother Yuhian's demise. In a heartbeat, the narrative pivots from Eugen's quest for redemption to an unyielding thirst for vengeance. The four-eyed figure scoffs at Eugen's standing as an F-ranker, disparaging his abilities as inconsequential. However, Eugen retorts boldly, asserting that this same F-ranker has foiled the figure's schemes not once, but twice. He proceeds to taunt the Enigma, recounting how one lizard met a fate of sushi, while the other found itself cooked to a crisp. The colossal dragon, serving as a grim extension of the four-eyed figure's will, delivers a crushing blow to Eugen and hurls him aside. Nevertheless, Eugen remains undeterred, unabashedly boasting about how he should have preserved the lizard's remains solely to underscore his point. Despite the relentless barrage of attacks Eugen endures from the malevolent dragon, his defiance remains unwavering. He continues to assert that the four-eyed figure can blame his F-class status all he wants, but Eugen refuses to bend to the same scrutiny. His tenacity persists, undeterred even as he sustains severe injuries. Based on his astute observations, Eugen deduces that the enigmatic four-eyed figure harbors no immediate intentions of killing him. Recognizing this, Yujin seizes the opportunity to further provoke the figure, alluding to how he was scanned by Huni and how Riet, Riot, won't align themselves with the figure's cause. Fully aware that the figure requires something from him, Yujin employs taunts and mockery as his chosen tactics. He goes so far as to propose a derogatory moniker for the figure, jestingly suggesting he be called a stupid king instead. The figure, responding to Eugen's relentless verbal jabs, inquires about the means to undo his commands. He grips Eugen's hair and demands to know how Eugen managed to vanquish Rachidas, questioning whether the immoral people offered their assistance. This reference to the immoral people is consistent with the novel translations, yet Eugen remains in the dark about their identity. The figure proceeds to clarify that these immoral people are responsible for the creation and management of the mysterious system. Eugen, with characteristic mockery, ridicules the moniker and muses about whether these immoral individuals are deemed as such because they strive to avert the world's destruction, a goal that runs contrary to the ambitions of the filial piety addicts. Seeking answers, the four-eyed figure queries why these immoral people would intercede on Eugen's behalf. Eugen astutely discerns the nature of the information the figure seeks, his title and skill. With this newfound knowledge, Eugen grows confident that the figure will refrain from killing him until he extracts the answers he desires. Eugen, ever watchful of the unfolding scenario, taunts the figure for entertaining hopes of receiving answers from him. He seizes this moment as an opportunity to buy more time while meticulously scanning for an opening. However, the draconic entity holding him suddenly severs Eugen's arm with a vicious bite causing an agonizing scream to escape Eugen's lips. The four-eyed figure then redirects his attention to Eugen, directing him to closely inspect his severed arm. Eugen, baffled and in excruciating pain, attempts to comprehend this bizarre situation. To his utter bewilderment, other dragons begin to assault him, tearing at his flesh. The figure elucidates that they exist within Eugen's own consciousness, a surreal dreamscape detached from reality. He clarifies the perverse nature of this mind-bending scenario, emphasizing that, since they occupy Eugen's mind, he can subject him to eternal suffering without the solace of true death, all through the medium of his own blood. With grim resolve, the figure summons yet another venomous cursed dragon, issuing a stern ultimatum to Eugen. Answer his inquiries or submit to the invasion of his most intimate memories. Desperate, Eugen strives to locate Deshala's beads, but the figure dashes his hopes, explaining that items remain powerless within this unreal realm. 
unperturbed. The figure probes whether the immoral people provided Yujin with these beads, surmising that Yujin employed them to defeat Rachidas. He presses Yujin to surrender the information, as the newly summoned dragon sets its sights on Yujin's vulnerable head. In the face of relentless pressure, Yujin maintains his unyielding resolve, adamantly refusing to yield to the figure's demands and instead challenges him to unravel the truth on his own. With these defiant words, Yujin is devoured by the ravenous dragons, yet he remains trapped in this surreal, nightmarish space. His thoughts consumed by the enigmatic figures his brother, Yu Hyun, had become entangled with. Outside, in the real world, Huni, Riet, and Nowhere watch Yujin's current condition with growing concern. Huni remembers Yujin passing out earlier, which piques Noah's curiosity. Noah, however, starts to wonder if Huni and Nowhere had something to do with Yujin's condition since they were the ones who took him into the dungeon. Riet playfully hints at her desire for Yujin's company, suggesting she wants him for herself. Huni, seemingly focused on Yujin's well-being, prepares his chains, a subtle action that goes unnoticed by the others. He then asks about Yujin's physical appearance, wondering if he's always looked this way. Noah and Riet are momentarily puzzled by the question, but Huni and Nowhere continue to think about why Yujin appears five years younger than expected. Gradually, Huni begins to piece together some insights into this mystery. Back within Yujin's mind, a flood of memories rushes forth. Yujin recalls various moments from his past, from his first dungeon expedition to his brother entering a dungeon, his time in the military, and his conflicts with others. Memories of his estranged brother, Yu Hyun, singing him a happy birthday song despite their strained relationship, and the tragic story of his brother's injury leading to his death all unfold before him. Amidst this whirlwind of memories, the four-eyed figure finally stumbles upon one of Eugene's most guarded secrets, the Wish Stone. This newfound revelation helps the figure understand how Yujin turned back time and acquired the curse resistance skill by defeating Rachidas. Yujin, ensnared within this chaotic stream of recollections, finds himself in a daze, unable to discern how much time has passed in this surreal and timeless space. However, the four-eyed figure remains far from finished with him. The figure expresses his wonder at how Yujin accomplished these feats, especially considering he's an F-ranker. It's clear that Yujin's curse resistance skill is slowing down the figure's efforts to extract information, leading him to comment on Yujin's ordinary nature as an F-ranker. Yujin, realizing that the figure will eventually uncover everything, feels frustrated by his own limitations. The fact that the mastermind behind his brother's death is right before him, yet remains out of reach, gnaws at him. Memories resurface of how his brother once criticized him for being unreliable in his previous life, fueling Eugene's unwavering determination to become a better older sibling in this new existence. Refusing to give up, Eugene continues to taunt the four-eyed figure, all while fervently thinking about an escape plan. The figure, engrossed in examining Eugene's memories, grows increasingly impatient. Eugene, undaunted by the figure's sinister presence, keeps challenging him, prompting the figure to respond by making fun of Eugene and causing him some physical discomfort. The figure expresses his amazement at Eugene's boldness in talking back to him, albeit with a hint of grudging respect. However, Yujin isn't done seeking answers. He raises an important point, suggesting that the figure should have intervened right after the dungeon gate closed, preventing Yu Hyun from following him. But Yujin stops mid-sentence, his thoughts suddenly converging on a profound revelation. The enemy senses the impending shock of Eugene's realization, grins wickedly, bursts into laughter, and then proceeds to reveal the startling truth that Yu Hyun borrowed his power to enter a closed dungeon, all in a desperate attempt to save his older brother, Eugene. The figure's demeanor and inadvertent admission inadvertently confirm him as the mastermind behind the complex series of events that have brought Eugene to this critical moment. In a flashback to that fateful moment, Yu Hyun found himself questioning his inexplicable return, considering he had previously declined a mysterious offer. His puzzled gaze fell upon a lifeless monster, who urgently conveyed the importance of some news. The creature emphasized that Yu Hyun would deeply regret ignoring this revelation. It then disclosed a disturbing error within the very dungeon that Yu Hyun's brother had ventured into. The shocking news spurred Yu Hyun into immediate action. He rushed to the gate through which his brother had disappeared and sought answers from the attending staff. They explained that the dungeon had initially been classified as a D-grade, but their recent findings indicated the presence of a menacing S-class monster within its depths. Dread gripped Yuhan as he instinctively drew his weapon, ready to confront the looming threat. However, an individual among the staff attempted to snap him out of his frenzy, reminding him that the dungeon was already sealed shut. Despite their pleas, Yu Hun remained undeterred, slashing relentlessly at the gate. 
The staff implored him to halt, emphasizing the futility of his actions. They reminded Yuhyun that the gate could only be reopened once every hunter within had met their grim fate. Unyielding, Yuhan refused to heed their desperate pleas, his every strike driven by deep concern for his elder brother. In a moment fraught with despair, a mysterious voice inquired if Yuhyun desired access to the sealed dungeon. Simultaneously, a purple-black substance emerged from the ground nearby, offering a glimpse of the horrors unfolding within. The enigmatic voice proposed a deal. It could facilitate Yu Hyun's entry, but in exchange, Yu Han would have to become its subordinate. Fast forward to the present, the four-eyed figure recounted the events of that past day. He revealed that Yu Han had readily accepted his offer, believing it to be a mere dungeon glitch. It became evident that this enigmatic figure had orchestrated all those events, including the unexpected appearance of Rachidas. The figure disclosed that he had deliberately designed the situation to be challenging for Yu Hyun preventing an easy rescue of his brother while avoiding mortal peril. He even confessed to intending Eugene's demise in that dire moment, expecting Yu Hyun to become more vulnerable to manipulation. However, his plans took an unforeseen twist when Yu Hyun willingly sacrificed himself. Yu Jin's mind once again grappled with the weight of how his actions had ensnared Yu Hyun in a treacherous trap, causing his older brother to sacrifice himself despite the inevitable servitude to these malevolent beings. The four-eyed figure wore a triumphant smirk, boldly asserting his newfound control over Yu Hyun. This declaration piqued Yu Jin's curiosity, prompting him to seek further clarification. In response, the figure elucidated the various possibilities concerning his dominion over Yu Hyun's body, influenced by the nature of their contract. He casually remarked that seizing Yu Han's body had been relatively straightforward, given Yu Han's detachment from his world. Yu Jin was jolted by this revelation, having previously believed his brother to be irretrievably lost, explaining his exclusive focus on the present. This newfound understanding completely altered Yu Jin's perspective, igniting a spark of hope that his elder brother might now be able to save his younger sibling. However, the four-eyed figure abruptly disclosed that Yu Hyun's body had been claimed by someone else. Yu Jin's countenance remains a swirling maelstrom of sorrow and fury, fixated on thoughts of Yu Hyun. The four-eyed figure once more urges Yu Jin to acquiesce, promising information about his elder brother in return for compliance. However, Yu Jin resolutely rejects any further discussion, shocking the figure with both his words and his ensuing actions. A luminous blaze of electricity radiates from Yu Jin, causing the surrounding dragons to writhe and shriek in agonizing torment. The four-eyed figure, clearly caught off guard, witnesses this elemental attribute within Yu Jin. Yujin recollects the figure's prior explanation about skills being an extension of the senses, which is why they persist within this peculiar mental realm. With unshaken determination, Yujin continues to unleash bolts of lightning, emphasizing that while he may lack creativity, wielding a skill he's previously experienced is a different matter altogether. He recalls Yu Hun's utilization of this very attribute and makes it his first choice. With a confident gesture, Yujin asserts that this isn't his maiden encounter with such power, directing electric shocks toward the dragons, causing their pain cries to echo throughout the space. The four-eyed figure scoffs dismissively, labeling these displays as mere parlor tricks and asserting the insignificance of human skills. In response, he deploys more venomous curse-laden dragons, showcasing no intent to yield. Eugen unfurls wings akin to Noah's and takes to the skies, adeptly evading the swarm of draconic assaults. He draws upon memories of countless flights, experiences shared through the bond with Noah. Although Eugen acknowledges that his anger creates a disorienting haze, it also empowers him to navigate the aerial battlefield. Hovering above, he continues to discharge electricity, subjecting the dragons to searing torment. Eugen invokes the potent synergy of his veteran fighter title and the Rachida's Bane skill, doubling the ferocity of his attacks. This augmentation extends to his confrontation with the venomous curse-infused dragons. In this intense mental realm that thrives on imagination, Yujin deploys every skill at his disposal, unleashing a cascade of overpowering abilities. The four-eyed figure, taken aback by the overwhelming might demonstrated by Yujin, momentarily loses focus. His foot becomes ensnared in a frigid grip as Yujin employs his Urium's skills, incorporating Frosty SAE and Shadowless Day. Yet, Eugen's relentless assault demands more. Transforming his hands into dragon-like appendages, Eugen launches a direct assault, striking his adversary with formidable force. In retaliation, the four-eyed figure retaliates with a swipe of his own draconic limb, landing a blow to Eugen's flank, propelling him away. 
the enemy initiates a derisive tirade, disparaging Eugen for his F-rank status. However, his mockery dwindles as he bears witness to Eugen S's ensuing actions, drawing upon memories of his brother's powers and skills transferred to him through final thanks. Eugen activates the formidable Black Blood Flames skill. His very blood transforms into a blazing spear, radiating flames. Eugen, exuding unwavering confidence, proclaims the inevitable defeat of the four-eyed figure. The resolute Eugen activates final thanks once more, tripling his attack prowess. With unwavering determination, he thrusts the fiery spear towards his foe, culminating in a devastating strike that leaves the four-eyed figure vanquished and bewildered by the prowess Eugen has unveiled. Eugen levels a stern gaze at his defeated adversary brandishing the fiery spear in his hand. He expresses gratitude to the figure for imparting the method, vowing to leave no stone and turned in his quest to retrieve his brother. He considers the figure's verbose nature a glaring oversight, failing to heed the age-old adage, less talk, less mistake. Eugen solemnly pledges to himself and his brother's name that he will exhaust every avenue to secure Yu Hyun's return, regardless of the sacrifices it may entail. Han Yujin delves into the intricate tapestry of the four-eyed man's memories, revealing a complex history imbued with both moments of profound tragedy and unexpected heroism. This journey leads Yujin to discover the tragic annihilation of the man's people, underscoring that even those who emerge as antagonists are not immune to their own share of sorrow. As Yu Hyun accompanies him on this profound exploration, they witness poignant instances where the man employs his understanding of his people's unique abilities to rescue the last vestiges of survivors from impending doom. Nonetheless, their exploration of these poignant recollections faces an abrupt interruption as Eugen employs a compelling and forceful approach. With little tolerance for frivolous diversions, Eugen demands that the man disclose vital and meaningful information. Eugen further intimidates the man, causing a growing sense of panic that drives him to summon his venomous dragons in desperation. Eugen, however, effortlessly taunts the man using his given name, Diorama, a development that ignites Diorama's anger. In response, Diorama unleashes another formidable dragon. These dragons advance menacingly toward Eugen, yet he adroitly eludes their relentless assaults. In his unabated taunting, Eugen derisively questions whether summoning dragons represents the zenith of Diorama's abilities. With a resolute intent to counter, Eugen prepares to unleash his icy powers while ridiculing Diorama as a hapless and misguided master. As the encroaching dragons draw near, Eugen summons forth a torrent of black flames, sternly chastising Diorama for succumbing to someone of lower rank. In a surge of indignant power, Eugen propels himself towards Diorama, delivering a searing blast of black flames that elicits anguished cries from the malefactor. In a lighthearted jest, Yu Hyun amusingly suggests the invention of a novel classification, perhaps an F-, expressly tailored to encapsulate Diorama's astounding ineptitude. As Diorama rides in anguish, Yu Hyun exerts dominance over his fragile consciousness. Subsequently, Yu Hyun issues a menacing ultimatum to the dragon, demanding that Diorama unveil the memory of Yu Hyun or face the imminent exposure of his own closely guarded recollections. Stammering and haunted by the memory of Yu Jin's prior rejection, Diorama grapples with Yu Hyun's insistent words. Yet, Yu Hyun elucidates that his demands are metaphorical in nature, accentuating his unwavering resolve to explore any avenue required to reunite with his younger brother. In a startling transformation, Yu Jin's hand undergoes a remarkable metamorphosis, acquiring the visage of a draconic claw. With unwavering command, he compels Diorama to divulge the memory. In response, a mysterious purplish fluid commences the dissolution of the mental barriers within Eugen's consciousness. This initiates a profound and enigmatic journey as Eugen finds himself transported to a disparate realm, replete with colossal whale-like creatures soaring majestically through boundless skies. This mesmerizing vista gives way to tumultuous scenes of turmoil, recounting memories of diverse worlds plagued by menacing monsters and inscrutable dungeons. Within these realms, individuals with distinctive pointed ears are depicted in a desperate flight from the relentless onslaught of a gargantuan, octopus-like behemoth. Amidst this narrative, one bearded denizen emerges as a valiant defender, wielding his unique abilities and seeking assistance from an enigmatic system. This courageous figure valiantly confronts the encroaching calamity, yet his protective shield ultimately succumbs, sealing his tragic fate. Eugen reflects upon the ultimate destiny of these beleaguered worlds, pondering whether any have managed to endure amidst the relentless tide of malevolence. A kaleidoscope of worlds cascades before his eyes, yet each ultimately succumbs to forces of insurmountable power. Within the midst of this desolation, a radiant luminosity enshrouds the beleaguered worlds, 
drawing them inexorably into its ethereal embrace. Amidst this radiant expanse, Yujin discerns the presence of an awe-inspiring white tree, its numerous branches extending into infinity. This arboreal enigma beckons Yujin's curiosity, providing a glimmer of hope for clues concerning his brother's whereabouts. His attention then turns to a pristine white bird, its wings in perpetual motion, captivating his senses. As if guided by the very laws of attraction, a feather detaches from the avian emissary and descends, influenced by the gravitational pull of the enigmatic purplish liquid. Deep within the dark, amorphous depths of this mysterious fluid, Yujin catches a fleeting glimpse, a figure resembling Yuhian, in a profound slumber surrounded by diminutive bubbles. This unexpected revelation startles Yujin, compelling him to call out to his brother. He extends his hand towards the vision, driven by a profound urgency, yet the inexorable liquid enshrouds him once more, enveloping him further in the riddle of these unfathomable memories. Yujin gasps, returning to his awareness within Diorama's mind. Despite still looming over Diorama, his thoughts are consumed by the memories he witnessed. Diorama groans, and Yujin inquires about the white bird he saw. Yujin insists that Diorama show him the vision again and reveal the whereabouts of his brother. He prepares to attack Diorama, hoping to revisit that vision. Despite his agony, Diorama laughs at Yujin's desperation and unveils his intention to eliminate him, knowing he has seen the bird that counts the stars and the tree of snowfall. Yujin is baffled by Diorama's response, and Diorama appears nearly defeated. Suddenly, a deafening cracking sound emanates from behind Yujin, and the structure of Diorama's consciousness appears to shatter. Yujin is taken aback by this unexpected turn of events, while Diorama chuckles. Diorama explains that this space is his consciousness, and what Yujin has seen is not his real body. Understanding dawns on Yujin as he observes the battered Diorama dissolving. Yujin gazes back at the broken surface and is met with the sight of an enormous dragon's eye. It sends shivers down his spine. With those final words, Diorama crashes to the ground with a resounding thud. Yujin sighs in frustration, irritated by the enemy's lack of intelligence. He examines Diorama's remains and notices a radiant glow emanating from the battered chest of the fallen foe. There, he discovers a dark gem adorned with intricate red lines, accompanied by a dragon-like ornament. Yuhan kneels down to retrieve the gem and begins asking his questions while the rain continues to pour. Gazing up at the Mermaid Queen, Yuhan inquires about the existence of the bird that counts stars, the same bird that has taken his brother. This bird is known for its affinity for the Tree of Snowfall, circling it while singing songs and whispering stories that no one else can hear. The Mermaid Queen questions if the bird has truly taken Yuhyun's brother, and Yujin confirms that he saw it in Diorama's memories. He expresses his determination to locate the bird and rescue Yuhyun. The Mermaid Queen contemplates his intentions, referring to the bird as the water droplet. Han Yujin joins the conversation, expressing his frustration that the silent white bird has disappeared. Yujin persists, urging them to at least provide directions to the tree. However, the system refuses this request. Yujin vocalizes his frustration, emphasizing that he won't leave his brother alone no matter where he is. The Mermaid Queen reassures Yujin and elaborates on the bird's role as the water droplet, possessing knowledge of the future. She may not know why the silent white bird took Yujin's brother, but she believes the bird has its reasons. To alleviate Yujin's concerns, the Mermaid Queen promises to find his brother while he continues his quest to gather 50 S classes. Yujin questions whether this task will prevent the world's demise, given the challenges he witnessed in Diorama's memories. Nubi reassures Yujin, explaining that they can halt the process. He mentions that slaying monsters can exhaust the origin and induce it into a deep slumber, granting them a hundred years of respite. This is what they call running away. Yujin realizes that escaping won't prevent the world from meeting its end due to the dungeons. He acknowledges that running away isn't a solution. Nubi admits their lack of knowledge and suggests that actively attacking the origin can force it to regurgitate worlds, leading to brief periods of rest. However, this method requires the presence of transcendental beings like themselves. The Mermaid Queen adds that this is why they were banished. Eugen finally comprehends why the filial piety addicts also refer to them as the depraved. The Emerald people have fought against their own origins, essentially their parents, leading to their exile. Eugen considers becoming as powerful as them to reach the origin. Nubi asks for confirmation if Eugen will continue with the task. Eugen hesitates but asks if this is their only option. Diorama had told him he was the key to stopping the world's end. Nubi emphasizes that they are assisting him. Mermaid Queen explains how the filial piety addicts will seek someone to replace Diorama, and next time, they may not be as fortunate since the replacement might not be a venomous, 
Cursed Dragon. Water starts to swirl around Yujin as the Mermaid Queen underscores the importance of gathering classes to prevent contracts with the filial piety addicts. The water envelops him, and Newbie advises Yujin to keep this task a secret, warning that talking more about it will only aid the filial piety addict's influence. As the space around him begins to change, Yujin reflects on Newbie's words about finding his dead brother and not bringing him back. Yujin adds that Yu Hyun has already been disconnected from the world and will soon lose pieces of himself, ultimately ceasing to exist. A voice calls out Yu Jin's name, and he finds Noah and Huni standing over him. Huni informs him that he woke up earlier this time, and they are still in the dungeon. Yu Jin curses, prompting Noah to inquire about what's wrong. Yu Jin recalls New Bee's last words about finding his dead brother, realizing that Yu Hyun is gradually fading away from existence. Han Yu Jin desperately yearns to bring his deceased brother back, but even that is denied to him. Pulling himself together, he inquires about how long he's been out. Noah informs him that it hasn't even been a day, and they've already cleared the dungeon. Yujin is surprised, thinking he had spent more than a week in that space. Huni retrieves his coat, which had been used to cover Yujin, and praises them for a job well done. Yujin checks his body, finding it in good condition despite the encounter with Diorama and his dragons. He confirms the presence of the Man of Stones from Diorama and Vicus in his inventory, along with the retention of Diorama's memories. With grim determination, Yujin intends to make the most of these assets to find and rescue his brother, no matter the cost. Noah notices the expression on Yujin's face and asks if he's hurt. Yujin reassures Noah that he's perfectly fine and ready to go. However, Noah doubts this, and Yujin repeats his assertion. Out of nowhere, an orange bottle is thrust into Yujin's mouth, forcing him to drink its contents. Despite his initial shock, Yujin downs the liquid. His demeanor undergoes a complete transformation, and he immediately questions what he just consumed. Huni holds the bottle, and with a smile, he reveals that it's a new premium fruit product. Yujin is taken aback by Huni's flaunting of wealth. Still recovering from the shock, Yujin is about to comment on the taste but stops himself, insisting he's fine. Huni patiently explains that there are hidden pains not visible to the naked eye. Huni declares that he won't let Yujin suffer, physically or mentally. When Yujin asks if this is because he feels indebted to him, Huni denies it, claiming that Yujin is a god-given item he deems perfect for him. Yujin is taken aback by this unexpected declaration of support from the CCOG guild master. Huni offers his extra clothes to Yujin to prevent him from catching a cold. Yujin curses Huni, while Noah reminds them that Yujin is a living person. Yujin acknowledges that he's not much different from Huni, as he also utilizes the other for his skills despite Huni's personality. With similar intentions, Yujin sees no issue with their partnership, taking the clothes from Huni and remarking that his item is tired. Yujin realizes that Renee is missing and looks around for her. He then hears screams from below and witnesses Riet holding a long rope, pulling members of the Sesion Guild. Yujin is surprised that they are still alive. Huni explains that they're keeping them alive as they can still extract money from them. Riet is ecstatic at the thought of profit. Continuing the earlier joke about latex mattresses, Huni mentions that they now have 2S Class 1 Second as souvenirs from this tour. Yujin no longer finds Huni's role-playing amusing, but he accepts the souvenir as shopping is considered a tour highlight. Riyad notices that Yujin is now awake and glares at him. Yujin realizes that dealing with the consequences of 2S rank hunters trying to kill other hunters inside a dungeon will be quite a challenge, and both SKC and Sudom guilds may collapse due to the incident. Hyungsu, despite his condition, promises revenge, especially against Yujin. He's determined, and Yujin better watch out for his little brother. Hyungsu continues to spout threats, but Riet kicks him away, expressing her disgust at the Sudom Guildmaster. Yujin vows to do his best and plans his actions once they are out of the dungeon. Their unlikely group eventually emerges from the dungeon, and Yujin commends everyone for their good work. Noah is relieved that he's completely fine. Yujin comments on how hot it was, but he abruptly stops and looks around at the destruction, wondering what happened to the building. Noah's face pales, and Huni comments that they've been caught. Huni adds that it's unlikely the young master wouldn't notice. Yujin then spots his brother sitting peacefully behind him, radiating with an intense aura. He calls out to his brother, and then anticipates another outburst from his little brother. Black flames surround Yujin, who appears worried as he's about to explain. Noah is visibly frightened now, but Huni remains unaffected. 
Yujin calls for his brother and notices Tiwen's presence as well. The chief officer of the Awakened People Management stands on another side with an army of soldiers behind him, unable to look at Yujin directly. The flames surrounding Yuhan continue to blaze. He questions if it was Yujin who caused this. Yujin attempts to explain, but Yuhan asks if his brother is injured anywhere as he stands up. Yujin reassures him that he's perfectly fine. Yuhyun's attention is drawn to the cloth wrapped around Yujin's waist, recognizing it as the CCON Guildmaster's clothing. Yujin is surprised that his brother noticed and starts to explain himself. However, before he can, a fire elemental lizard emerges from Yuhyun's left eye and burns the clothing borrowed from Huni. Peace quickly intervenes to cover Yujin and maintain his modesty. While Yuhyun comments on the situation, Yujin mentions that his brother is the real Sherlock. Yujin once again reassures his brother that he's unharmed. However, Yu Hian remains skeptical, fully aware that two S rankers had pursued them. At an inconvenient moment, a member of the Sesiong Guild emerges from the gate, groaning in pain as they stumble out. Rui follows behind them cheerfully, noticing the chaotic state of the area. Yu Jin realizes that not only were there two S rankers, but also dozens of high ranking hunters who pursued their group. Yujin responds to Riet's question, mentioning that his brother is about to lose his temper. He can sense the tension rising with Yu Hyun's temper. Yu Hyun questions what exactly happened and turns to Huni for an explanation. The CCOG guild master humorously claims that he saved a princess kidnapped by a dragon, and that they even danced together. Yujin panics, saying that Huni is telling the truth, attempting to take over the explanation. With a mischievous grin, Huni expresses his disappointment at not being able to kiss the princess, prompting Yujin to curse at him. Yujin is bewildered by this unexpected turn of events and suggests that Huni explains the situation properly. Just when things couldn't get more chaotic, Reed interjects and boldly declares that she is the dragon who kidnapped the princess. Her outburst is swiftly met with T1 cuffing her wrist. She claims that she's under arrest for various offenses. Riet is furious at the treatment and starts to pick a fight, pulling on T1's clothes. Yujin questions whether Huni was aware of the ambush they were walking into. Yujin, Noah, and Peace can only observe the chaos unfolding before them. Noah suggests that they should evacuate the people around them, as 4S rankers are on the verge of clashing if the commotion continues. Yujin finally steps in and does what he does best when surrounded by overpowered individuals. He tells his brother to calm down and suggests they head home. Yu Hyun initially refuses but then stops when he sees his brother's tired and tearful state. With a childlike tone, Yujin admits to being scared and tired, narrating their ordeal involving a fraudulent tour guide and a dragon kidnapping him, leaving him with a leg injury. He playfully raises his arms toward his little brother, asking to be taken home since he trusts him the most. Yuhan reaches for his older brother and agrees to his request. He carries Yujin on his back and yells to Huni that it's not over. At the same time, Yujin tells Riet to leave as well, reminding her that causing problems will result in a permanent ban. He emphasizes that if he gets hurt due to her causing trouble, he won't be able to raise her magic beast. Yujin persuades Riet to listen to T1 and leave her pet in his care afterward. Riet reluctantly agrees, puffing her cheeks in frustration. T1 is astonished by her sudden compliance, and Noah mentions an Asian idiom that perfectly describes the situation. Softness overcomes hardness. For a half-ranker, Yujin seems adept at handling and resolving issues involving S-rankers. Noah can't help but continue to admire Yujin, jokingly referring to him as having a fanboy. Once they return home, Yujin mentions that he'll cancel the contract for his little brother and teases that he can now relax since he's already tried this on Huni. Yujin shows the contract to his brother and inquires about what he wrote in the document. Yujin pauses for a moment before admitting that it was his eyes. He playfully scolds Yu Hyun and smacks him on the back for such a reckless act. Yu Hyun advises his brother to calm down, worried that Yujin might hurt himself in the process. After taking a few deep breaths to regain composure, Yujin declares that he's ready. He places his hand over Yu Hyun's eyes, and Yu Hyun announces his knowledge of the existence of the filial piety addicts. With a bright glow of light and a gust of wind, the contract finally breaks. Yu Jin holds his brother's face gently, checking Yu Hyun's eyes, and asks if he's completely fine. Yu Hyun assures him that he is, which brings relief to Yu Jin. Big Bro then reminds his younger brother not to attempt such a thing ever again. Yu Jin looks at his older brother and inquires how he managed to do it. Knowing that his big bro's curse-resistant class is similar to the contracts, Yujin explains how the effects of his skill are doubled when faced with the venomous curse drive types and reveals that he also possesses the magic stone of the individual he had a contract with. This revelation shocks Yujin, 
who proceeds to ask his brother how he encountered that being and inquires about other experiences. Yu Hyun questions if Yu Jin's leg injury was caused by that person. He curses Huni for not being able to protect his brother despite being a powerful S-class hunter. However, Yu Hyun is unwilling to admit it openly. He continues to probe, wondering if Yujin sustained injuries elsewhere, all while cursing himself for not being able to shield Yujin from these troubles. Yujin gazes at his brother, understanding the depth of Yu Hyun's concern for his safety, and how he has always borne this burden alone. This is a reflection of the love they have for each other, even if they don't express it often. Yujin tries to lighten the mood by ruffling his younger brother's hair, reassuring him that everything is fine because the system has taken care of it. Yu Hyun remains skeptical, prompting Yujin to sit beside him casually and mention that the system's task for him is to save the world by managing the dungeons. He explains that this will ensure the safety of their world for the next hundred years, giving them a five-year reprieve. Moreover, Yujin adds that they won't live long enough to witness the world's demise. Yu Hyun continues to express doubt as he was told that the world wouldn't survive. Yujin smiles warmly and reassures Yu Hyun that the person who delivered that message is already deceased, emphasizing that there's no need to believe those words. He mentions that the system will provide assistance, and they have the magical beast Mounties improving Maungu's blacksmithing skills and He Yan's research findings. Yujin has been working tirelessly to make all of this possible. Yu Hyun, still skeptical, questions if his brother has any desires or places he'd like to visit. This question brings a smile to Yu Hyun's lips, and he admits that he's uncertain. He turns the question back to his older brother, asking if there's anything he'd like to do or any place he wishes to go. This evokes a genuine smile from Yu Jun, who states that he can go anywhere as long as he's with his older brother. Yu Jin says this with a relaxed and heartfelt smile, while Peace curiously looks up at him. As Yujin continues to smile, he can't help but feel guilty for lying to his brother. He knows that the world's survival is doubtful, based on everything he saw in Dharma's memories. Despite the system's assistance and their efforts, he believes that the 50S-class hunters he's tasked with gathering won't be sufficient. Yujin chooses to remain skeptical when it comes to dealing with the system. He believes it's better to be safe than sorry. His thoughts are interrupted when he notices the fire elemental lizard on Yu Hyun's shoulder. He's relieved that his skills can strengthen hunters and recalls a piece of information from Dharma's memories. Yu Jin pokes the lizard and reminds his brother to give it a name, as it will undoubtedly be a valuable ally in the future. Yu Jin agrees with a nod, acknowledging that the little elemental has already consumed billions worth of items from the security room itself. He tries to ignore this fact as he reflects on what he has learned about elementals. That night, Yujin sets up a sort of ritual with a specific intention in mind, to find his brother and protect him at all costs. He's determined to do whatever it takes to move forward and find answers, even if it means utilizing remnants of his enemy's remains. Contemplating where to make the incision, Yujin finally marks a spot. Drawing upon the information from Dharma's memories about combining magic stones to create a venomous, cursed dragon, he begins the process. With the knowledge that he can raise one, Yujin recites incantations and places Dharma's magic stone into his chest. Struggling but determined, he activates the Dragon Slayer title to insert the magic stone and gain complete control over it. Once Dharma's magic stone settles in, Yujin takes the magic stone, places it atop the first, and skillfully manages the flow using the stern mother Hendril Surgeon skill. He combines the two magic stones and seals them within his body by regenerating the skin around them. This regeneration process proves far superior to GUUS's capabilities. With the assistance of his skills, Yujin successfully links the two magic stones. The only remaining issue is how to bring this creation to life. This task, quite unexpectedly, involves Yujin himself. This revelation baffles him momentarily, but he is determined to see it through. As he sips from a cup, Peace suddenly destroys a wall and rushes to Yujin, tears in its eyes. Yujin smiles warmly, realizing that Peace must have been worried because of the smell of blood. He reassures the Horn Flame Lion that he's perfectly fine, all while applying his perfect caregiver title to further strengthen the magic stones he's inserted. Yujin hopes to safely bring forth a powerful being through this unconventional process, ultimately aiming to protect his brother in this life and continue his search for his deceased sibling. He can only hope that this plan will succeed. Regarding the incident involving the S-Rankers, the entire matter is shrouded in secrecy. No details about Huni's contract or any connections to the filial piety addicts are discussed. The investigation concludes with the revelation that Reed was initially hired by MK. He later turned against them. 
As a form of punishment, the association assigns her the task of clearing the country's dungeons. In Yu Hyun's case, he was summoned by the association due to his role in detonating in a class dungeon building. However, most of the talking was done by Zim Yong, much to Yu Jin's amusement. Little brother still needs to learn how to hold back. The Sesion hunters, including Kang Su, were detained, while MKC went unpunished. This news surprises Yujin, and T1 explains that the association suspects the involvement of another party, which resulted in Quan's disappearance even before he could be charged with imprisonment. T1 adds that the higher-ups are somewhat pleased with the outcome, as they seek to maintain a balance among the major guilds. They believe this approach is in the best interest of overall stability. This revelation infuriates Yujin and he curses the association for prioritizing politics over justice. He believes the current association staff is filled with unqualified individuals, including the head, who has never experienced entering a gate and is merely there for money and power. Their leader's speeches are nothing more than empty words, a common theme among those in high positions. T1 apologizes to Yujin, but Yujin reassures him that it's not his fault, as the association made the decision. He emphasizes that T1 was merely following orders, but Yujin can't help but wonder why T1 chooses to remain passive in his position instead of taking charge when he is undoubtedly strong and better suited for leadership. Despite other S-rankers assuming commanding roles, T1 continues to obey the directives of a corrupt group. Unable to keep his opinion to himself, Yujin expresses his belief that it would have been better if T1 were in charge of the association. He argues that T1's leadership would result in better decision-making and ultimately benefit S-class hunters like themselves. Yujin stops talking when he notices T1 glaring at him. Attempting to defuse the tension, Yujin adds that other S-rankers hold prominent positions, suggesting that it would be a logical choice for T1 to do the same. With a stern expression, T1 states that power should not be concentrated in his hands, hinting at a deeper backstory that remains untold. T1 shifts the conversation to compensation for the incident, leaving Yujin puzzled by T1's loyalty and lack of ambition for power. Although T1's response assures Yujin that he's not involved with the filial piety addicts, he remains concerned about the Hunter Association's potential interference with hunters and the impending threat to the world. Before Yujin can further inquire about T1's affiliations, a loud alarm disrupts their conversation. Yujin quickly checks his phone and receives a notification about a dangerous situation at the special detention center, where Kyung Su and other hunters were being held. T1 announces his intention to leave immediately. At that moment, Yerm bursts into the room, providing Yujin with details of the situation. T1 expresses concerns that a prisoner might escape and asks Yerm to protect Yerin. However, Yeren hesitates to comply and anxiously reveals that the guild master had already announced his intention to go there earlier. The revelation of Yeren's intentions to confront the situation alarms everyone. Yeren begins to panic, fearing that his brother might be involved in the explosion at the detention center. He follows Yujin out of the room, and Yujin suggests they hurry to the scene. Meanwhile, Simeon arrives at the scene, clutching a bouquet with different motives than the others present. Soyoung, known for her reckless driving, also appears, stating her intention to take Noah. Yujin deflates Soyoung's hopes by revealing that Noah has completed his task the day before. This news devastates Soyoung, who collapses to the ground in despair. Ignoring her outburst, Yerim approaches Soyoung and offers her a ride in exchange for the chance to meet Noah. Soyoung promptly places a helmet on Yerim's head pledging to escort them to the depths of hell if necessary. Yujin, satisfied that he has secured a ride, signals for Yorin to carry T1. Although initially reluctant to fly, T1 eventually accepts the situation. Yerin, ignoring the flying option, joins Yujin in accompanying Soyoung and Yerim, who speedway on Soyoung's motorcycle. Yujin can't help but scream in anxiety, but Soyoung reassures him, despite her record of receiving numerous speeding tickets. However, Soyoung's driving skills provide little comfort. The group arrives at the special detention center, which houses high-class awakened individuals who have committed serious crimes, including the murder of non-awakened people. The center employs stringent security measures to prevent escapes, such as walls constructed from dungeon materials and inventory seals to prohibit access to weapons that could facilitate escape. Despite these safeguards, the facility has been destroyed, leading to chaos. Inside, Kyung Su is in shock, realizing that Yeren's little brother is the cause of the detention center's destruction. Yujin confronts Kyung Su, inquiring about his escape attempt and declaring his intention to assist in arresting him. Kyung Su is dumbfounded by Yujin's audacity, citing the inventory seal as proof that he couldn't have escaped alone. 
Yujin quickly shatters the inventory seal in Kyung Soo's hands, leaving Kyung Soo relieved that his hands survived. Before Kyung Soo can explain, Yujin asserts that he must take care of the Sesyong Guild Master immediately because he poses a threat. Yujin ignites his black flame infused sword and attacks Kyung Soo who seizes a spear to defend himself. Kyung Soo questions Yujin's motive for targeting him when he's already imprisoned. Yujin reveals that he heard from Riet about Kyung Soo's threat to his older brother, vowing that Kyung Soo will regret not dying in the dungeon. With a swift sword strike, Yujin inflicts more destruction, causing an entire building to collapse. Guards and inmates alike wonder if they are experiencing an earthquake, as more explosions rock the area. Kyung Soo asks Yujin if he's truly determined to kill him but receives no reply as the confrontation escalates. Applying his ability to his spear, Kaiwong Su charges toward Yujin, confident that Yujin will regret breaking his inventory seal. A dragon materializes from Kaiwong Su's spear as he launches a direct assault on Yujin. Yujin calmly blocks the attack with his sword, acknowledging that Kaiwong Su is no match for him. Yujin's fire elemental emerges from his right eye and lunges at Kaiwong Su's head, scorching him with flames before returning to Yujin's hand, signifying Kaiwong Su's demise. Kaiwong Su desperately tries to reason with Yujin, asserting that he never harmed Yujin's brother and that Yujin's insults provoked him. Yujin, however, counters by reminding Kaiwong Su of the time he petted his head and insists on being called young providing reason enough for Kaiwong Su's elimination. Yujin's ultimate goal is to monopolize his brother's affections by eliminating everyone who threatens to take them away. Kaiwong Su finds Yujin's rationale absurd, but before he can defend himself further, Yujin presses forward, intent on ending him. Kaiwong Su calls for help and references Kukwin Choi. However, when Yujin's sword touches Kaiwong Su's neck, the situation takes an unexpected turn. Smoke and tiny flashes of light engulf them, and elsewhere in the city, Soyoung revels in the prospect of dining with Noah and obtaining his contact information. The group of Yujin, Yeren, Soyoung, and Yerim continues to navigate the city, with Yujin screaming in fear due to Soyoung's reckless driving. Soyoung reacts to a red light by urgently requesting air support. Yerim, who is carrying T1, uses her free hand to lift the motorcycle into the air, prompting Yujin to cling tightly to Yerim. Yujin questions the possibility of Yerim being so light, but T1 refrains from commenting on the matter. Yerim inquires if their actions are indeed acceptable, and Yujin notes the raging fire at the detention center, speculating that the situation may have worsened. She points out the civilians on the ground and emphasizes the need to prevent them from approaching the chaos. She states her intention to block the road and rendezvous with the group later, descending to the ground with her motorcycle. Yujin clings to Yerim, who understands his intentions, while Soyoung descends as well, warning people about the dangers of proceeding beyond that point. Yujin remarks on Soyoung's perceived danger, to which Yerim remains silent. Yerim and her motorcycle passengers observe Soyoung's actions. Yerim expresses approval of Soyoung's actions, while Yujin questions the appropriateness of their actions as he remains atop T1. T1 requests to be lowered to handle the situation with the escaping prisoners. With a few movements, Yerim secures Yujin, while T1 jumps down, using a string circling his arm to return to them. T1 activates the rested gray scale, increasing his body mass. T1 plummets into the ground, disrupting the escaping prisoners and ensnaring them in a massive net. He calls for backup while maintaining his stance atop the pile of awakened prisoners, using his weight to keep them immobilized. Yerim realizes that Chief Officer Song's lightness earlier was a result of his skill. She points out the location of Yujin's brother and the Sesyong Guild Master. Yerim and Yujin descend nearby, but Yujin receives a warning not to approach any further. Yujin explains that he had already slashed the other man's throat, but the man still stood. Following the release of a fog, the situation grew increasingly peculiar. A voice suddenly speaks up, expressing disappointment that it's too late to utilize this individual. The voice complains about forming a contract with someone who wasn't sufficiently strong. Yerim raises an arm to prevent Yujin from getting closer, pondering if the figure before them is a zombie. Yujin quickly realizes the implications of their early encounter, prompting a frown as they confront an unexpected development. The voice identifies herself as Dayama's successor, and her speech emerges from the slash-like wound on her neck, creating a gruesome sight. Yujin is certain that this voice belongs to the new filial piety addict, given that Dayama had recently perished. 
The new addict expresses her desire to introduce herself properly, but stops short, realizing her current appearance is less than ideal. She politely requests their patience while she changes her appearance. As she undergoes her transformation, Yerim's eyes light up, recognizing a limited edition of the dancing bunny bunny bear which had sold out within seconds of its release. Meanwhile, Eugen perceives an image of his brother safely at home, causing him to blush with delight. It seems like the enemy is showing them their deepest desires through a mirror of sorts. However, Eugen's reaction is different. He pales as he gazes upon his deceased brother, who had sacrificed himself to protect him. The voice, now taking on the appearance of Eugen, asks if Eugen likes what he sees and suggests it might be overwhelming. It refers to him as young and presents a battered, smiling version of Eugen S. face. Eugen recognizes this as a psychological attack and strives to maintain his composure in the face of the enemy's mind games. Observing that her tactics are ineffective, the enemy shifts her appearance once more, transforming the older Eugen into a child wearing reindeer antlers and a Santa suit. This playful image stuns Eugen, as it reminds him of a cherished memory from his brother's school talent show. He attempts to reach out to this version of Eugen, but his younger brother and Yerim intervene to prevent him. The cute Eugen ultimately ceases her antics and reveals her true form as a jellyfish. Yerim, puzzled, questions why she appears to be crying. Jellyfish apologizes, explaining that she cannot reveal her true appearance to Yerim. She then approaches Eugen and Eugen, complimenting Eugen's physique and spirit while mentioning his delicious appearance. Jellyfish inquires about how Eugen was freed from the contract and suggests that he form a new contract with her. Eugen quickly intervenes to protect his brother from this dangerous proposition. Eugen raises his arm and steps between his brother and the new filial piety addict, chastising the enemy for constantly attempting to manipulate his brother. He questions whether she learned anything from the fate of her predecessor. Jellyfish responds with a smile, admitting that the previous lizard owner had indeed perished, though she remains ignorant of the exact details. She explains that she visited because there was still a human with an intact contract, but that human met his end upon her arrival. Jellyfish chuckles and inquires about the skill left behind by the lizard owner, touching Eugen's chest and dubbing him Dharama's successor. She acknowledges that, in a way, they are both successors of Dharama. Irritated by the enemy's touch, Eugen attempts to strike her, but Jellyfish swiftly evades by floating upward. Yerim supports Eugen, while Eugen asks his brother about the enemy's words. Yerim questions if they comprehend what the enemy is saying. Jellyfish poses another question, inquiring if Eugen knows who killed the lizard owner and how it was done. Eugen, realizing that this new filial piety addict lacks knowledge of events that transpired before his regression and other details about him, sees no reason to answer her. Jellyfish contemplates Eugen's silence, and he, in turn, reflects on his unpreparedness for the sudden appearance of this new enemy, and the potential involvement of innocent people. Jellyfish decides to forego her unanswered questions, announcing her departure. Eugen, momentarily hopeful, quickly becomes disheartened when Jellyfish mentions leaving behind a gift. A red-orange gate materializes in midair, an overcrowded gate on the verge of breaking open. It becomes apparent that this is not a favorable outcome. Jellyfish declares this gate to be her compensation for inhabiting a human body and bids them good luck while sending her regards to the depraved. With these parting words, Jellyfish vanishes completely. The trio now faces the gate, which is on the brink of reaching the dungeon break stage. Water gushes out of the gate, causing a massive flood in the area. Yerim takes swift action, soaring into the air and calling for her guild master and Yu Jun. Yu Hyun, holding onto his brother, employs blue willow leaves to escape the flood. However, a colossal wave catches up to them, relentlessly pursuing them as if driven by a will of its own. In an attempt to save her companions, Yerim dives back into the water when she sees them being engulfed. She locates the brothers holding onto each other and being drawn into the gate. Without hesitation, she goes after them. Yuhan continues to cling to his older brother as they approach the gate's entrance. Yerim reaches out, grasping their clothes, and all three are pulled into the swirling whirlpool on the water's surface. At that very moment, Soyoung arrives at the scene, where T1 is already present. The sheer force of the water results in the destruction of buildings, a phenomenon they have never witnessed with a dungeon break before. They ensure that civilians are safe and note that the water, at least, appears free from poison. However, the water continues to rise, and its potential limits remain unknown. Soyoung inquires if the situation will cease once the dungeon is cleared and whether they should enter immediately. T1 advises against sending everyone into the dungeon, expressing concerns about potential monster outbreaks during a dungeon break. He also mentions the importance of selecting someone skilled in aquatic combat for this situation, 
highlighting that Riet's poison would be weakened by water and Huma's wind abilities unsuitable. Soyup, on her phone, makes a call and mentions the effectiveness of an electric-type Pokémon against water, humorously comparing her guild master to a Pokémon. Inside the dungeon, Yujin and Yerim find themselves together, drifting in the water. They support Yujin, who had lost consciousness, and use their abilities to resurface. Yujin regains consciousness and, witnessing the bickering between Yujin and Yerim, pinches their cheeks to reprimand them. Yujin inquires if they have entered a gate, and Yujin confirms this. Yerim asks about the bunny bunny bear, then corrects herself and questions if a zombie created this situation. Yujin informs them that the force was strong enough to forcibly pull them into the dungeon. He contemplates the involvement of Yerim in this unexpected turn of events and the newfound strength of the new filial piety addict, Jellyfish, which appears to surpass that of Dharma. Water begins forming into spheres and rising prompting Yujin to caution his companions and express uncertainty about the nature of these water droplets. She slashes one of the water drops with her spear and is taken aback when she finds a memory of them eating ice cream together. Yujin is initially puzzled, but Huni asks if touching the water drops reveals past memories. Baram playfully bursts another one with her finger, revealing a memory of when she first met Yujin. Yujin reminds her not to get distracted, emphasizing that they are still inside a dungeon. However, another water drop unintentionally bursts behind him. Yujin looks back and discovers a memory of him calling his brother. In that memory, Yujin questions why Yujin is waiting at the cold bus stop. Young Yujin responds that it's Yujin's birthday, so it's only natural for him to wait for his brother. These heartwarming memories of the brothers touch everyone. The memory disappears, but Yujin comments on how realistic it felt. Yujin smiles as he pops another memory, and Yerim follows suit, excitedly revealing memories like a child unwrapping the presents. Yerim continues to smile, expressing that it feels like they are entering the memories rather than just observing them. Thinking that each water drop will contain happy memories, she promises herself that she will not burst any more. However, she eventually pops one more and experiences a vivid recollection of the day of her parents' funeral. She recalls the hurtful words from people discussing her parents' and timely death, her loneliness, and the inheritance. She remembers her uncle offering to be her guardian, a painful memory that stirs strong emotions of resentment. Meanwhile, in a different memory, Eugen watches as the past unfolds on the television screen, showing his brother's birthday celebration on Christmas Eve. He sees him slumped in front of the TV on the 25th of December, touching the screen where Yu Hyun is shown. Yujin, in this memory, clings to his brother's coat, dropping to his knees as Yujin tells him that his brother will disappear beyond the world's boundaries. Overwhelmed with regret, Yujin collects the remnants left by his brother, refusing to accept the reality of his loss. Yujin retrieves the remaining pieces and contemplates his decision to turn back time, pondering how things might change if he could return to that moment. A voice interrupts Yujin's reverie, and Yerim calls out to him, urging him to focus since they are inside a dungeon. Huni protects Yujin from the back, asking if he's alright, while Yerim instructs her guild master to hold Yujin tightly to keep him warm. Yerim herself wipes away the tears in her eyes, cursing at the new filial piety addict for manipulating them with memories. Yujin expresses concern for her, asking if she saw a distressing memory. Yerim confirms that she did but emphasizes that it's in the past and cannot be changed. She refuses to be consumed by painful memories and vows to protect her loved ones with her newfound abilities. Yerim's determination touches Yujin deeply, and he recalls how he used to see her as a child in need of guidance. Now, he realizes that she has grown into a capable and strong individual. Yujin thanks them both with a smile, and another voice chimes in, saying to make it three. Suddenly, Huni makes his appearance behind Yujin, startling everyone. Yujin feigns shock and commands Yerim to freeze him but Yujin pulls his brother away from Yujin. Yerim ignores the command and questions why the CCON guildmaster is present. Yujin receives a call about their location and playfully zaps everything around them with his electricity. He mentions how Yujin seems to have enjoyed their previous lake tour. Yujin, on the other hand, marvels at how everything disappeared with a single attack, while the brothers look unimpressed. Yujin teases him by mentioning he left only a half-star rating for the tour. Yujin responds by bringing them towels and dry clothes, and Yujin threatens to give him another half-star for the effort. They banter back and forth, with Yerim questioning when the two became friends. Water drops rise behind Yujin, and when one bursts near his elbow, he reveals it's a memory from his childhood. The CCL and Guildmaster finally realize that they are inside a memory dungeon. Yujin cheekily suggests that Yujin must have been an adult when he emerged from his mother's womb, fueling the playful banter between them. 
Garum believes they are acting like old friends who enjoy teasing each other. Yuhian summons his black flame and questions if the water drops will keep appearing even if they remove them. Garum suggests freezing everything to stop the water drops from appearing. Yujin and Huni express concern that it might be endless, but Yerim argues that Yujin's mana potions can handle it. Yerim playfully tells her guild master to sit in a corner and suck his thumb, earning a deathly glare from Yu Hyun. Yujin smiles at his brother and the others, recognizing the need to focus on the present issue rather than dwelling on his regrets. Yujin instructs Yerin and proceeds with their plan. Yerim eagerly dashes forward with her, a frostwood trident made by Myung Wu, vowing to freeze everything in her path. Huni raises his hand, generating electricity to zap the water drops in the air. Yerim compliments him on his work as the water drops harden into ice. Meanwhile, Yujin activates the Titan shield to protect them from falling water drops that turn into marbles. Yujin picks some up, finding them harmless, but Yu Hyun warns him to be cautious and asks if he still has the shallow beads for protection. Annoyed by his younger brother's earlier actions, Yujin scolds Yu Hyun for destroying the detention center and causing him so much trouble. He's frustrated that he arrived late and found that Yoo Hyun had already taken Kyung Soo Yun's life. Yoo Hyun explains that he had no choice, as Kyung Soo was attempting to escape. Despite this, Yoo Jin can sense that there's more to the story. Changing the subject, Yoo Hyun introduces his elemental to his brother, offering it to help combat the cold. Yoo Jin inquires about the elemental's name and offers to help come up with one. However, their conversation is cut short when Yerim calls for their attention, informing them that their path forward is blocked. Yujin asks if they have reached the end of the dungeon, but Yerim observes the obstruction and explains that some memory dungeons are divided by regions, and the one therein appears different. Yujin adds that the ground on the other side also seems frozen. Yujin points out how they can see an ice mountain on their side, mirroring what's on the other side. Huni agrees with Yujin's observation, while Yerim strikes a cool pose, claiming her skill extended to the other side. However, Yujin and Huni both identify it as a mirror embarrassing Yerim who lies face down on the ground in defeat. She defends her answer, noting that they aren't reflected in it. Yujin suggests that the mirror might be reflecting their information and asks Yerim to pop another water drop. Yerim reluctantly complies with his request. When the water drop bursts, the mirror changes form, leaving them wondering if the dungeon boss is about to appear. One of them shouts in surprise when Babar appears before them. Yerim questions its appearance, and Yujin worries that they have fewer people this time. Black fluid starts oozing out of mouth, and a dragon emerges, seemingly vicious. Yerim exclaims at its size, while Huni comments on how they've seen it before. Yujin wonders if Dayama will make a reappearance as well. Black fluid also flows from Vicu's mouth, but this time, a human-like being emerges. It's a giant mermaid, referred to as the Mermaid Queen. It seems to have taken the form of the strongest beings they've encountered, friend or foe alike. Yujin realizes that he's witnessed something incredibly strong with his own eyes. Huni smirks, asking from whose memory the mermaid comes. Yujin sweats nervously, and Yerim comments on the mermaid's earrings, noting their resemblance to her own. The mermaid queen attacks with her trident, releasing waves of water, and Yerim shrieks as they all leap into the air to escape. Despite their efforts, the water chases after them. Yujin summons his fire elemental, which forms a protective barrier of flames, neutralizing the water. However, when Yujin jokingly names the elemental flaming hot Cheetos, the flames turn into smoke. Yerim scolds her guild master to give the elemental a proper name, but Yujin's attempt at naming is less than impressive. The water splashes them, and Yujin's fire elemental seems to have picky tastes when it comes to names. Yerim insists on a better name while freezing the incoming water. Yujin and Huni encourage her, but Yerim believes that the enemy's strength is beyond their current abilities. As the replica mermaid queen continues to attack, Yujin worries if they will meet their end there. Yerim tearfully thanks Yujin for everything he's done for her and also expresses her gratitude to the CCL guild master. However, Yerim's thoughts of impending doom are suddenly interrupted when a burst of pink light appears, forming a protective barrier around them. Everyone is surprised by the appearance of this defensive barrier. In pixel form, Newbie materializes, asking if Honey is okay. He explains that they quickly opened a channel when they saw the intervention. Yujin grabs Newbie and demands that the system do something about their current predicament since the successor created this dangerous dungeon. Huni observes the interaction but chooses not to comment, stating that it doesn't concern him. Newbie mentions that they didn't expect the Mermaid Queen's appearance. Water Droplet, taking over the explanation, clarifies that the Mermaid Queen didn't intend to kill them in the dungeon, but somehow its true form was revealed. Water Droplet acknowledges the issue that their current force is insufficient to defeat it. 
Eugen proposes a deal and asks for a reward, explaining that it can serve as compensation for defeating the lizard owner, which they forgot to give him earlier. While they did assist, Eugen emphasizes that he was the one who ultimately killed it and only received magic stones. Newbie expresses concern about this request since it occurred outside the system, but Water Droplet acknowledges the reasoning behind it. Eugen, seeing that he has captured Water Droplet's interest, proceeds to request a skill from her that can turn the tide of their current situation. He addresses her as the Mermaid Queen of the Deep Blue Seas, revealing his knowledge of her true identity. Water Droplet is surprised that her identity has been uncovered. Eugen seeks confirmation, asking if she is the owner of Yerim's earrings. Eugen's thoughts race forward as he contemplates reinforcing his forces. Ever since he first saw the earrings Yerim received, he had started forming assumptions. He considered the true form of the earrings, the nickname Water Droplet, and even her unique skill. These clues allowed him to deduce her true identity. Eugen mentions that it doesn't matter whether her skill type is water or ice and suggests they consider it fate, lending her power to Yerim. With his hand on Yerim's back, Eugen reflects on her rapid growth and acknowledges her inexperience compared to other S-rankers. He intends to support her so that she can protect herself. However, Eugen also harbors other intentions. He is aware of how much they have lied and used him, and he plans to take advantage of every opportunity offered by the system and its beings.